Alice the Torch, The Wonderland Court Series Book 2, written by Ashley McLeo, narrated by Abby Anderson. Chapter 1 Despite how odd Wonderland was, how it made me question basically everything, I knew three things with absolute certainty. One, Hatter was supposed to be playing chess with Alron, but I could feel his eyes on me, watching. Two, I hated that being queen meant talking to so many people on the daily. Three, a group of griffins were approaching the castle from the sea, a new development if there ever was one. Since my aunt's imprisonment, Faye had been leaving Wonderland. The last point was the most concerning, not the leaving part. If I'd been trapped on an island for decades, I'd want to leave too. But who did the Griffins belong to? I leaned out the window of the North Tower suite, where the guys were staying. It was actually the same grouping of rooms that the Red Queen had given me and my friends upon our arrival. But after the Aether trials, when I asked if they wanted to move, the males declined. In Hatter's words, the tower was large enough for the massive elf Alron, the blue-haired dwarf Sanzu, and him. I noted he didn't include me. Apparently, now that I was seen as a real royal, now that more eyes were upon me, I could not stay in the same room as the guys. But I did get to hang out here when we had a rare free moment. Squinting into the breeze rushing off the sea, I tried to figure out who was stopping by, was that a green flag on one of the creatures? What did that mean? Alice? Henry asked. Are you well? Yeah, I replied. Someone is coming for a visit. Does a green flag mean anything to you two? Chairs scraped the stone floor, and the next thing I knew, the elf and fairy were squishing me between their broad shoulders to peer outside. That's a royal escort! Alron breathed. It has to be. Agreed. Rather small, isn't it? Still, Hatter looked odd. It hit me that they were going off what they'd learned in history books, or what their parents had told them. Both men were a little older than me, and though they potentially could have seen a royal escort when they were children, they might not remember it well. Wonderland had been isolated for so long. Green indicates the Riverlands, Alron added. They must have heard of the Red Queen's imprisonment. My eyes widened. The Riverlands? Wasn't my father from there? Was I about to meet distant family? Were they here to help? Indeed, he was a Torna, Alron replied. If this is Queen Aquatia, she is a relative of yours. Who else could it be? Messengers? Hatter answered. Or perhaps the king, Elan Gasis. He's of the Cove Court, though, so not a direct relation to the White Line. The prince could come alone, too. Where will they land? Hatter and Alron exchanged an amused look before Henry turned his full attention to me. As often happened when he looked at me with those intense, evergreen eyes, my breath hitched. We don't know he admitted. We're about as knowledgeable of the castle as you. Well, duh. Until days ago, my companions were underground rebels. Neither had stepped foot on these grounds for years. Let's find someone who can show us to the landing pad. I whirled, barely hearing Henry mutter, Landing pad? And Alron reply, No idea where she gets these terms from. Before darting out the door. We only had to make it down the tower stairwell to find a castle guard, a tall, gangly man dressed in light leather and metal armor. At the sight of me, he fell into a deep bow. Princess Alice. You don't have to do that. I cringed at the title, though I supposed it was better than Queen, which many people still used. It was like no one could believe that I didn't want the crown. I gestured to the guys trailing me. We don't know our way around Hart Castle yet. Can you show us where people from the Riverlands would arrive? We have... guests? The soldier blinked. Seems so. 
I shrugged. I'm as surprised as you, but I'd prefer not to keep them waiting. But of course. This way. We trailed the guard through the castle, passing others as we went. Each person stopped and bowed to me, and every time my discomfort grew. As with using the title, I told them the gesture wasn't necessary, but they insisted. Evidently, a few days wasn't enough time to change the fabric of a kingdom. Stepping outside into the salty sea air was such a relief. Fewer people were present, and those who were had their eyes focused on the visitors dismounting their griffins. I scanned the newcomers too, noting that most were dressed in armor heavier than that of the guards in my castle, clearly here for protection. Only two wore normal clothing. Well, sorta normal. The woman donned a lovely green dress that seemed a touch too nice for riding, one of those simple and elegant pieces that probably cost far more than it looked like it should. Despite the long skirt, she somehow dismounted with grace and poise, and once on the ground, she pulled back her windswept bright red hair, revealing pointed ears, and extended her silver-veined wings, stretching. Wings and pointed ears meant they were fairies, rather than elves. The latter did not have wings. The male fae was younger and dressed in pants, a tunic, and a jacket, also green and lined with gold. His boots shone to high heaven, and I got the sense that, though he was dressed for travel, given the chance, he'd be much more fashionable. Welcome. I approached the pair. I'm Alice White, and you are... Behind me, Hatter sputtered, and I instantly realized my error. Clearly, these two were royals. Would they expect me to bow, like all the guards we'd passed had done for me? But I was a royal too. What should I do? Uh, sorry, I added, feeling like I should fess up. I'm new here and don't know all the courtly stuff. The young man's eyes twinkled with amusement. That's refreshing. I recently had the pleasure of meeting people from your world. They struck me as being that way too. He paused and bowed. I'm Prince Halid Vapos of the Riverlands, and please allow me to introduce my mother, Queen Aquatia Vapos. The queen inclined her head, and feeling on display, I performed a curtsy that must have looked beyond awkward, because Aquatia did not acknowledge it, but rather turned to her escort and began giving orders. Cringing, I twisted back to the prince. Your last name isn't Torna? I'd been told my father's people ruled the Riverlands. No, Hallett replied. They are close relatives, but the royal line is actually House Vapos. I see. So many intricacies of this realm still caught me by surprise. Well, it's good to meet you, and please call me Alice. Hallett will do for me, too. He leaned closer and winked. But don't get so friendly with my mother, not right away, anyhow. Wouldn't dream of it. So, what brought you here? We heard of the recent overthrow of Cela White. Her business with the guards done, Queen Aquatia came forward and answered me. And we had to see that the rebellion had truly happened. Given we were even permitted in Wonderland's airspace, I presume it had. No one has been allowed this close to the island for years. Do we have you to thank for that development? You said your name was Alice White? It is, I said. I'm the daughter of Isabel White and Frederick Torna. And yes, my aunt is in the dungeons. She's been sentenced to death. The execution will take place tomorrow, actually, for both my aunt and her king consort. I didn't know what Queen Aquatia would say next, but the brilliant smile she gave me certainly was not what I'd expected. It's about time. I snorted. I take it you weren't part of her fan club? The queen laughed delicately. She was horrible, even as a child. Sila and I never saw eye to eye. Your mother, however, was a dear childhood friend. A pregnant pause followed, in which I debated asking my question before I could hold it back no longer. Did you try to help my mother when the Red Queen took over? Aquatia's poise faltered, but only briefly. The moment she regained her composure, she nodded. I did. 
as did the crown of the snow-cap court. But we failed and lost many lives. Your aunt had this kingdom firmly in her thrall, and many creatures at her disposal, dangerous ones. Her lips thinned. Beasts that the rest of fairy is not adept at fighting because they're native to this area only. Eventually, we had to leave the island to her, for the good of our own people. The part about the creatures of this island tracked. My aunt was a strong Aether-blessed fae, capable of controlling herds of bandersnatch, queen krakens, and even a jabberwocky, which, thank the old gods, I had not seen. If those beasts converged to fight fey armies, that would be a hurdle indeed. I do hope you won't hold that against us, the queen added, her tone genuine. I realized I was staring at her, probably making her feel awful. I don't. It wasn't their fault that my crazy aunt had taken over the kingdom. Could they have done more? Maybe. But maybe not. I'd never be able to change the past, but I did want to help create a new, brighter future for the land of my birth. I hope you've come as allies, I asked. The queen smiled. We have. Then, how about a tour? With a flourish of my hand, I welcomed them into the castle. You'll have to excuse me. I gave a sheepish smile as we went inside, and I realized this tour would be like the blind leading the blind. I don't know my way around the place, but I do know where the throne room is. We can start there, and hopefully find someone more qualified to continue our tour. Walking between the royals, I led the way through the halls, relieved the guys had followed us whenever the queen or Hallett remarked on a painting or a tapestry, and one of my friends was able to add more context. Henry and Alron had more general information about the kingdom's history and art scene. Although the other royals were no doubt only trying to make small talk, my lack of knowledge only amplified the sense that I didn't belong here, that I was not the person to lead this land, despite what the people said. And here we are. I turned into the throne room. I... Oh my hell. The pixie twins, Dee and Dumb, were dancing their asses off in the center of the room as a group of male fae appreciatively took in the show. I closed my eyes, unable to believe the timing. What the heck were these tiny tarts even doing in here? They seem like they're having fun. Hallid remarked with an amused smile. His mother, on the other hand, simply watched. Is she scandalized? Does she find humor in this? As her face was a mask, I had no idea. They must be drunk. I lied. The girls would totally do this sober. They were boy crazy and always doing comical, sometimes absurd, things for attention. I cleared my throat. Hi there, Dean Dum. What's going on? The twins whirled in unison wide smiles falling from their faces. The men just stood, stiff as boards. The servants were meant to be redecorating the throne room, disposing of the horrible hearts that Celia White loved to adorn every surface of the kingdom with. My aunt probably would lop off their heads for standing around. Alice! Dumb's cheeks pinked. Hatter and Alron! What are you doing here? Showing Queen Aquatia and Prince Hallet of the Riverlands the throne room. I crossed my arms over my chest. Usually, I didn't care what these two did. But damn, this was embarrassing. A prince, you say? Dee stepped forward, wide eyes blinking. A snort of a laugh rolled out of Hallet. She did. A single one, too. Ooh! Dumb piped up. Then allow me to introduce myself. I'm Lady Dumb Talora. Lady? Since when? Unable to believe the gall of the pint-sized fay darting toward us, I twisted and caught Hatter's eye. In an effort to keep in his laughter, his fist was pressed to his mouth. I supposed he was used to this kind of crazy. The girls used to flirt with him all the time. You have competition, I mouthed. Why are they walking? The queen asked suddenly. Excuse me? 
I gave the ruler of the Riverland Court my full attention. They're walking. Pixies often fly because it's faster. She examined the sisters shrewdly. They could have already been to us by now, and as such are wasting precious seconds that could have been used to steal my son's heart. I exhaled at the joke, but the reason for the pixie's method of movement kind of sobered the humor. My aunt's witches sealed their wings together. They can't use them. Queen Aquatia's eyebrows knitted together. And you did not undo the spell? You are aether-blessed, correct? Aether magic should be able to reverse that. I am, I said, scanning the room and noticing that the male fae who'd been watching the pixies were gone. Apparently, they'd seized the chance to run off. But I didn't know about my aether magic until recently. The twins are my friends, which, maybe given what you saw, I shouldn't admit to. But I didn't want to ruin their wings in my inexperienced attempt to fix them. I see, Aquatia replied, as the twins reached us and fell into perfect curtsies. Good day, your grace and Prince Halid. They spoke as one, as though they'd rehearsed this moment. Good day, the queen replied. Your names? Lady Dum Talora, Dum repeated, her attention only briefly flickering to the prince, who stood regally at his mother's side. Lady Tweedledee, two words, Dee said, beaming. Lovely names, Aquatia replied. A pleasure, ladies. Now that his mother had been properly respected, Hallid knelt and extended his hand, palm up. Together, the pixies rushed him, placing their palms on his in a sort of handshake. As they did so, Dee closed her eyes as if in ecstasy. The girl was going to pass out from touching a living, breathing prince. However, their fawning was short-lived, as Queen Aquatia redirected their attention. Alice here tells me that your wings are bound by a witch's spell. Would you like me to attempt to undo it? Tiny gasps pierced the air. Could you? Dum asked, eyes shining up at the queen. We would so love to fly again, Dee added, her hand still comically placed on the prince's. I will do my best, the queen said and turned to me. You should watch. Perhaps rest your hand on my forearm so you can feel the aether flow. Learn how it's done. I, I'd love that, I stammered, taken aback by her offer. I hadn't had a mentor since learning about my aether magic, and now here one was, offering her wisdom. Do you think you could help me in other areas, too? I asked, hoping I wasn't pushing my luck. I have questions, but my aunt is the only other Aether-blessed fay on the island. She'll be of little help, the queen scoffed. Of course, I'll teach you what I'm able. I can stay a day or two, if you wish. That'd be great. We're even having a feast tonight, if you'd like to join. The prince arched his eyebrows. A feast to celebrate an execution? That's rather gauche. Not for that. I assured him. It's more so I can meet the highborn fay of the city. They groveled before my aunt, but I suspect, or maybe I should say I hope, it was more out of fear than respect. I figure they deserve a chance to meet me, and I'll assess from there. Really, I wanted to meet them all before the execution so I knew who to keep my eye on. The event would be public, as the fay of Wonderland requested, so knowing who my aunt had considered an ally, and therefore who might pose a problem, would allow me to breathe easier. That's fair. Hallid and I would love to meet them too. My son here has a sort of sixth sense about people. Great. Tension that I hadn't realized I'd been carrying seeped from my shoulders. I'll make sure you're at my table. The ruler of the Riverlands smiled kindly and turned back to the pixies. Do you mind being lifted? The twins shook their heads. Hallid? Aquatia nodded for her son to assist the pixies, who shared an excited look before carefully climbing into his open palms. 
The prince lifted the pair so that his mother did not have to kneel. Once they were in position, the queen silently extended her arm in my direction. I took it, in awe of how classy and graceful she was. Had I been her, I would have crouched on the floor to work my magic. But not Queen Aquatia. She didn't stoop. She recognized that if she extended a helping hand, others would take it, without question. This is why I'm not cut out to be a queen. I do not mean for it to hurt, but this might sting. Aquatia murmured to the pixies. Brace yourselves. Dumb rolled her shoulders back as Dee clenched her fists and gritted her teeth. Aquatia nodded her approval, and suddenly, white light trickled from her fingers toward the girls. Because I was touching her, I could feel the jolt of magic as it started flowing. Pay attention to when it unzips the wings, Aquatia murmured. I did as she said, studying the way her magic swept over them, caressing the edges, how it flowed, and its precise temperature and vibration. Though I didn't know how I was noticing these things, Aquatia herself likely had a lot to do with it. The moment the twins' wings separated and unfurled to their natural position, green smoke seeped from the membranes, disappearing into the air. The spell is undone, the queen announced. The pixies began to cry in elation, their wings back to normal and fluttering, as they lifted themselves into the air. That's what the smoke meant? I asked. It was, and now that you've felt how my magic moved through me, you should be able to replicate it if the need arises. I gave a hollow laugh. Let's hope it doesn't. Still smiling, I looked on as the twins hugged each other. Since the witches had spelled them, they'd put on a brave show, but I was sure they'd been miserable. Shall we get started on other lessons? Aquatia asked. Perhaps Hallid and I can teach you a few more tricks and skills before the feast. I'd love that, I said, excitement bursting through me. Before their unanticipated arrival, I'd resigned myself to learning about Aether magic through trial and error. This was much more preferable. Everyone needed a teacher. But let's move to the gardens for a bit more space, I suggested, well aware that once we left, the servants would feel more inclined to continue ridding the palace of the many decorative hearts that plagued it. Indeed, the queen replied with a smile. Lead the way, my dear. Chapter 2 It was so amazing watching your lessons today, Alice. Dee flew in through my room's open window like this was her private quarters, too. She wore a crimson gown, and her red hair gleamed at its curled half-up, half-down dew. As I was still in my robe, I felt underdressed. Queen Aquatia is wonderful, isn't she? Dee added when I didn't reply right away. The best, Dum agreed, following close behind. Matching her own hair, she wore blue, but unlike her sister, had opted for a full updo. I smirked. Though I had to agree with them, the pixies were over the top with their praise. For hours, they doted on the queen, complimenting her, exclaiming when she worked her aether magic. No one could say that they weren't grateful that she'd unstuck their wings, that was for sure. Hell, I was grateful too. Queen Aquatia had taught me many new ways to use my own aether magic. Though it would take a lot of practice to become super powerful with it, I was prepared to stretch myself and find my potential. Hallid, too. Dee sighed and came to stand on the vanity I'd been sitting in front of. I can't believe you're not done with your makeup, Alice. I'm in the middle of it. Fae cosmetics were spread out before me in a kaleidoscope of colors. I'd already done my eyes, opting for a more natural shade of gold that complemented my wings, though I had been tempted to try a lilac teal shimmer. Here, they favored outlandish hairstyles and color palettes. In the human world, they'd be deemed gaudy, but for Fae, there was no such thing. I supposed that when your hair, skin, and eyes could be any color of the rainbow, it made sense. This realm was simply more vibrant. I fingered the pot of lilac teal powder. One day I'd try it, 
but not today. It would be too much with my dress. Do you think he'd be open to dating across kingdoms? Dum asked. What? Who? Had they been talking and I spaced? Halid, of course. Dum frowned at me. Honestly, Alice, don't you ever listen to me? My lips pressed together as I held in my laugh. What's so funny? Dum demanded, stomping her tiny foot. Nothing. I assured her, face straightening a touch. I just didn't think you were so serious about Halid. I paused. Shouldn't he marry a princess or something? D and I have royal ties. Dum lifted her chin and turned to the mirror, tilting her head from side to side, assessing her look for this evening. Haven't we mentioned that? You haven't, I said, glad to be off the topic of Halid for a bit. The man was charming as hell, and I loved the girls, but size mattered. In a lot of things, actually. I snorted at my joke, earning me a glare from dumb in the mirror. Tell me about your family, I said instead, pretty sure she wouldn't appreciate my humor. Well, the pixie court is really old, dumb started, selecting a palette of blue eyeshadow from among my cosmetics. Apparently, they were getting ready here, too. But we don't maintain a castle like Wonderland. We're travelers. But our kind do claim large territories in the woods, Dee added. We don't bum around other kingdoms. Of course not, Dum looked scandalized. We have class. Anyone can see that, I assured her picking up a neutral lip rouge and painting my lips carefully. So your family was royal? What happened? It was a long, long, long time ago, but one of our ancestors was overthrown, Dee explained as she painted her own lips crimson. Our bloodline is originally from the summer court, you see. Is that far away? Quite. We relocated here because the king at that time was welcoming newcomers to Wonderland Island. Our ancestor even lived in the castle on the far side of the island for a while, like we are now. Dee looked around the room. Don't tell me that my aunt kicked you out of your palace. I dusted my cheeks with blush. Oh no, our family set out on their own before that. Like I said, we're travelers. Well, now this is your home, if you want. The pair beamed at me, any earlier annoyance gone from their faces. Since I was done with my makeup, I rose. Across the room, my dress hung on a screen. Like the other times I'd gazed upon it, the sight made my heart beat faster. The gown was sleek and silk, just how I preferred. But while black was my color of choice, this one was a glorious shade of teal, and the off-the-shoulder neckline was decorated with gold silk roses the colors and symbol of House White, my family. I sucked in a breath. It had been so long since I'd had a family, people who cared for me. Before Wonderland, Jax, the ex-boyfriend I'd given everything to, my first and so far my only love, was the sole person I could count on. We'd always said that, after I aged out of Xavier Doru's contract, we would travel the world. Once upon a time... I was certain that we'd always be together, that he was the only person who'd ever understand me, because we'd grown up the same way, under the thumb of a vampire lord. Killers. That was no longer the case. Now I had Hatter and the Pixies in my corner. Alron and Sanzu were becoming my friends too. And soon, I'd find my sister. After the execution, I'd set out. My heart clenched at the idea of seeing Elise, Meeting her, really, again. Though I had no intention of remaining in Fairy, I had to admit that Elise would make departing more difficult. Maybe she'd want to go to the human world with me? After all, what had Fairy given her? She'd been kidnapped as a child and led to believe her family was dead. Perhaps once we got to know one another a bit, I could convince her to leave. It really is beautiful, isn't it? Dumb cooed from behind me as I glided to a stop before the gown. Gorgeous, I murmured, fingers trailing over the smooth silk. To be honest, 
I'm shocked that it exists. Had my aunt heard of a gown with these colors, the creator would have lost his or her head. But to think that someone could have made such a glorious garment in the few days my aunt had been imprisoned was preposterous. Isadora started working on it the moment she met you, Dee said. I whirled about. Isadora made this? Damn, color me officially impressed. Of course, she's a talented seamstress, but even she just finished it yesterday, Dee said. I'll have to thank her when I see her, I replied, pulling the dress down and rounding the screen. Luckily, I didn't need assistance changing, a fact that many in this world seem to think was absurd. The dress slipped on like it was made of water, caressing my skin. Once everything was in place, I stepped out from behind the screen. The pixies gasped, and when I saw myself in the mirror, I understood the reaction, and had to agree. The gown fit me perfectly, and was stunning, easily the most beautiful thing I'd ever worn. The color looks so good with your hair! Dee soared over to land on my shoulder. Smiling, she pushed a lock of white blonde hair behind my ear. You look beautiful. Henry won't be able to take his eyes off you, Dum added saucily. Heat crept into my cheeks. A few days ago, I would have denied anything was blossoming between Henry and me. But that was impossible now. We flirted too openly, and every time I turned, he was watching me. Thanks, girls, I said. Help me choose earrings, will you? My pulse raced as the Pixies and I neared the Grand Hall. Already, music, the lyrical notes of a harp and other stringed instruments, and voices poured down the corridor. It sounded fun in there, boisterous even. But all I could think was that Fay of all kinds were in that hall, waiting for me. Waiting to see me. To judge whether I was worthy of the crown. I suspected that only a minority were waiting to prove themselves to me. In my opinion, most should grovel, but I wasn't so optimistic to think they would. In the face of my aunt, the nobles of this land may have been as powerless to change Wonderland as the poor Fay, but they'd still kissed her ass. They'd laughed at her jokes, gone to her croquet matches. They had attended the Red Queen's feasts and let their brothers and sisters on the less affluent side of town starve. My lips tightened as I recalled the neighborhood rebel headquarters was located in, those fey had been all skin and bones. No matter how little the nobles thought it necessary, no matter that they could claim they were enchanted, they would need to apologize. Good people like Hatter and Alron and Sanzu had stepped up to the plate to free Wonderland, people who had almost nothing to give. The nobles? They'd done nothing. So now they'd acknowledge those faults and step it up to make the court a better place. Two dozen or so paces away, guards stood at the opening of the Grand Hall, and between them waited Hatter. Dashing, Dee whispered. I'll say, I agreed. He wore a jacket, black with gold buttons and embroidery around the wrists, and black trousers. His long black hair was pulled back so his pointed ears appeared more pronounced than normal. It was only when I got closer that the finishing detail of his outfit became plain— Tucked in his front jacket pocket was a teal square of silk, a tribute to my family. Simple, classic, not too extravagant. Loyal. Perfectly hatter. Dee and I will fly in before you. Dum fluttered her wings faster so she soared in front of me. Her hand went to her hair, then her dress, making sure she still looked impeccable. We don't want to steal the spotlight. Gee, thanks, girls, I said, caught between amusement at the pixie's supreme confidence and a desperate urge to beg them to stay. Hatter will be with you, Dee said, as if sensing some of my reservations. So at least half the room will be looking at him. One can hope, I muttered, stomach twisting. I was somewhat surprised at the nerves popping up. Normally, I didn't care what others thought. Truth be told, I still didn't, but I did want to make people proud, to represent my family, and to set the kingdom to rights. You'll do great, Alice, Dum assured me, holding her fist out. 
Dee joined in, and I fist-bumped them both. See you, Dee said, and the pair zoomed toward the door, pausing only to fist-bump Henry, too. I should never have taught them that. I sighed when I reached him, standing to the side of the wide door. Half of the time, they don't even use it correctly. I like it. He held out his arm for me to take. It reminds me of you. His green eyes locked with mine and I swallowed, not sure what to say. Shall we go in? I took his arm, trying to ignore the muscles bulging there as I gestured to the door with my free hand. We shall, princess. Hatter turned to the guards. No announcement. Oh, thank the old gods he was here. I hadn't even thought of that. Not that arriving unannounced changed much. The instant we entered the room, all eyes were upon us. Even more unnerving, conversation stopped mid-word. The musicians, shunted in the corner of the grand hall, continued playing, though more softly. The scent of roses permeated the air, and I noticed the white blooms. Not red. White. My confidence boosted a touch. Shoulders back, chin high, wings out. Did I mention you look stunning? Henry breathed. Thank you. My nerves dissolving a bit at the compliment, I gave him a once-over that had a number of young fae twittering. You don't look so bad yourself. One corner of his lips lifted, and in sync we swept into the center of the room. As Hatter did a slow turn, probably to show me off, a nearby male and female fae, dressed in matching gold brocade, pressed their hands to their hearts. The female had dyed her beehive updo teal and adorned it with golden roses, a gesture that no one could miss. I smiled at them, but not too wide, not too friendly. I didn't want anyone here getting the idea that we were automatically good. A tribute to my family was one thing, but I'd need to speak to the couple personally and hear an apology for their part in what had been allowed to happen. Finally, Henry stopped our movement, and at that same moment, the music did too. Slowly, he slipped his arm out from mine. Raising his voice so all could hear, he said, May I present to you Princess Alice White of Wonderland. A wave of bows and curtsies rippled through the room, presenting me with a topside view of hats and elaborate hairstyles in every color of the rainbow. Only Aquatia did not extend the courtesy. I did not expect her to. I was a princess by birth, but Aquatia was a queen. Despite this not being her kingdom, she ranked highest here. Once everyone stood upright again, I clapped my hands delicately. Please drink and dance. Dinner will be served shortly. I'll get you a fey wine, so you have something to do with your hands. Hatter said, showing how well he knew me. Thanks, I said gratefully. Be quick. Of course. He left my side and the Fae of Wonderland resumed their dancing and drinking. Most looked away, still gathering their courage to speak with me. With their attention elsewhere, I took in the room more readily. The Riverlands Royals sat at the head table where I would eventually settle. At my request, Henry, Sanzu, Alron, and the Pixies would too. Both Hallid and his mother looked resplendent in finery of green and gold, their court's colors. A few rebels I recognized were present as well, but for the most part, I did not know the faces around me. Beyond the attendees, the decor was vastly different from the first feast I'd attended at the castle. No red lined the walls, no hearts. Since the trial by Aether, Castle servants, and even some soldiers, had been busy removing every speck of evidence of the Red Queen they could find. Now, teal tapestry softened the room, and white roses provided elegance. It wasn't much, but there'd be more later. And when combined with the crystal chandeliers, the soft light from the candles enchanted to float in the air, and the Fae themselves, a colorful bunch if there ever was one, the room was absolutely gorgeous. Their efforts warmed me. I suspected the servants had to search Hartstown to find this much teal to honor my family. Good evening, princess. A soft voice interrupted my musings, and I steeled myself for my first awkward interaction of the evening. But when I turned and found Isadora, clad in a gorgeous purple dress, with white roses wreathing the long bell sleeves, 
I grinned. She looked amazing. Her voluminous dark hair tamed into a sleek style that suited her round face, her eyes bright. Hey there! I held out my arms for her. I wasn't normally much of a hugger, but the brownie was like a second mother to me. A rebel who'd lost her daughter to the cause, she could have hated me. And yet, she didn't. She grieved, but didn't blame me for the loss she suffered. Didn't stop caring about or supporting Wonderland. That took a really big person. Isadora returned my embrace, pulling away with a smile. You look lovely, Princess Alice. As do you. Thank you so much for coming. And for the dress, your work is stunning. I'm so happy you like it. Conspiratorially, Isadora raised a bushy black eyebrow and scanned the crowd, most of whom were stealing glances at us. I see that no one who needs your approval has gotten the courage to request it yet. Not yet. I'm okay with it, though. Hatter is getting me a drink, and... Dear Princess Alice, a word? A male face swept in from the side, cutting me off. He was older, looking to be about forty in human years, which meant he was easily over a hundred, likely over two hundred. Of course. I shot Isadora an expectant look that said, here we go. I'm Lord Ezekiel, and... He trailed off, his gaze shifting to Isadora for a moment. You may leave. I stiffened at the condescension in his tone. What did you say to her? The brownie may leave. I have matters to discuss with you, princess. Discussions of the sort that commoners should not be privy to. My mouth fell open, but Isadora looked to the floor and took a step back, clearly about to do as this asshat asked. Where are you going? I gripped her hand. To give you privacy. She replied, her tone smaller than before. Among the rebels, she was warm, kind, and outspoken. But one word from this male, and she'd shrunk. Isadora could stand against the queen. Being bold in the face of pure evil was difficult. But the brownie was brave. However, when confronted with the rest in the city, those whom she lived among, I got the sense that she felt they were still above her. This was the world my aunt had created. Stay. I value your opinion above most, I said firmly. And I believe that you, Lord Ezekiel, would do well to remember that things are changing here. Speaking to others like that will no longer be tolerated. The Fey Lord gaped. Apologies, Princess, but I must disagree. A brownie's place is beneath higher Fey, particularly elves such as myself and fairies like you. I was dumbstruck. But thankfully, Hatter appeared, wine in hand, giving me the perfect retort. I took the wine from Henry with a sweet smile, and then threw the entire glass of liquid in Ezekiel's face. I, how, what is the meaning of this? Ezekiel roared, stepping back a few paces as he wiped at his drenched face. I do not appreciate how you speak to my friends, my people, I growled. So I'm showing you as much respect as you're showing them. Princess, the lord sputtered. This is not how things are done. You're right, it's not. I took a step closer. As I said, things are changing in the Wonderland court, Lord Ezekiel. If you don't like it, you can leave. But don't you ever dare insinuate that because you have a fancy title, you're better than those here. Particularly those who risked it all to rid this island of evil as if they had anything to risk. The man seethed back. I can see I'll have to reconsider my relationship with the crown. He whirled and marched off. I snorted. We have no relationship. Uh, what was that about? Hatter asked, his eyes wide. Douchebaggery. His brows crinkled. He was being vile to Isadora, I clarified. The brownie sniggered. And our princess told him that would no longer be tolerated. Hatter cleared his throat. As proud as that makes me, perhaps we can do without the drink throwing next time? He glanced about. You want people to approach you tonight? To talk about how you intend to change Wonderland? 
If they're worried they're going to end up soaked in wine, those conversations are unlikely to happen. He was right. My sense of righteous justification deflated. I'd acted from anger, and Lord Ezekiel was in the wrong. But had I screwed up my efforts to shift the nobles to our side? Oh, stop it, Henry, Isadora said. Ezekiel might badmouth our princess, but the other lords and ladies were wanting to be in her graces. Might take a bit more time, but... Her chin tilted up in pride. She did what was right. Henry exhaled. Of course she did. I didn't mean to say otherwise. Might I add something? A voice spoke to my right. When I twisted and found no one there, I gasped, but quickly put two and two together. Cheshire Cat! I hissed. You scared me! Apologies. I wish not to attract attention. He allowed his eyes to appear, perhaps in a sort of compromise, though I wasn't sure if that was better or worse than seeing no one. Yeah, okay, fine. I could understand that desire. He was a Cheshire cat, a rare creature even in Wonderland, and bound to me. Many would want to speak with him. Actually, I was one of those people. I hadn't seen the cat since the day of the trial by Aether. Hey, you got a name I should call you? I asked. I wondered before, but we were kinda busy for formalities. A kraken trying to kill you does tend to take precedence. The cat replied dreamily. No one has asked me my name in a long time, not since your mother. A lump lodged itself in my throat. My mother had been dead for over a decade. Well, I'd love to know your name. If you want to give it, that is. Chester. A laugh bubbled up my throat, but I held it back. Chester the Cheshire Cat. I wasn't sure what I'd been expecting, but it wasn't that. Good to officially meet you, I said with a straightish face. Then, ready to bring the conversation back to where it had started, I inquired. Did you want to add something to our discussion on Lord Ezekiel? Not him, Chester replied. I merely wish to warn you. Is my aunt trying to break out? I asked, heart rate spiking. Celia White, the now dethroned Red Queen, was being held in the dungeons, bound by iron shackles and aether shields, and watched over by no less than a dozen guards. Still, I wouldn't put it past her to use the feast as a distraction to escape. Not that I'm aware of, Chester said. I merely wish to inform you that I sense a new presence in Wonderland. A presence? Like Queen Aquatia and Prince Hallid? They arrived earlier today. I gestured to the head table. They'd probably love to speak with you. Not them. Someone not of this world, though they are masking that quite well. Someone. Someone who has traveled a long way to get to you, Al. A male voice drawled from behind me. Cold dread washed over me. Chapter 3 I stood frozen in place, unable to move or breathe or even blink. That voice, I knew it intimately, had heard it scream, whisper, moan. But how? Was this real? Al, you okay? The man asked, and though I still had not turned around, footsteps came closer as he rounded me, smelled the woody scent I'd once loved. My eyes squeezed shut. No, just no, no, no. Alice, what's wrong? Hatter spoke now, his tone gentle, and a hand fluttered to my shoulder, landing lightly. Who are you? Isadora demanded of our intruder. We haven't seen one another in a while, the man said. Clearly she's overcome with joy. Joy? Joy? The presumption. Who are you? Hatter repeated the brownie's question. I'm Al's boyfriend. 
Isadora gasped softly, and my eyes flew open. I spun on the man, Jax, who just stood grinning at me with the same confidence that had once drawn me to him. Hey, sweetheart. A blonde curl lazily fell into his face. What the hell are you doing here? I hissed. I couldn't believe Jax Altru stood in fairy. He had the same molten amber eyes, the same dimple in his chin, the same scent and black leather jacket. Looking for you, of course. Jax motioned to where a number of Fae were waltzing. Wanna dance? You've got to be joking! I roared so loudly the music faltered. If people weren't already watching me, they definitely were now. I realize I'm underdressed. Jax gestured to his dark jeans and tight black t-shirt. But it was murder getting in here, so take pity on a guy. Take pity on you? My fists clenched, and only vaguely did I notice Hatter, who still hadn't taken his hand off of me, squeezed my shoulder. Jax, what the heck are you doing here? I came to see you, he repeated. You aged out of your contract, so it was safe for me to come back, to find you. You... what do you mean, safe? Jax's steady stare took me in with curiosity. Al, Doru told me he'd kill me if I didn't get the hell out of town. Get away from you. The moment I no longer belonged to him, I had to leave. He didn't want me distracting you, his prize assassin. It was like someone had stuck a knife through my heart. Jax, my first love, had left me without a word, and I'd always thought it was because he was over us that he no longer loved me. But was Doru really to blame? The same damn vampire who'd stood by and just watched me break down when Jax left? The overlord who had told me Jax wasn't worth my time? When I got back to the human world, I was so staking that vampire. Did you think I left because I wanted to? Jax's tone was light, almost joking, but this wasn't a joke to me. Nothing about this situation was funny. I, I, need to dance. I said the first thing that came to my mind, and immediately regretted it. If there was one way to put even more attention on myself when I was inches from losing it, dancing was it. Allow me. Henry's hand slipped down my arm to grasp my hand, and he pulled me away. Only then did I realize I was trembling. I sucked in a breath, determined to make sure no one else noticed. Dancing Fay parted as Hatter led me into their midst. Across the way, Hallid was gliding gracefully on the floor, his arms around a female Fay with antlers that appeared to be dipped in gold. I scanned the side of the room for the Riverland's queen, feeling like a subpar host— I hadn't even gotten to say hi to them yet, and now I wasn't sure I wanted to. I felt too raw, as if someone had rubbed sandpaper over my heart, like I'd snap at any second. Thankfully, the queen had remained at the head table, and people surrounded her. No doubt she noticed my outburst. How could she not? But she didn't appear to be dwelling on it. That was fine. I'd obsess enough for the both of us, thank you very much. Henry stopped us in the middle of the crowded floor and extended his hand. I took it, and we were off, spinning through the sea of dancers. Who is he? Henry asked quietly so only I could hear. His eyes weren't even on me, and now that I'd been pulled from my inner turmoil, I noticed that he was stiff, angry. An ex-boyfriend? My dance partner cleared his throat. That much is obvious. Are you sure he is in your past? He seems to have traveled far to find you. He... I swallowed down the pain that always came with remembering the day I'd awoken in my apartment to find Jax's side of the bed empty, his clothes stripped from the closet. He'd cast a silencing spell over my room before he left, ensuring I didn't wake to stop him. We aren't together. Haven't been for months. I couldn't even say we'd broken up because that hadn't happened. I'd simply woken one day to find the best part of my life, the most important part, gone. And I'd never heard from him again. Until today. The music shifted, and flowing with the tide of dancers, Hatter spun me. 
When I came back to face him, our noses inches from one another. He looked different from the proud man who presented me to those attending the feast, almost like he was crumbling from within. Do you love him? Henry asked suddenly, as if the words were being ripped from him. I pressed my lips together. I wanted to deny it, wanted to scream that I hated Jax. But did I? The blonde wizard had been my first love, and though I'd thought little about him since arriving in Fairy, he'd always been on my mind in the human world. I'd see reminders of him constantly, and every time it would hurt. It's okay if you do, Alice, Henry added, his voice cracking slightly as the music slowed to a stop. I'd taken too long to reply, and now, oh God, I, can I cut in? Again, the sound of his voice made me stiffen. How dare he? I turned to find Jax grinning, as if he hadn't just shattered my entire world. Hey, Al, I don't know the moves, but can I take you for a spin? I want to talk. I pulled away from Henry, fists bawling at my sides. You do, do you? Funny how now you want to talk. Oh, God, there I went, yelling again. But I couldn't help it. Even if Doru was to blame, which I wasn't sure I believed yet, Jax could have tried to contact me. He could have done something. Anything. We were trained assassins. We literally got away with murder, so it wasn't like we were idiots. I've wanted to speak to you for months, Jax replied. But you know how Doru is, Al. Please, let me explain. No. I waved a hand, gesturing broadly to the Grand Hall. Can't you see this is the worst possible time for this? How did you even get here anyway? Excellent question. Henry growled, his tone so low and dangerous that it tore my attention from Jax. I sucked in a breath. Hatter's face was stone, his jaw so tight a muscle ticked in it. I'd never seen him so pissed. He looked like he wanted to throw down. Fae from Wonderland are trickling into the human world. Jax shrugged. News is spreading through the magical community that the queen was overthrown by a girl who called herself the Dagger. Once I heard, I knew it had to be you. He studied the room. Didn't expect this princess stuff, but can't say I'm that surprised. You've always had that sort of command. You didn't answer her question. Henry pressed. Did you break through a portal into this kingdom? In keeping with her other isolation tactics, my aunt had sealed the portals between Wonderland and the human world. I'd only gotten through with the joint efforts of a witch from the human world and a fae on this side who was willing to break the rules. At the behest of the rebels, they'd worked together to keep the doorway open while Harold came to get me. Nah, just paid to get to the snowcap court and then bought a pegasus from there. I had a guide, of course. He's sightseeing in the city. And no one thought to inform me that more guests arrived? I couldn't believe it. I'd been so fast to spot the Riverland Queen that others hadn't had a chance to tell me, but the guards should be better at sending up the alarm. I made sure we arrived undetected. Jack smirked, and I wanted to slap that smug smile off his face. Ugh, jackass. He must have used an invisibility potion, or maybe a spell. When we were together... Jax hadn't mastered that spell yet, but things had changed. He was free now, able to travel the world and learn from whomever he chose. Surely he could have learned a trick or two in our time apart. Hell, in just a couple of weeks, I had rid a kingdom of an evil queen. By comparison, learning a freaking spell was nothing. So you snuck into my kingdom and crashed a party to ambush me? I snorted derisively. What makes you think I want to see you, let alone dance with you? You know you can't say no to me. I'm too charming. The cocky asshat winked and placed a hand on my arm. I messed up, but I was scared of Doru. We all were. Give me a chance, Al. I'll make it up to you. You're probably only here because I'm a princess. I muttered, pulling my arm back. Why the hell would I care about you being a princess? Jax growled so loudly that around the room, people began murmuring. Oh no, I'd been so focused on Jax, I'd pretty much forgotten I had an audience. 
Jax's eyebrows knitted together as he came closer, his tone dipping lower. I know you, Al. Where you've been, who you are, what you've done. I don't care if you're a princess or not. Now come on, dance with me. Please? As much as I hated the situation, Jax was right about a couple of things. He did know who I was, what I'd done, where I'd had to go to do those horrible things. People here didn't know me as Alice the Dagger. They'd heard the name, but they didn't know my past. Here, I was Princess Alice, a warrior, or liberator to some. But really, I wasn't that at all. I was a trained killer, a person who'd taken on a queen. And with the skill set I'd had since I was young, aided by my new Aether magic, I was unbeatable. But noble? Regal? Maybe by blood, but in reality, I was a street kid. Though sometimes, when I saw the way Hatter or the Pixies looked at me, a small part of me thought maybe I could be those other things. Al? Jax held out his hand. For a moment, I stared down at it. For a moment, I almost took it. But Hatter shifted next to me, pulling me from the trauma of my past life, and I shook my head. Nah, I'm good. Feel free to help yourself to some food before you leave. A shadow crossed Jax's face, but he dropped his hand. Fine, no dance. But I'm not leaving, I... The princess told you that you're not welcome in her kingdom. Hatter interjected, his voice a growl. Unless it's a murderous vampire lord doing the commanding, I'm not famous for doing what I'm told. Jack shot back. Besides, if I leave, will that change your mind? You won't, I declared. That's what I thought, so I think I'll stay right. Hatter lunged and threw a punch. A crack rang out as his fist connected with Jax's jaw. I stepped back, hands flying to my mouth. What the hell had just happened? Hatter! I yelled. Stop! Henry! But he had apparently had enough of the wizard. A circle of onlookers formed around the two men, stopping a healthy distance away and greedily watching the events unfold. Jax punched back, and Hatter retaliated with wind, blowing his opponent backward. Jax righted himself, not missing a beat as sage green magic sprayed from my ex's fingers, slamming into Henry. The fae fell to the ground, toppling over a nearby lord and lady. Before he could rise, Jax was already winding up again. No, stop! I shouted, vaguely aware of the pixies yelling for someone to put an end to this. This is absurd! Gathering up my skirt, I made to intercede, but Prince Hallid burst from the crowd, running toward me, the pixies flying at his side. Don't hurt Henry! Dumb shouted as Aether magic shimmered from Hallid, creating a wall between Jax and Hatter. The men stopped going at each other, but their eyes were still narrowed and burning with anger, their chests heaving. I think that's quite enough for tonight, gentlemen. The Prince of the Riverlands locked eyes with me. Perhaps these two should be shown to their rooms, Princess Alice. I'll show myself out. Hatter grunted, turning and marching from the room. I wanted to follow, but Jax reached out and touched my arm. Yeah, Al, I'll stay quiet in my room. Maybe someone, you perhaps, can show me the way. The ball's on this guy. I glared at him. Fine, you can stay, but don't return to the celebration tonight. You got it, babe. Improper! She's a princess, not a babe! Dee hissed as the rest of the crowd murmured. Very few were so casual with me here. Don't call me that, I said. It's Princess Alice. The hypocrisy in that statement stunned even me, but I had to distance myself from him in any way that I could. Guards? I snapped before Jax could give me another one of his smart aleck remarks. Show this man to the South Tower. A guard I didn't know approached. Are you sure, princess? Usually guests are kept in the North Tower, or the West. I was absolutely sure. I wanted him far from me. There are bedchambers in the South, no? I asked. There are? 
then that will suit him. The armored man motioned for Jax to go with him. My ex understood he would get no more from me, because he moseyed toward the soldier. Night, Al. See you tomorrow. He winked at me and blew an air kiss, gestures that sent even more murmurs through our audience. We'll see. I turned my back on him to face the crowd. As if getting the lords and ladies to want to win my affections tonight hadn't already been difficult, that scene would make it all but impossible. All night long, people would talk about Jax, or maybe how Hatter had lost his cool. Well, screw them. I wasn't here to kiss their asses, or answer their questions about Jax or Henry, and I certainly wasn't going to take the blame for my ex showing up and ruining the night. So, well aware that they were already watching me, I pointed to the musicians. Play. They did so, and before I could decide what to do next, Prince Hallad swept in. Would you like to dance? He leaned closer. Just act like nothing happened and that we're having fun. That will shift their focus. No one can resist a prince wooing a princess. Although I still wanted to race after Hatter to soothe the anger in him, I couldn't. Duty kept me rooted. I was here to meet the nobles. It was the first step in bringing change to Wonderland. They might want to gossip about Hatter and Jax, but I'd do my best to dissuade them. So I took Hallett's hand. You're a lifesaver. He kissed my knuckles, a gesture that sent a wave of gossip rushing through the crowd. I've been in the spotlight when I didn't want to be. Though people were still watching us, as Hallett and I began to dance a slow, easy waltz, others either followed suit, joining us on the dance floor, or returned to their table. I take it that wizard was interested in courting you. I couldn't stop the snort of laughter that escaped me. You could say that. We were together for a long time, but not anymore. Why not? Because you're here? No, we broke up long before I learned about Wonderland. A sigh parted my lips. It was complicated then, and it's even more so now. He told me something about our history that I didn't know. Not that Doru's interference changed anything, but it did make me soften toward Jax. I blamed my new, gentler nature on the Pixies. Maybe on Hatter, too. I see. If it's any consolation, your people seem to have moved on. Hallid gestured behind me. I twisted to find the Pixies putting on an outlandish performance that had captured the attention of half those present at the feast. D caught my eye and winked, making my heart clench. They're good friends, I said, all too sure the twins were making fools of themselves for me. Agreed. They're also quite persuasive. Did you know that D has already invited herself to my court's next ball? A laugh burst from me. She didn't. Oh, she did. I suspect I should be relieved she hasn't persuaded me to propose. Not that she isn't lovely, but I'm not prepared for that sort of commitment. He paused. Yet. I swallowed. Had Hallid and his mother come here to do more than check on the fate of the rebellion? Chapter 4 the back of my neck prickled as my steps rang down the corridor. Early morning sunlight flooded in through the windows, illuminating my pants and tunic as I passed through it. I huffed out a heated breath. Though nothing of note had happened yet that day, I was sure it would soon. I was in the process of tracking down Henry, Alron, and Sanzu to make them listen to me. Much to the servants' confusion, my friends and I preferred to take our meals in a small dining room, rather than the monstrosity of a space my aunt had used, which was nearly the size of the Grand Hall. I knew that Hatter, Alron, and Sanzu were already eating, because I'd sent the pixies down to check. When the girls reported back to me, they swore they'd remained unseen and that Hatter would have no idea I was coming. Though I didn't enjoy the idea of ambushing him or having an awkward meal, I needed to clear the air about Jax. Taking a deep breath, I closed my eyes. Why had he come back? Why was my past here to haunt me? I just wanted to do right by the people in this kingdom and move on, start my own life, one that I could finally be proud of. 
Opening my eyes and shaking off my insecurities, I approached the dining room door and barged through before anyone within could hear me coming. The men looked up, Hatter's lips compressing at the sight of me, and my stomach pitted. Yup, he was still pissed. I was so unused to that expression being pointed at me. Hey guys! I pulled up a chair and took a seat opposite Henry. I need to talk to you about last night. I... Servants chose that moment to swoop in, offering water and tea. I took them up on the ladder. Between Hatter's annoyance, Jax's arrival, and Hallid's insinuation that he might be here to court me, I hadn't slept well at all and needed caffeine. All these problems from men, they're the bane of my existence. I sipped from a teacup rimmed with gold. So, what do you want to talk about, Alice? Alron asked his tone softer than normal. Jax, I said simply. You met, or saw him, last night. He's an ex-boyfriend of mine that really knows how to make an entrance. Hatter snorted his contempt, but said nothing. He merely continued to eat his porridge, each bite more aggressive than the last. I want you guys to know that I didn't invite him here. He's from my past, but we haven't spoken in months— I didn't expect him to come back into my life, and I certainly did not expect that fiasco last night. He seemed sure that you'd want him in your life. Henry ripped his eyes from his food to scowl up at me. It was then that I noticed the shadow on his square jawline, the bruise where Jax had landed a punch. Are you all right? I traced my own jawline with my finger. I'd been punched a couple of times. It was unavoidable, growing up doing what I did and it sucked. Fine, I'll see a healer later. Okay, good. A pregnant pause followed, the silence swelling by the second. In that echo of nothingness, I swore I was breathing louder than normal, but I was determined to get through the awkwardness. When it became clear Henry wasn't going to say anything else, I broke the silence. So yeah, Jax was important in my life, probably the most important person. As you were to me, Al. My heart rate spiked, and unable to believe how god-awful his timing was, had it always been like this? I spun to find Jack standing in the doorway, arms folded over his chest. Behind him, a soldier stood, looking apologetic. He insisted I bring him to speak with you, Princess Alice. I did! Jax boomed, totally unapologetic. I didn't get to finish what I came to say last night. Oh, I think you did. I pushed my chair back. In fact, I think it's time we get you back to the mainland. Not until you hear me out. He swaggered into the dining room, blonde curls waving in the crisp sea breeze coming in through the window. I hated how confident he was, how good he looked. Then I hated that I'd acknowledged he looked good, if only to myself. I've literally crossed into a new realm for you, he continued. I was very drunk for two days and paid out the ass to get to this island, princess, so I think the least you can do is hear me out. Not a word was spoken. It was so silent, I wouldn't have doubted the men had stopped breathing. Fine, I grumbled. If I listen to you, will you leave? If that's what you really want, I will. Jax pulled up the chair next to mine. This close, I was shocked to find he wasn't bruised. Hatter had gotten in a good slug and bore the signs of their fight. Why didn't Jax? Healing potion. He winked. He'd always been good at reading me. I used to find it charming. Not anymore. Did you forget that all good assassins keep one on them? He teased. We can't go around all busted up like this guy. He gestured to Hatter. The sound of wood scraping against stone ground through the dining room as Henry shot out of his chair, looking like he was going to murder someone. I'll take my leave. Hatter, you don't have to go. My words were of no use. He was already rounding the table. I think it's best that I do. He called without looking at me. I'll see you at the execution, Princess Alice. The moment Henry was out the door, the other two males stood too, though they looked a bit sheepish about it. 
We have much to prepare for today, Alron said. If he wasn't a fae and therefore incapable of telling an untruth, I'd have called him a liar. Until this afternoon, Princess Alice. Sanzu looked even more guilty as he retreated with his friend. Like last night, I wanted to follow, but refrained. Maybe if I really did hear him out, Jax would leave and I could get on with my life. Once we were alone, Jax chuckled. Is it me or you who scares them? They're not scared, I grumbled. You're that annoying. I beg to differ, though if I make them quiver in their boots, I'm pretty damn sure I'm not the only one. An execution, Al? My aunt. He didn't look surprised by that, which made me raise an eyebrow. I see you have already learned of her fate. I do my research. This was something I knew about him, and it was a useful habit. He researched, I thought fast on my feet. We worked well together on missions. It had always been me and him, ruling the underground world. Until it wasn't. I pursed my lips. What else did you hear about me? That you now control the Aether. The wizard rocked his chair back and put his feet on the table. I guess you're not demi but full? Never heard of anyone less than full fey controlling Aether. That's right, I muttered. Which means, if you're not already, you'll be limited by fey weaknesses. He smirked. That healing potion isn't the only elixir I brought with me to this realm. I sucked in a breath. Are you saying... I could hardly utter the words out loud. After all, if I did, it was basically saying that I wanted to lie which wasn't the case. But my past was shameful. More than that, I had a secret. One I wasn't keen to have spread. The prophecy my aunt told me about still haunted me. Apparently, on the day of my birth, an oracle proclaimed that I would pull those of Wonderland into darkness, that I would end the kingdom. It was vague, so my parents ignored it, but that was the justification my aunt used to murder them and take over the kingdom. I hadn't told anyone about it yet, not even Henry. It was never the right moment. And now he was so angry. Would that moment ever come? Did I want to tell him? Was it even real? Where I came from, prophecies were flimsy, notoriously unreliable. But was that the case here? Fairy was so different from the human world. Still, I had to know I could keep that information safe. So finally, I asked, Did you bring that potion that Xavier made me take every moon cycle? Yep, I have one and the very same, the potion that will allow you to lie, Jack said. But I'm not just going to hand it over. My fists balled up before I caught myself, and Jack's noticed the reaction. And I see you want what I have. He pulled his feet from the table and grinned. I already told you my truth, that Xavier made me leave, but I was gonna come back for you, and I know you're pissed. You don't say. I scoffed. Maybe leave a note or something? Couldn't. You know how the vamp is, Al? Jax's tone dipped. But I can see that you're still peeved about it, so I'll make you a deal. Here we go. What? I stay here. We spend time together daily, and you give me a real chance. Give me a week, tops. If at the end of that week you still want me to go, fine, I will. But you'll get the potion, allowing you one more month to hide whatever it is you want to. He snorted. Like we don't have a lifetime's worth of horrors to keep hidden. I swallowed. He wasn't wrong. But, he continued, if you find at the end of the week that you want me to stay, I will do that too. Jax's molten amber eyes stared into mine in a way that made my insides warm. I hated that I was so attracted to him. I want a chance, a real chance, to reconnect, to make it up to you. Why? Isn't it obvious? I still love you, Al. For the first time, every inch of smugness was gone from his face. His sincerity made it hard to breathe. I was an idiot for obeying Doru, 
and I've regretted it every day since. I want to be the man you deserve. I didn't respond. I couldn't. Months ago, this would have been exactly what I wanted, no needed, to hear. But I was different now. I'd grown up. I was free. Plus, I had met Hatter. There was something real there. Maybe not love quite yet, but it wasn't far off. Then again, I still planned to leave Wonderland. I hoped Elise would come with me, but if not, I figured I'd make do with frequent trips to Fairy. Now that my aunt was gone, there was nothing stopping me from stepping through a portal and coming here. And there was no denying that I had loved Jax fiercely. And when we were together, he had returned that love. I'd given everything to him. My first love. Everyone said that was a special thing. I blew out a breath, unsure I wanted Jax to stay, but sure I wanted that potion, needed it to hide the details of the prophecy and other stuff about myself. I'd never be comfortable sharing my whole life, and the prophecy... My stomach twisted. Fine, I get the potion either way. No matter what you choose, I'll give you the potion. Then you can get it analyzed here. Jax looked around the dining area, wrinkling his nose at the old world appearance. Actually, maybe not here. Perhaps a more modern court that's heard of science. There's one of those, right? If there was, I didn't know of it. But I'd take the vial and figure out its components, even if I had to make the damn brew myself. One week is all you get, I told him firmly. One week is all I'll need, princess. With the smoothness of a jaguar, Jax rose and bowed. I'll see you at the execution. The morning passed by quickly. Though I wasn't involved with the logistics and planning of the execution, I had plenty on my mind to keep myself occupied. Jax, and the deal I'd struck with him. Hatter, who had totally been avoiding me since breakfast. A freaking execution. Finding Elise. How the hell was I going to get into the dark court? Though I'd never seen it, I knew it was surrounded by an impenetrable force I didn't understand called the Rift. I strolled the garden, enjoying the sun, and the faint breeze made my wide-legged linen pants flow around me. For once, I was alone, and I seized that time to think and take in the new topiaries. It felt weird, taking a second to literally smell the rose-perfumed air of the garden. Any ode to my aunt had already been vanquished, hacked off with the leaves, and gardeners were at work reshaping the greenery. Many shrubs and hedges were shapeless with no direction, but as I rounded the corner, I found one that was fully formed, and it made my breath hitch. Harold, the crier of Wonderland, the fae who'd informed the Red Queen that she could not, in fact, deny a trial by Aether once challenged— the creature who'd taken the god's flame into him, assuring that the trial went on, even at the cost of his own life. The puka who'd approached me as a white rabbit in my world had been immortalized in this garden. Looks exactly like him, I whispered, approaching the topiary. It even had the waistcoat and pocket watch that the puka favored. I could almost hear Harold fretting that we were late. Unbidden, tears flooded my eyes. He'd been remembered with a small funeral, but he deserved more. Whoever had given the instruction for this to be created was a genius. It's lovely, a feminine voice said softly. Quickly I wiped my eyes and twisted to find the Queen of the Riverlands. She stood some twenty paces away, two soldiers accompanying her. That I hadn't heard their approach spoke to how deeply I'd been in my own head. He's something of a hero, I said. Since being here, I've been told the tales of the trial by Aether, and become aware of his sacrifice, the queen replied. Brave of him to stand up to such a crazed woman. Absolutely. I faced her properly. I was certain that she hadn't found me by chance. The queen had something to say. What can I do for you, Queen Aquatia? She smiled. Shall we walk? Sure. The queen motioned for her soldiers to follow at a distance. Whatever she had to say, 
she didn't want to be overheard. We'd gone only a few paces when Queen Aquatia spoke. There's no good way to bring this up. It's always awkward, so I'll be out with it. I wanted to broach the subject of your ascension to the throne. She looked at me, intelligence brimming in her eyes. And if you have considered a royal pairing. I stopped in my tracks, which the queen seemed to anticipate, because she halted too, and far more smoothly than me. I understand that in your world, young people often wait to wed. Aquatia added. But you're of royal blood, and in fairy, marriages are used to cement alliances. I would be interested in creating one with the Wonderland Court. I wanted to yell that I'd barely turned eighteen, but the queen was watching me expectantly, regally, so instead of indignation, a question bubbled up my throat. I, uh, with Hallid? Precisely, Aquatia replied. You're close to the same age, and though your interactions have been few, you seem to get along. That was true. Hallid was a good guy, and hot to boot. I was sure he had a number of princesses nipping at his heels. But whether I was among them... I cleared my throat. If I'm being honest, I hadn't considered it. Nor would anyone have expected you to. Even if you agreed to a marriage bond today... You would be within your rights to request a year or two of true courtship. Aquatia began walking again, and I fell into step with her. Are you aware that I met your mother before Frederick did? He was my cousin, a close one. I knew they'd pair well. But Sela was the eldest princess of Wonderland, and he was betrothed to her. That didn't last long, though. I inhaled sharply. Did you know my mother and father when they were together, though? Did you see them together? I attended their wedding. Aquatia's face softened with the memory. It was a binding of two kingdoms and two hearts. Quite a beautiful day. I wished there were photos, but the closest thing this realm had were paintings. None portraying my mother and father had survived the rule of the Red Queen. My aunt was pissed. She was. From that day on, word spread of the elder princess, the scorned one, many called her. As royal duties prevented me from flying to visit Frederick, I never witnessed her anger firsthand, but others said fury consumed Sela, and she became dark. The queen pressed her lips together until they became white. When I heard what Sela had done to take the crown, I was enraged, but not surprised. She'd always had a hint of madness to her. Frederick had noticed it, too. Yes, my aunt was crazy. Cruel and manipulative, too. I'm hoping this proposal of courtship between you and Hallid can bring our kingdoms together again. The queen admitted. I swallowed thickly. I might not stay here. She twisted, gazing upon me incredulously. I will for a while, I amended, to find my sister, but I'll be leaving shortly after we bond. Curious, Aquatia replied. I'd gotten the sense that you were comfortable here. You have friends. A pause. Perhaps more? That gentleman from last night seemed quite upset that you had a caller. Henry Hatter. I breathed. The way you speak his name is telling, Alice. I have a bit of a crush. Nothing more? Yes, but it felt like too much to say that to a stranger. Hatter and I had only known one another for weeks. I feigned nonchalance. Like I said, I plan on giving up the crown and leaving, so it doesn't matter, does it? The queen had mastered the art of lengthy pauses, and she enlisted one now. Only the sound of our footsteps on the garden path and the chirping of birds filled the air. I suppose not, she replied finally. Hallid will be sorry to hear it. He too noticed that you had a suitor, perhaps two, but he took a liking to you. 
sorry to disappoint. We ladies do what we must. I have to say, I'm envious of your position, that you truly have a choice. She gave me a small smile that indicated she really did understand. My own marriage is wonderful, but I did not have that. Now that we were through that minefield, I saw a change of subject. The Riverland Court is by the Dark Court, right? Neighbors, you've seen the rift? It is a blight on the countryside of the Riverlands. We plan to go through it to get to the Dark Court. Aquatia inhaled. I had wondered. You know that's quite dangerous, correct? Yes. I chewed on the inside of my cheek. Has anyone done it? Those who do are altered. What do you mean by altered? The Dark Court has soldiers called Shadows. They were once Fae, and now are something different. Something evil. They may pass through the rift, and have. They often take prisoners, too. The Queen assessed me. I know your sister is there, but are you sure you can do this? I wasn't sure of anything. I have to try, I replied instead. Do you think, when we make the journey, we can go through your border? She looked conflicted. If that's what you truly wish. I exhaled. That at least would be easier than approaching from the sea. Might I offer a bit of unsolicited advice, princess? Of course. I have not met a normal fay who crossed the rift, but there is a rumor that someone has done so. Really? I couldn't help feeling somewhat annoyed that she hadn't come out with that information before. Still, I didn't press. She looked uncomfortable just talking about the place. Yes. Her cheeks colored. I do not wish for you to learn of the stain on my land, but if you're insistent, it might be worth investigating. The fay who allegedly crossed the rift was from the Crystal Court. Crystal Court? That sounds nice. They are a land of mystics, oracles, and snobs. I laughed at the unexpected description. What makes you say that? Their court is an island like this one, but even further flung from the mainland. As such, they're isolationists and do not participate in gatherings. They even had the nerve to throw an invitation from my own parents back in their faces. Her lips twisted. I am not sure I trust them, but for you, paying a visit there could be beneficial. As in, it might keep me alive. The Fae returned there? I asked. He was on the brink of death when he emerged from the rift. Stories tell he'd been trapped in the dark court for years, but really, it was the rift that nearly killed him. He did go home, though I know little of that, as my court did not assist. Who did? I asked, trying to draw a mental map of that area of fairy in my mind. That would be the Snowcap Court. They are quite trustworthy. Then this fae seems like a lead I should keep in mind. Chapter 5 The hour I'd been both awaiting and dreading had finally come. Bells tolled outside, and though there was no way such sounds could penetrate the thick stone walls, I imagined I heard the whispers of Fay as they streamed toward the castle. Alron had told me to prepare for how many people would show, how many people would want to see my aunt die. I hadn't doubted him, but when I peered out the window of my tower room, I still gasped. Thousands of Fay waited on the lawn near the execution site. She had a knack for making enemies. I murmured, slipping a dagger into a sheath hanging on my hip and pulling my hair back. Alron had also mentioned that I should probably wear a dress, but screw that. I liked pretty things, but I was tired of playing dress-up. If I couldn't wear my comfy leggings, then black trousers and a gold tunic with a hood would do for the day. Plus, the sun had been overtaken by clouds, and it looked like it might rain at any moment. For that kind of weather... I wanted pants and a hood. Not to mention, pants were better for situations when I had to be on my toes. 
My aunt was set to die, but I didn't think for a second that meant she'd go easily. That word wasn't in her arsenal. I was ready for anything. A knock came at the door, and I steeled myself. All day long, Hatter had avoided me, sending Alron to give messages regarding the execution. But surely he wouldn't leave me high and dry right now, right? I hoped not. I'd done nothing wrong. It wasn't like I'd invited Jax here. Though somehow, I still felt like I was in the wrong. I wanted to speak with Henry alone, to clear the air. So when I opened the door and found not Henry, but Prince Hallid, I frowned. I'll admit women don't usually look at me that way, he said, a playful smile on his lips. Sorry, I was expecting someone else. We have things to discuss. He extended his arm for me to take. I was sent because others seem to think that you arriving with another royal will quell any lingering Red Queen supporters. How they could be so blind as to support that woman still, I don't know, but the idea had merit. To the execution? I closed the door behind me and took his arm. Sure. We'd only made it a few steps down the stairs when Hallett cleared his throat. My mother tells me she spoke with you today of a marriage alliance. Uh, yeah. Unease trickled through me. I didn't really want to get into this before an execution. I wanted to let you know that I'm not disappointed by your choice, and I still want to be friends. Oh, well, that was better than I'd anticipated, though there was definitely some ambiguity in his words. Is that what we are? I pressed. Friends? We could be. Did the queen tell you that I won't be here much longer? I asked softly. She did. But I have friends in your realm. What's a portal hop? I smiled at that. How often do you see them? Not often. So far, they have only come here. My court gave them refuge before the demon war. However, one day, I hope to visit the human world, if only briefly. I stopped and stared at him. I was in the demon war. The Rivalent's court was proud to harbor key players, Hallett said. I was caught unawares and injured by Dark Court shadows, right near the rift. It was shortly before the Battle of Spellcasters. He pulled aside his shirt to reveal a scar on his shoulder. I could not help during the fight at the Academy. Not that my mother would have allowed it anyhow. I am the heir. My heart rate increased. I was at that battle. Who was at your court? This conversation was getting more interesting by the second. Odette Dane... Her paramour, Alexander Wardwell, and many of their friends. I believe they are something of celebrities in parts of your world. I gaped. I fought alongside her. I paused. Did you hear what happened to her? Hallad swallowed. I did. Strange things are happening in both worlds. They were. Odette was proof of a new magical age. Now that I thought about it, the rift was too— even if it had been around for years, it was evidence that things were changing, or had been for a while. Did anyone really know where it came from? How had it formed? Lost Princess returning to their homeland happens to be one of those strange affairs, Hallid added with an easy grin. I hadn't thought to include myself on that list, but perhaps he was right. It seemed much more normal than ancient magic resurfacing, like Odette and her friends believed. We turned into a wider corridor and fell in with a stream of people all heading the same way we were. When they noticed a princess and a prince were in their midst, they gave us more space, though we didn't require it for long. Hallid and I arrived at the door to the outside quickly and stepped through. A salty breeze teased my skin, flowing in off the ocean below the steep cliffs. Before us, a crowd spread far and wide, and at our appearance, many bowed or curtsied. I scanned the people and finally found Hatter. Alongside Alron, Sanzu, and the Pixies, he'd positioned himself at the front of the crowd, near the guillotine, apparently a favorite tool of my aunt's. Our eyes met, and he nodded. It wasn't a smile, but he was here and acknowledging me. It was a start. Clear the way! A soldier shouted, and with another armed fay, barreled through the crowd, making an aisle in which Hallid and I could pass. 
shall we? The prince asked. Time to get this over with, I said. As we walked through the masses of fay, many inclined their heads with respect or smiled. Only a few wore unpleasant expressions on their faces, their lips pursed, their brows pinched and eyes narrowed. Were they Red Queen's sympathizers? If so, would they hurt others for the queen they loved? The dagger hung heavier on my hip. Perhaps once the execution was done, I'd bring them in for questioning, just to be safe. Though I did not want to claim any title, I felt a responsibility for these Fae's safety. After what felt like years of being stared at, Hallid and I reached the front. Hatter stepped forward, and I caught Dee and Dumb, perched atop Sanzu's shoulders, craning their necks so they could listen to our conversation. Nosies. Hey, I said, not sure what else to say. I didn't want to get into what happened last night or this morning. Not here, not with so many people around. Your aunt wishes to speak with you. Henry replied. Oh, I... Al? Jax pushed his way through the crowd, his timing as fantastic as ever. Where should I stand? Henry's jaw worked from side to side, but always the bigger man, he inclined his head. I'll be over here if you need me. If I do, will you actually be there? I asked, unable to help myself. I believed that he cared, but this morning had been rough. For a moment, his face crumpled. Alice, I know things have been strained, but I'm here for you. He exhaled loudly through his nose. Can we talk after this? I'd like that. Hell, I was about to see a family member beheaded. I'd need someone to talk to after this, because even for an ex-assassin, that was next level. Al, shut up, Jax! I yelled, not bothering to look back at the wizard. I don't care where you stand, keep out of the way. A few face sniggered, and though it was petty, I took pleasure in that. Jax shouldn't be here, and he was making my life much more difficult right now. I climbed the stairs leading to the platform that the guillotine was on. Though I'd been unsure about this whole setup, thought it a bit much, honestly, the others who'd passed judgment on my aunt had insisted upon it. An axe would have worked fine to achieve justice, but the guillotine made a statement. My aunt had always relished saying, off with her head. Now she'd get to live it in the most flagrant fashion. Celia White stood at the back of the raised wooden platform, her hands bound behind her in enchanted iron manacles, preventing her from using her magic, and, from the looks of it, giving her one hell of a rash. Behind her, down the steep cliffside, an empty beach crawled into a sprawling sea. It was the same beach where Chester had fought a kraken for me in the Calling of Creatures trial. Somewhere beyond the water was the mainland of Fairy. We'd be there soon, infiltrating the dark court. Beside Sela was her king consort, He'd been sentenced to die, too. After all, he might not have partaken in every horrific act Sela had, but he'd stood by and watched it happen. If anyone had the power to stop her, it was him. But after a trial of his own, it was determined that he hadn't made a single move against her. He'd been happy to stay quiet and allow himself to benefit from my aunt's wicked streak. He was as guilty as her. I walked up to the former queen, chin lifted. You requested to speak with me? You're really going through with this, killing off your blood. I don't see why you think it's appropriate to ask me that, I said. You killed my parents, would have killed me had I not overpowered you. She snarled at that, but regained her composure quickly. I have anger issues, but you're better than me, Alice. We're blood and if you give me the chance, I can do better. You're no blood of mine, I said. You gave up that right long ago. If you get rid of me, Alice, then the prophecy is yours to bear alone. But I can guide you back to the light. I could watch out for you. She quirked a dark eyebrow, and I hated that even now, after she'd been imprisoned for days and dirt smeared her face, the Red Queen was still beautiful. I assume you have told no one of your fate, what it is I'd tried to avoid. I will not pull the kingdom into darkness, nor kill many, 
I hissed. My parents didn't believe in that, and I don't either. Liar. Despite my inner voice's accusation, I wasn't sure I believed in the prophecy or not, but it did make me think my plan was smart. If I wasn't in this realm, I couldn't pull Wonderland into darkness. If I wasn't here, I would have no hand in its course. Your sister knows of the prophecy. She believes it. I snorted. Why am I even talking to you? You're a psychopath, a liar. You're the one who was dragging the kingdom into darkness, not me. Perhaps, but perhaps not. Are you willing to take that chance? I swelled. No more of this. I'm going to give you one more chance to earn a shred of my respect. Tell me exactly where Elise is. Sela smirked. You know where she is, Alice. The only place she could be. Her red lips pursed. The dark court. I stared at her, unable to believe that she'd actually said it. She'd hinted before, given me enough to be 99% certain, but she'd not actually spoken the name. The fact she'd actually given me something to go on was shocking. You'll never see her, Sela added. She's there forever. We'll see about that. I waved at the soldier standing a respectful distance away. Off with her head. As I descended the stairs, heavy footsteps assured me that the soldiers were doing as I requested, and by the time I reached the ground, Sela was standing before the guillotine. I nodded to Alron, who, after the death of Harold, would play the part of Crier. The tall elf marched to stand in front of the platform, and the crowd silenced. Only the faint sounds of the ocean filled my ears. We stand here today to witness the execution of the once queen, Sela White. Alron boomed. She was found guilty of many crimes, the most severe of which were against the Fae of Wonderland, the very people she was sworn to protect. Jeers came from the crowd, but we weren't having that. I wanted this over with fast, wanted others to witness it and leave. Wanted to get on with saving my sister. I blasted Aether into the air, creating a boom, and every single trap shut. Go on, Alron, I ordered in the restored silence. He cleared his throat. For that, Sela White, you are to meet your end by beheading. And he lost words. I'd rather not have given her any, but apparently it was tradition. So I just crossed my arms over my chest as Alron joined me, Hatter, Sanzu, and the Pixies, and waited. The once queen was still standing between two soldiers, her hands clasped in front of her. The executioner, who had only one job, waited behind the fallen monarch. My aunt sneered down at the people of her kingdom. You lot will rue the day you turned your backs on me. Is that all? I yelled. She sneered but said nothing more. Proceed, I commanded the guards. The pair of soldiers shoved my aunt to her knees, and the executioner approached. One pull of the string that held the blade, and it would fall, severing her neck. That gruesome effect wasn't something I ever thought I'd want to see, but I did want vengeance for my family, so I remained rooted in place, determined to witness every second. The executioner got into position, and murmurs rippled through the crowd. My aunt lifted her chin. She looked supremely confident. Part of me respected her for that, but a much larger part hated her ass. She has no right to be. A growl rumbled through the air, turning into a roar, and I stiffened. What the hell was that? The question had barely formed when a frigid breeze blew over the cliffside, so cold that I wrapped my arms around myself. Something was wrong. Off. And I wasn't the only one who sensed it. On the platform, the soldiers had frozen. The executioner, too. Sela, on the other hand, was laughing. And as a dragon, the fabled Jabberwocky blasted out of the clouds. Understanding dawned. Now! I screamed. Now! But it was too late. The moment the Jabberwocky appeared, dark figures climbed up and over the cliff. They were black as night, 
moved like smoke, and had eyes that gleamed like garnets. Faye screamed. Some pushed at others and began to run. What the? Dark Court shadows! The civilians need to run! Hallid shouted as the Jabberwocky's two tails pierced through the hearts of the soldiers on the platform. They fell, their eyes vacant. The beast then wasted no time spearing the executioner. Soldiers, attack! Hallid yelled, taking control of the situation like a trained soldier would. My aunt rose to her feet as four shadows approached her. One placed its hands on her manacles. The iron dissolved as if it weren't metal designed specifically to keep Fay trapped. How did it do that? Aren't they Fay? Then another detail struck me. Is that demon magic? The red color was so similar, but then again, some witches had red colored magic too. I squinted, trying to determine how to best this new opponent, as my aunt used her aether magic not to attack, but to free the king consort. Al! Jax yelled, and suddenly I was tossed to the ground and sent rolling. Faye cried and screamed and trampled all around us now, desperate to leave, to save their own skin. I pushed at the person who'd flung themselves at me. Get off! Al, I saved your ass! Jack shot back, pulling me up. Look! He pointed to where I just stood, and I gaped. The ground was scorched. I hadn't seen the attack coming, but it had very nearly killed me. Wait. I hadn't been standing there alone. Where was Hatter, the Pixies, Alron, and Sanzu? The answer came a moment later as Hatter pushed his way through the crowd. The others were right behind him. His emerald gaze cut to Jack's, and he nodded. We need to stop her, I yelled. Too late. Hatter pointed toward the sea. All my breath left me. My aunt was on the dragon's back, and the creature was flying away. Right behind Sela, the king sat, stealing terrified glances back at the crowd. The shadows were riding the Jabberwocky too, red eyes gleaming our direction, as if anticipating an attack. Let's follow her, I pressed. Let's... Bad idea, Hallid barked from behind me. I spun to find the Prince of the Riverlands speckled with blood, his sword drenched. My heart leapt into my throat. Where was his mother? Was she unharmed? The prince carried weapons, but the queen? Your mother? She's fine. Her soldiers shielded her, but it was a close one. I exhaled. Only one queen was meant to meet her end today, and it was not Aquatia. Good. Then to the stables. If we get the griffins ready, we can catch up. No. Hallett said, his tone in order that froze me before I'd even taken a step. Alice, remember the scar I showed you? Yeah? A shadow gave me that. On the other side of the rift, there are armies of them. You're not prepared to face them. Their magic is different. She's going to the Dark Court, right? I'm Aether-blessed, I challenged, not answering his question. As am I, but they're faster and stronger than normal fey. You told me you were caught unawares before. Hallett scowled. True, but you wouldn't catch her anyway. The Jabberwocky is fast. I wanted to retort, but a glance at the sky told me he was right. The dragon had already disappeared into the clouds. Chapter 6 My friends and I marched through the castle corridors, seeking a place to speak plainly and hopefully solve the catastrophe I now found myself in. In a mere hour, the city had gone from celebration to uproar. Faye, who'd been present during the botched execution, had dispersed into Hartstown, taking with them the tale of my aunt's escape. I suspected that her few supporters would spin this in a way to validate her claim to the throne, and while I might not want to wear the crown myself, we certainly couldn't have her back in power, so I sent squadrons of soldiers out into the city to squash any uprisings before they began. A general had warned me against sending armed Fay away from the palace, arguing that the Red Queen might return at any moment, but that would not be the case. Sela was long gone. She'd seek refuge in the Dark Court. When she gets there, 
What will happen to Elise? My pulse quickened, and as if he could hear it, Hatter eyed me sidelong. I swallowed and looked away. My aunt knew I intended to save my sister. Would she move her? Could she? How was Cela White even going to get into the dark court? Aquatia had said only one person had crossed the rift, and he hadn't been well afterward. Could Cela get through unscathed? But then again, the shadows had gone through the rift too. Would their magic help someone cross the rift? My fists clenched so tightly that my fingernails cut into my palms. I'd been so close to getting vengeance for my family, and then poof! My victory vanished. In here, Sanzu said. He'd been leading those closest to me, plus Hallid and, of course, nosy Jax, through the castle to a quiet place to talk. How he'd become so familiar with the fortress, I didn't know and didn't care. Right now, I only wanted to find my aunt. The blue-haired dwarf opened a door decorated with two crossed steel swords, and we marched inside to find a space dominated by a wooden circular table. Etched into its surface was a map of fairy. Is this a... war room? I asked. It was. Your grandfather was the last to use it, according to one of the older guardsmen, Sansu informed me. During his rule, Fairy was in a time of great tumult. I turned, taking in all the details. Most of the castle had been transformed in Sela's rule to reflect her warped sense of herself. Hearts adorned nearly every surface and wall, even lining the steps down to the dungeons. Here, however, there was none of that. Taken by itself, I would have thought the space belonged to another castle. Did they redecorate already? The thin layer of dust on the table made it seem unlikely. Sanzu shook his head. The Red Queen never used it. By her design, Wonderland was isolated, so there was no need for a war room. He brushed off a few chairs, and dust filled the air. Actually, the guard I spoke with said she avoided this place. Interesting. How did the old king die? I asked. Rumor has it he passed in his sleep, Alron replied, though he sounded skeptical. Fay lived much longer than humans. Since learning I was full Fay, I hadn't considered my grandparents much, but now it struck me as odd that they'd perished. Even human grandparents often live to see their grandchildren well into adulthood. But perhaps my grandparents were super old when they had Sela and my mother? Or... Did Sela get along with her father? The question was out of my mouth before I could guard it. The others exchanged unsure glances, and Henry shrugged. There's no way for us to know, but there are older fae working in the castle. Perhaps ask them? I nodded, and made a mental note to put Chester on that task. Fay loved Cheshire cats, and rarely spoke with one. So when Faye could speak to one, they really seemed to open up to the cat. Plus, I didn't have the time to conduct those interviews myself. If the others agreed with my plan, I wouldn't be staying here much longer and would need to rely on my friends to help in my absence. Figuring we should get on with it, I waved my hand, calling my air magic. Wind gusted over the table, sending the dust soaring out an open window. Should we begin? Everyone sat, and as I did so, I took in the map— Wonderland Island was obvious. It was the largest landmass off of the mainland, but not the only one. There were actually many islands, most of them small, but that didn't mean Fay did not live there. Where is the Crystal Court? I asked. Why? Alron's eyebrows knitted together. Because I spoke with Queen Aquatia earlier, and she said that only one Fay other than Shadows has passed through the rift, and they came from there. Eyes widened all around. Dee recovered first, fluttering from where she'd sat cross-legged on the table to a spot on the map. She landed and spun, which made Jax nod like an old gross lecher. Appropriately, Dee scowled at him before directing her attention to me. Right here. I squinted, taking in the island named simply Crystal Island. That's small. The landmass had to be at least a fifth the size of Wonderland Island. It was also very far away, as if it had been flung into the middle of the sea by a giant. How many people reside there? 
And in the Crystal Court specifically, how long will it take to fly there? A day, Hallid replied. As for the population, no one knows for sure. Not a soul has spoken to a fay from that court in... decades. Maybe longer. Why not? They do not leave the island, and only accept certain visitors. Hallid explained. Royal ones, for marriage. But in a pinch, it's rumored they marry brother to sister. Sanzu inserted, nose wrinkling. That's what they do if no other court wishes to wed off an heir, which is common. After all, the other court will never see their family member again, unless they're permitted to visit the Crystal Court. Okay, one, gross. Two, I thought royal marriages in this realm were for alliances. If they never leave the island, then what good is their allyship? Aren't allies for... war? They are, the prince agreed. But the Crystal Court does not battle. Instead, they offer up their resources to those in their good graces. What resources? I asked. Crystals. Magical ones. What do they do? Many things. Though most who own them keep them secret. They're valuable. The more I learned about this court, the sketchier it felt. Okay, well, I think I need to go there and learn how one of their citizens crossed the rift, because I'm 100% sure the Red Queen is headed to the Dark Court, and the only way there is through the rift. I leaned back in my chair. I need to get to her before she moves Elise somewhere. Silence shrouded the table, only to be broken by Jax. I'm new here and all, but isn't the rift a cloud of deadly, all-consuming darkness that surrounds two kingdoms? It is. Henry gritted out, pointedly not looking at the wizard. It surrounds both the Dark Court and the Cove Court, Sansu elaborated. The Cove Court is basically a hostage of the Dark Court. Then how the hell do you think you're going to get through it, Al? Jax looked at me, a million questions in his eyes. Oh, not just me, I said. I'll be taking an army. Elise is a princess, and my aunt is still wanted for her crimes. I need to figure out how to get through, which is where the Crystal Court comes in. You do know that they won't give you something for nothing, right? Hallid spoke up. If you truly wish to bargain with the Crystal Court, you best have something they want. I have gold. The coffers of Wonderland were apparently full of it. Though I had meant to spend most of it on renovating the city, I was willing to set aside a sizable portion for this. Elise mattered. Catching a tyrant mattered. That might be enough, Hallid considered, though he didn't look convinced. They also might request a favor. My face fell. A favor? I wasn't sure what Hallid knew about my past, but I excelled at one thing. Killing. And with the exception of Celia White, who was being executed by committee, I didn't want to do that again. Thought I'd walked away from it. I guess I have to be prepared for what they may want and willing to negotiate. But that brings me to my next point. I stood and leaned over the map, pointing to the Riverlands. I spoke with Queen Aquatia. She is allowing us to enter the rift through her territory. But since not all of us can go to the Crystal Court, I need some to stay behind and ready an army. I'm with you, Henry said, and my insides warmed. Us too, Dean Dum shouted. As I couldn't see how they'd be any help in organizing an army, but knew them to be charming buggers, I wanted them with me. For sure. If you wish, Hallid began, I will assist your army and bring my own. You will be traveling through my lands after all. My heart warmed. Hallid was really staying true to his offer of friendship. I wouldn't forget it. I'll assist with the army too, Sansu said. Wherever you think I'll be best, that's where I'll go, Alron put in. So far, it was me, Henry, and the Pixies journeying to the Crystal Court. Alron was a burly elf, and having a bit more muscle as backup never hurt, but I had a feeling that coming with a smaller entourage would be better, less threatening. Plus, Sansu and Hallid would need assistance to prepare an army so quickly, especially one that had not had to leave Wonderland for years. 
Help Sanzu move the army to the Riverlands, I told Alron. We'll meet you there once we're done at the Crystal Court, a week at most. As you wish, Princess Alice. And of course, I'm with you too, Al. How Jax even thought this had anything to do with him was a testament to how self-centered he could be. Yeah, no, you're staying here. Remember our deal? Plus, I saved your tits. He winked. Out of everyone here, I'm clearly the best bodyguard. And someone who does not belong in this world. Hatter growled. I chewed on my bottom lip. Jax annoyed me because we had a past. But while I could understand Henry feeling uneasy over the wizard, he seemed to dislike him more than I thought was reasonable. We'd need to talk about that. Which, to be fair, might work to your benefit, Hallett said of Hatter's point. The Crystal Court likes novelty, or so I hear. I suppose it makes sense. None of the royals have ever left the island. Bringing a sort of show horse in the form of a wizard could work in your favor. I'm no show horse, Jack shot back. But I'm willing to act as a distraction, for Alice. Okay, I sighed. You can come. If Hallett thought it was smart, I'd put aside my reservations. Plus, I didn't want Jax hanging around even longer because I'd gone back on my word. Sanzu, can you get working on the army stuff? Ask any soldiers or rebels if they want to join the cause. Alron, can you get me gold and gems before helping Sanzu? And take Hallett. The prince arched an eyebrow. Is this because of how I dress? He did resemble a peacock a bit but in a surprisingly manly way. I liked it, though that wasn't why I'd chosen him. You're more likely to know what sort of priceless baubles a royal would want. How many people are in the royal family anyway? Last I heard, there was the king and queen, and their adult children, three princesses and one prince. He shrugged. That could have changed. The queen and king still live, so there might be younger children now. And who rules? Have the king and queen handed over the crown? I can't say for certain. This is going to be interesting. I considered our options, and one more name came to mind. Do you think we should bring Chester, my Cheshire cat? Henry's eyebrows pulled together. You can't. Cheshire cats are bound to Wonderland Island. It's why they exist here, but nowhere else in Fairy. Oh. My stomach sank. I'd been hoping to bring Chester along. No doubt he would have been handy. Then again, he could be an asset here, too. After all, when I returned, I'd need a trusted source to tell me what had happened in my absence. That settles that, then. The rest of us? I straightened my shoulders. Let's get changed and pack whatever we might need for a few days. Once I get that gold and the griffins have been readied, we're leaving. I stepped into the musty-smelling stables to find I'd beaten Henry, Jax, and the Pixies there, but Hallett had arrived before me. He stood next to a winged unicorn so white and glittering, it looked like it had rolled around in freshly fallen snow. Aren't you supposed to be helping Alron? You trying to sneak into our group? I teased, approaching the prince and the mythical creature slowly. If there was anything I'd learned so far in Wonderland— it was that no matter how beautiful or serene in appearance, anything could be deadly. The elf has it handled. He'll be here shortly with bags of gold and gems for you to take to your negotiations. But there is another matter I consider important to your mission. What's that? Ensuring your stable hands know what to have you ride. You mentioned griffins, and that won't do. Why not? I'd reached them now and set down my bag filled with clothes and a few choice daggers. As I suspected, Hallett laughed. You need royal etiquette lessons. Probably for years, I snorted. But seriously, why not griffins? He and his mother had ridden a griffin here. The creatures were dependable and built for flying long distances. The court you're arriving at is quite stuck in the past, which is saying a lot because we're here and not in the human world. Things move slowly in fairy. I can't be certain, but I believe they'll see it as an affront. If a royal arrives on a griffin, it's as though your visit is not worth the best Wonderland can offer their court. 
so you will be riding this beauty. A thrill ran through me as I looked over the winged unicorn. What's her name? Valia. Lovely. Can I pet her? Hallett laughed. She's yours. Oh, right. Technically, everything in this castle was, and that still weirded me out. Slowly, I extended my hand, and Valia didn't balk when my palm landed on her neck. Beneath my fingers, her coat was pure velvet, so soft and warm. Hey there, pretty, I whispered. I guess you and I are in for a long journey. Thankfully, she will keep up easily with the griffins your friends will be riding. And that's another thing. Hallid cleared his throat. You'll all have to take a rest tonight. But I want to be there in the morning. I figured as much, but that would be poor form too. Try to arrive around midday. It's traditional. I huffed. Fine. There are smaller uninhabited islands on the way. You can camp on one of those. By my calculations, you should fly over a grouping of them before the sun sets. I'd noticed them on the map and had procured a paper copy for the journey, so I nodded. I had a good sense of direction, and Jax was actually amazing at that too. At least, he had been in our world. I hoped the skill would translate to another realm, because I couldn't count on anyone here to know the way. They'd been kept locked up for far too long. Valia seems to be taking well to you, Hallett said with a smile, stepping back. I suppose I should get on with my duties. Raising an army takes time. We'll see you in the Riverlands within the week. He waved and had gone no more than three steps when I twisted. Hey, Hallett. Yes? Thanks for this. I know this isn't your fight, but I appreciate the help. The rift is on my court's land, and we are allies. I will do what I can to assist. He cocked his head and the sound of high-pitched voices met my ears. The pixies were on their way. I believe you will be leaving soon. Fly safe, Alice. I had only a minute of peace before the pixies zoomed in with Henry. We're all packed! Dumb sing-songed, pulling a small blue trunk behind her. How it was even a loft was beyond me. The thing had to be nearly as large as Dumb herself. Do we each get one of those to ride? Dee beamed, leading her own trunk, which was similar to her sister's, but red. Uh, I doubt you'll be riding alone, I said. Then, because I couldn't resist, I added, Unless there's a large fly around here somewhere. Predictably, the girl scowled at my joke, but Hatter's lips pulled up in a smile. My heart warmed. Things had been so strained with us since Jax's arrival. I wanted it to be back to normal. But is that smart? You're leaving, the voice in my head reminded me. And not for the first time, I questioned myself. Could I really do this? Leave my friends and soon my sister? All I knew was I didn't want the crown and everything that came with it. I wasn't built for caring for so many, for leading others. We're going to see if there's something for us to ride, Dee said haughtily. I don't know if I want to sit with such a sarcastic person for such a long flight, even if you do get the most beautiful creature. They flew off and I snorted a laugh. I hadn't known my comment would put them in such a tizzy. They're definitely riding with one of us. Hatter said as he approached, staring at the winged unicorn. Hallett told us you'd be on an alicorn. Her name is Valia. Slowly I stroked her neck. I didn't know that's what her kind was called. She's beautiful. Not as beautiful as you. I broke from worshipping Valia, and suddenly, nothing else in the world existed. Only Henry, his emerald eyes, his beautiful soul. That smile that had so often captivated my attention. The air even changed, became charged, and certainly warmer. Boy, do I have it bad. Alice. Henry cleared his throat. I want to say that I'm so... We ready to get this show on the road? Jax's voice cut through the tender, soft moment, setting my teeth on edge. How does he do it? Ignoring Jax, I grabbed Henry's hand. I wanted a little healing between us. Don't worry about it. I... He's a lot. 
You don't say. Hatter grunted as, at that exact moment, an arm flung over my shoulder, causing Valia to shuffle back a few paces. Henry looked like he wanted to punch Jax's lights out, but the wizard leaned into me like we were the best of friends, like he belonged. You scared my ride, I chastised my ex, shimmying out of his grasp. Yeah, that's a sweet horse. Pretty. Valia stomped on the ground violently, and because he wasn't a total idiot, Jax backed up. I thanked the gods I hadn't called her a pegasus or a unicorn. Clearly, Valia understood English and wanted to be recognized for what she was. She's obviously not a horse. She's an alicorn. I scoffed, as if I'd known the term all along. Hatter's lips pulled up and I winked at him, acknowledging our inside joke. What are we riding? Jax asked. We're taking griffins! Dumb piped up, soaring back our way, her arms crossed over her chest. Alice and Hatter are, that is. The stable master is sizest. He won't give Dee and me our own. Uh... Whether from the pixie's dilemma or the idea of riding a griffin, for once, Jax was speechless. As it turned out, he didn't have to worry about responding, because at that moment, Alron strode into the stables with two soldiers, each carrying two bags weighed down with treasure. This should be enough, Alron said. There are some very valuable gemstones in there, and enough gold to set up numerous families for life. We'll have to tie three bags to a separate griffin, though. They're heavy. Will the one without a rider fly with the rest of the flock? It won't veer off? I asked. The stable master appeared a short distance away. I wasn't sure how long he'd been there, nor did I really care. We hadn't said anything that the Fae of Wonderland shouldn't know. It's called a drift, Princess Alice, not a flock, he corrected. And the royal griffins are trained to remain together during flight. Perfect, let's get the pat griffin weighed down with golden gems, I said, ready to move. Then we can saddle up and hit the skies. Chapter 7 My inner thighs ached, and my cheeks stung from the ever-present wind whipping across my face. Hoping to spot land soon, I craned around Valia's thick neck. We'd been flying for hours, and the sun was officially setting. Prince Hallad had mentioned we'd reach a smattering of small islands to camp on by sunset, and before leaving Wonderland, I'd calculated the same. In flight, I checked the map, too. Twice. We should be coming across them at any moment. So where the hell were they? The ocean stretched on and on and on, blue and vast, as if nothing else existed this far away from Wonderland Island. We should be seeing land, no? Jax yelled from the back of his griffin, his blonde curls flying every which way. Any moment now, Henry yelled back. Dee craned her head over his thigh and shot me a gleeful thumbs up. Alice has led us true. Something is off, though. Any ideas? I called out, eyes stinging from another strong, salty gale. From where she perched in front of me, Dumb tipped her head back to get my attention. What's up? I asked. I think they're hidden by magic! My lips parted with surprise. But why? The Crystal Court doesn't want visitors, and they know most people who come anyway will have to stop, at least to let their mounts rest. Dum patted Valia's heaving neck. She was right. For the last hour or so, my alicorn had become increasingly tired. We really needed to land so she and the griffins could take a breather. That's devious of them, I muttered. It's something your aunt would have done, Dum replied. But the fact was, she hadn't, and Sela was aether-blessed, capable of performing pretty amazing feats of magic. That led me to believe she couldn't hide an island as big as Wonderland, which meant the Crystal Court not only had magic gemstones, but powers the likes of which I had not yet seen. Will Crystal Island be hidden too? I groaned, but didn't want to get off track, so instead of wallowing, I called to the others— Dumb thinks the island might be hidden with magic. That... that's a valid idea. Hatter agreed with the pixie, 
sounding surprised he hadn't considered it. How will we find it then? Jax asked. Is it hidden by Aether? Let me try with my earth magic, Henry replied. He slowed to hover in the air, and Jax and I followed suit. Magic sprayed from Hatter's palms and floated down to the water. It struck the surface and spun lower, green swirls in the blue-gray of the water, radiating outward. Hatter's best elements were earth and water, directly in opposition to my fire and air. If anyone could find solid ground, it was Henry. An instant later, he had an answer for us. I sense land below. It can't be too far if I can feel it, but someone has hidden the islands we're seeking. Maybe I can use my aether to find it, I said. Dumb, take the reins. I handed her the straps, then rubbed my freezing hands together to warm them before pressing them out in front of me. Reveal what's hidden from sight, I willed, hoping that would be enough. I had learned to wield Aether with instinct, and after my lesson with Queen Aquatia, was feeling more confident with my relatively new magic. But there was still a lot I didn't know, and many feats that seemed too big for me. Would this be one of them? My shimmering white magic soared downward in a beam of light toward the churning waters. My magic raced over the sea, clinging to the waves and the spray. I held my breath, watching, waiting. Will it know which way to go? Suddenly, the aether power stopped and began to expand, revealing land inch by inch. In moments, an island appeared where water had just been. By the old gods, I murmured. Told you, they're crazy, Dum said, clearly proud she had been right. Crazy and very, very powerful. Let's discuss this on the ground. My aether had broken the shield of magic, and as such, the barrier was disintegrating. I'd uncovered a beach, part of a jungle, and more was coming. But I couldn't be sure how long it would last. Additionally, I didn't want to risk whatever magic the Crystal Court had used to cover up the island overtaking my power and disappearing again. Surely once we were on land, we'd continue to see it. At least, I hoped so. Together, our group directed our mounts toward the land— with each beat of their wings and push of magic, more geography was uncovered, another curve of the island. We touched down on sand, bones jostling with the impact. I need to use the woods! Dumb leapt off the saddle, soaring away on buzzing wings. Don't go too far! I yelled as Dee leapt from Hatter's Mount and followed her sister into the jungle off the beach. At first glance, this island appeared tropical, so unlike Wonderland's temperate climate. It was definitely warmer, too, by at least ten degrees. I think my legs are actually asleep, I moaned as I slipped off of Valia's back to stand on wet sand. Same, Al. Oh, that was rough. Jax rubbed at his thighs, and I had to admit that he'd probably had it worse. The griffins were wider than Valia. Hatter was the only one who looked unaffected by the ride. As if he realized the same thing, he waved to Jax and me. Walk a little. I'll take care of the supplies. You sure? Absolutely. Thanks, Henry. I smiled and began to walk down the beach. That was wild, wasn't it, Al? Jax ran up to me, his gait awkward after our journey. Hiding a whole island is some serious magic. Yeah, but I don't think it's too large. I stared down the beach, both trying to get a sense of the size and to avoid looking at him. Still, I couldn't do it. Aether blessed fae are a different breed. I was fully aware I was talking about myself now, though I didn't feel that way. Honestly, I think this court will be stronger than other fae know. Jax turned to me. How does it feel? To be Aether-blessed. His tone was genuine, full of curiosity. It must have come as a big surprise to him to learn I could wield Aether. When we dated, I thought I was demi fay, not a full fay of royal blood. It's challenging to use, but also kind of natural now, I replied slowly. But at first, I didn't believe Henry about what I could do. He knew who I was, though. What I was. How was your power hidden? 
By trauma? I admitted. I guess it had kind of buried itself inside me. Now I feel more whole. Do you feel like you belong here? He stopped, and I was compelled to do the same. His amber eyes studied me like he was trying to work out what I'd say, who I was now. I wasn't even sure I knew the answer to the latter. Faintly, I became aware that my legs had regained full sensation, my feet too. I dug my toes into the sand and took a deep breath of fairy air. A week ago, I would have answered the question of belonging with a resounding no, but with each passing day, I became less sure of my convictions. I didn't totally fit in here, but I also didn't feel as if I'd fit in back home either. Kind of, I said instead. I'm getting used to it, but I still plan on returning to the human world. Jax nodded slowly. Can I tell you something? Uh, sure. I think you do belong here, Al. He exhaled. Not with that guy, but here, in this world. I snorted. That guy, as in Henry? Obviously. I came here for you, and I'm happy I did. But it's easy to see you're super comfortable here. He paused. So, if we can fix things, I'm down to stay. Oh, right. I was actually supposed to be giving him a chance. In that case... You know how shattered I was when you left, right? A huff escaped my lips. I felt broken, but didn't even get the chance to process it in a healthy way, cause Doru. Jax cringed. He didn't give you any time? Not a single day. I was on a mission the afternoon after you left. He swallowed. I had to leave. Couldn't risk staying when I hit 18. His threats were real. Still, did you have to leave in the middle of the night? You couldn't wait until morning to pay off the vampire and say something to me then? My ex looked away, and something in his expression made the skin on the back of my neck tighten. Jax, you did pay the rest of what you owed Doru, right? How could I? He retorted. He wanted me gone right away so as not to distract you, and I wasn't messing with that. I seriously didn't have time to even gather funds, and it's not like I had credit or anything at that point. I just ran. Oh. My. God. You didn't pay him? My heart rate accelerated at the idea, even though I'd done the exact same thing. The difference was I'd told Xavier to his face that he wasn't getting the money, that he owed me for keeping my past a secret, and shockingly, he'd agreed. Jax could claim none of those things. He could have hunters after you right now, I spit out. That's why I think staying here is a good idea, Jax admitted. I gaped. Are you telling me that's why you came? You thought you'd be safe in another realm? No, I mean, it was part of it, but I really did come for you, Al. His gaze met mine, revealing so many things in the depths of his eyes. Shame, sadness, but also truth. We were so messed up, the pair of us. Maybe we really were meant to be together. My stomach tightened. Down the beach, Valia neighed, breaking my connection to Jax. I turned and saw Hatter pulling the saddle off of her, his shoulders so bunched and his attention so pointed on the alicorn that he had to be fighting his urge to watch Jax and me. His presence washed over me, calming, though he wasn't even looking at me. I took a deep breath and let the air clear the fog in my mind. Jax might be here, and yes, we had a past, but Henry was the person I wanted. I just had to come to terms with the fact that having him meant I'd have to make a choice. Fairy, or my old world. The fire crackled, and the waves crashed on the shore. We'd finished a dinner of sandwiches and apples, and darkness was beginning to settle on the island. Though we hadn't been here long, we'd already done a sweep of the beach. The island was deserted, save for a few animals, evident by the droppings we'd found. However, no one had gone too far into the jungle. Why would we? 
We only needed to ensure the beach was safe and create a spot to sleep. The latter was my job. As an Aether-blessed fae, I could, theoretically, create a sort of shield around us. Between that and the blankets we'd brought, I was sure everyone would crash quickly. Then we'd be up at first light and continue flying south. Dee lifted into the air, a yawn parting her lips as she stretched her thin arms wide. I'm pooped. Me too, sis. Dumb looked at me. Can you make the sleeping area now? Sure. I rose and walked to where the jungle met the beach, as far away from the water as we could get. In my world, the worst thing that could happen was the tide would roll in and we'd get wet. But here? Memories of the Calling of Creatures trial came rushing back. If a queen kraken could pull herself out of the water, I was sure any number of other dangerous beasts could do the same. Considering that possibility, we'd all rather have some space between us and the beings of the deep. Jax used a spell to cut three enormous leaves from the jungle trees. They were so large, even Hatter, the tallest in our group, could lie down on one. It wasn't a mattress. Hell, it wasn't even a sleeping pad. But it would keep the sand out of our cracks and crevices. Everyone good with right here? I asked, approaching where the leaves had been set out so the remaining condensation could dry. The guys were tending to the animals, preparing them for rest. The bags of gold and gems were set between the beasts, a deterrent if there were any fae on this island. The animals would warn us of thievery. At my question, both men nodded gruffly. Apparently, rather than go at each other's throats, they decided to ignore one another— that was better for me, though, so I turned to the girls. It's perfect, Dum said, pulling a smaller leaf from a nearby tree and rolling it up into a pillow. Can we sleep on yours with you, Alice? Of course, there's room for three. Well, when two of those people are four inches high. But don't hog the middle or I'll have to wake you when I come to bed, I warned. Got your blankets? Dee had been wrestling with something in her trunk. At that moment, she pulled out two wool blankets about the size of cloth napkins and soared over with the bedding clutched in her hands. Here! The pixies settled in, and I began working my protection magic, just how Aquatia had taught me. I'd never had a need for that skill before now. My aether magic had come on so fast and mostly been used to battle my aunt— it felt good to use it for keeping those I cared for safe. The shimmering white magic appeared as a dome, a basic shield I'd seen witches in my world make. I figured, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The dome settled into the sand, undulating for a moment before solidifying. Will we be able to get out and go tinkle? Dee asked. Good point. These will allow you to pass. With a flourish of my hand, aether badges in the shape of a rose appeared, pinned to their dresses. Two others soared to the guys. I knew when they landed because both men exclaimed their shock. Some notice next time, Al! Oh, you're fine, Jax. I huffed, but couldn't resist a smile. Night, girls, I'll join you soon. Night, Alice! Both pixies chimed. I turned back toward the sea and found Hatter standing a few feet away, waiting. Care for an evening stroll? Sounds great, I said, smiling. Who could say no to some privacy on a secluded beach at night? Well, not so secluded, I amended as Jax caught my eye. He looked put out, but he'd have to deal. I hadn't asked for him to return to my life, and in recent days... Hatter and I had barely had any alone time. We're going on a walk, I announced. We'll be back soon. Stay in sight, Jack said, his lips downturned in annoyance. If I was being charitable, I'd say the request was for safety, but I was certain that wasn't the case. Still, I'd pretend like it was. We'll be fine. Can you put the fire out? Jack snorted, but set to the task, clearly recognizing there would be no telling me what to do. Henry did not bother to hide his smirk as we made our way down the beach, away from camp. Once we were far enough away not to be overheard, I turned to him. Thanks for being so cool about everything. 
Jax, mostly. He's a pain in the ass. But the more I think about it, the more I have to admit he will probably be useful in the Crystal Court. The wizard was a charmer after all. Perhaps he could sweet-talk the royals into giving us what we needed, and in record time. If not, I hoped the gold and gems we'd brought would do the trick. If anything, having varied magics is useful. Hatter grumbled. And they won't expect someone from the human realm. Honestly, I think you need him here. Why? To make your choice. Which do you mean? I kicked sand, unsure about this conversation. Me or him? Wonderland or your homeland? My gut clenched. I was certain I was falling in love with Hatter. But the last question made committing scary, like I was turning my back on my own dreams. You're who I want, I said. But Jax won't let me go until I've given him a shot. Believe me, he's tenacious like that. I have no doubt. The man finagled his way into another realm for you. I pursed my lips and kicked at the sand. Why do you want to go home so badly anyway? Hatter asked. What's calling you back? In truth, no one and nothing. Just the world I'd grown up in, and the chance to actually choose who I was. Because here, I'd always be Alice White, Princess, or Queen of Wonderland. I, I'm not sure you'd understand, but I've never been able to be anything but Alice the Dagger. I stared out at the waves, hating discussing my assassination days with Hatter. He was so good, so noble. And here, I'd always be Alice White. Now that I no longer work with Doru, when I went back to my world, I can be whatever I want. He stopped walking, so I did too. Slowly, we both turned to face the sea. Waves crept up the shore, coming within a few paces of our feet, and the water sparkled like diamonds in the moonlight. I do understand, he murmured. Though I admit I'd never thought about it like that. Considering how you arrived in Wonderland, that was short-sighted of me. I apologize. There's no need. I paused. To be honest... I wouldn't mind staying here if I had more choices. But so far, my time here has been targeted. First, my objective was to kill the Red Queen. Now it's to find her and kill her, and rescue my sister, too. After that, I want to get to know Elise. Silence wafted between us, as soft and welcoming as the sounds of the ocean. It struck me that this was one of the first times since I'd entered this realm that I felt still. Calm. With Henry next to me, it made the moment all the more special. I yearned to touch him, to lean into him and let go just a little, to feel his skin next to mine. As if he sensed my want, his fingers fluttered against my palm on their way to intertwining with my own. My breath hitched, and slowly I turned to find Henry watching me intently, his face ringed in moonlight an entire sky of stars twinkling behind him. I swallowed, inching closer. Alice? He whispered as I placed my palm on his chest. Yeah? I want you to know, if you choose to stay, that would make me really happy. Tears stung my eyes. Henry was the best man I'd ever known, a fact that he'd proven time and time again, did I want him? Hell yes. Did I deserve him? I wasn't so sure. But I'd always been one to take what I wanted, so I leaned closer. He didn't pull back when my lips met his, soft and warm. He didn't stiffen or say that we should stop. Instead, a large hand wound around my back, pulling me closer. And then there was just us, Alice and Henry, our lips exploring, our hands wandering across muscle-hardened planes and soft curves, our hearts beating. For a moment, we were everything and all that there was. Two people, finally taking what we wanted, beneath a riot of stars. Chapter 8 We made our way back to camp. My cheeks flushed, 
and happiness gushing through me. Not that Hatter and I had finalized anything. What I'd do later was still something I had to consider. But a kiss like the one we'd shared was enough to turn around even the worst days. I'd treasure it forever. What I would not treasure, however, was the scowl on Jax's face as we got closer. Had he been watching us? Seen us kissing? Took you two long enough, he grumbled. You didn't have to wait up, I retorted. We're all adults here. Sure, whatever, Al. Jax rose from where he sat on the beach. I'm going to bed. At the mention of bed, even if it was an oversized leaf, my bones melted. Same, I'm beat. Henry came with, all three of us slipping beneath the protection I'd created. The pixies were already fast asleep, Dee snoring loudly and Dumb muttering something about a flying tortoise. I smirked, already planning on teasing them tomorrow. They both thought they were dainty sleepers, but they absolutely were not. At least they left me some space. I scooted onto the leaf, careful not to jostle the twins, and got settled. Once I was comfortable, I glanced at Hatter. He winked, and the thrill of our kiss struck me again, as if we were locking lips at that very second. Butterflies filled my stomach. Night, Jack said, annoyance lacing his tone. Night, guys, I sang to let Jax know I didn't care about his feelings on matters pertaining to Henry and me. Whoever wakes first has to get the rest of us up. We fell quiet, and soon the only sounds in my ears were that of the ocean. The waves lapping the beach relaxed me, and my body grew heavy. Knowing it was coming, I anticipated sleep claiming me. And then, a distant sound made me sit straight back up. Is that... wings? But it's so loud. I glanced up at the sky and saw nothing, waited for a creature to appear. Perhaps the Jabberwocky? A chill gripped my spine. Would my aunt actually follow me when she could remain safe in enemy lands? Yes, 100% she would. And I didn't think for a second the shield I'd placed over us would hold up to a dragon. I made to stand, to try and determine what the hell was actually happening, when the trees behind us leaned, no, nearly bent in half, with a gust of wind. All my breath left me in one go as what had nearly toppled the jungle trees came into sight— a bird as big as a house, and another one just behind it, smaller, likely a baby, although it was still the size of a sedan, not exactly tiny. Both creatures had silver feathers tipped with black. Talons that had to be at least five feet long glinted as the older bird flexed them. I'd studied these beasts before the calling of creatures trial. They were rocks, giant birds capable of carrying large loads. I unleashed a stream of curses as the birds soared toward the griffins, the larger plucking up one of our sleeping rides as if he were nothing more than a piece of popcorn. The baby went in for a kill too, but it didn't scoop up another griffin or my alicorn. No, it wasn't large enough to manage those creatures, so the youngling went for the bags of gold we'd brought, gripping all six in its talons. Coins spilled out, hitting the sand and glinting gold in the moonlight. My heart began to hammer, Wake up, guys, wake up! Henry and Jax rose immediately, shooting to their feet in time to hear the stolen griffins' cries for help and witness the other griffins take flight and Valia gallop down the beach to safety. The pixies were only a second behind the men, shouts of astonishment leaving the twins' lips as they woke from slumber. What the hell is that? Jax hissed. Rock, a giant bird. Obviously. It can lift an elephant. I elaborated. And... The larger rock stole the words from my mouth as its talon squeezed its prey so hard the griffin stopped screaming for help, stopped living. The bird had literally squeezed it to death. The rock then dropped the griffin and surged upward, preparing to hunt another one of our mounts. They're going for more! I yelled. We can't let them! If we didn't have enough creatures to transport us, we'd have to fly to the Crystal Court on our own steam. 
Considering the distance, I wasn't even sure that was possible, especially when we took into account that Henry and I would have to trade off carrying jacks. We have to stop the big one, Henry said. The small baby won't be able to lift any of the griffins or Valia. If it could, it would have done so already. Don't hurt it, though, I said. Since arriving in Fairy, I'd had to injure the Bandersnatch herd and kill a Queen Kraken. I hated hurting animals, and still had remorse about both. Just make them leave. What can we do to help? Dee shouted, her eyes wide. Honestly, I wasn't sure. This bird was enormous, but the twins were so small. Would it even be able to clutch them in its talons? Could they actually do something to help? No, stay here, stay safe, I urged, not wanting to risk. They might evade the talons, but what if the rock snapped their beaks at the twins? It would be game over. Out of the birds' reach. Henry Jackson and I left the cover of our shield, and the moment we did, the birds' attention snapped to us. I hadn't made us invisible, so clearly they simply hadn't seen us before. Our positioning up against the trees must have worked to hide the group. Too bad I hadn't made sure our mounts were in the same area. Racing toward the birds, the adult screeched at the baby, which lifted higher into the air to protect itself. Two of us could have flown to follow it, but really, the larger one was the bigger threat. The adult that was now launching toward us, talons extended. Jax, shield us! I yelled, knowing he was talented in this magical act. A bubble surrounded us, and the rock crashed into it. Beneath the weight of the bird, the shield shuddered violently. Jax grunted, strengthening it on the go, and his magic held strong. On my word, drop it. I have air. I instructed Jax and informed Hatter. Water. Hatter called back, and where the waves lapped the sand, I spotted tendrils of water begin to lift and swirl. I had no idea what he planned to do with them, but knowing Henry, he had something brilliant up his sleeve. The bird rose into the air again, clearly intending to dive at us. The moment it was high enough to achieve maximum impact, it plummeted. Hold strong, Jax, I urged. Got it, he gritted out. The rock slammed into the shield a second time, and the barrier actually cracked, but Jax was true to his word. Green flecks of magic lit up as he worked them to make the ward stronger. This pissed off the bird, who beat its beak against the dome of magic surrounding us, pounding into the shield again and again and again until blood speckled both our protection and its own feathers. Finally, it reared its head back, fury in its yellow eyes. The moment had come. When it leaves to dive bomb again, that's when we'll attack. Use its momentum to send it into the water. The smaller one was circling out over the sea, near where it had dropped our golden gems. It occurred to me that maybe if we got the adult that far out, the baby would call its parent and the larger one would leave us be. As I expected, the rock beat its wings, soaring backward. Now! I commanded. Shield down! Jack shouted back. Henry and I struck, me with wind and him with water. The bird hadn't been expecting the assault, and it spun backward toward the wide open ocean. With some space between us, I had another idea that would probably ensure it forgot all about us. Conjuring. I created a spectacle once. I can do it again. I called on my aether magic and visualized the Jabberwocky in the air, flying toward the baby rock. Once that image was clear in my head, I pushed my magic outward. It soared toward the young one, forming as it went. And when it coalesced into the shape I needed, and the rock took notice, I pumped my fist into the air. The larger bird wheeled, going after the dragon with admirable bravery. But I couldn't let it get too close. If it tried to sink its talons into the dragon's hide and found only air, it would know the threat was fake. Once that happened, it would probably return for us. I needed the adult rock to believe in the danger so thoroughly that it left the island— so I steered the conjuring toward the baby, mouth wide and teeth bared, though no sound came out. If I could create sounds with Aether, I hadn't learned how to yet. Thankfully, the small one fell for the illusion, screeching and flapping frantically farther out to sea. Its parent laid chase, but my creation was faster, and I allowed the Jabberwocky to get close enough that, if it were real, 
it would have bitten the youngling. At the last second, the baby swooped upward, and I didn't move as fast, continuing my jabberwocky straight trajectory. The parent, too, veered up, loud shrieks of indignation bursting from its beak as it collected its young one, shielding it. Knowing this was my chance, I twisted the conjuring in the air and again bared its teeth. The rock hovered in the air, appearing to be deciding if retaliation was worth it. A soft keening from the young one sealed its choice, and the larger bird changed direction, flying away from the dragon, away from the island. I waited until we could no longer spot the glimmer of silver feathers in the moonlight to release my breath and the magic. Immediately, my shoulders sagged. Fear had boosted me through that event. As a result, I hadn't realized how much effort it had taken to create such an elaborate work of magic. Now that I had a moment to relax, I gulped down air, relishing the full breaths. I felt so drained, as if I'd swam all the way back to Wonderland Island. Hell, that was awesome, Jax whispered, his tone slightly shaky. I've never seen you do that. Aether magic, I answered wearily. I'm still learning, and that conjuring was pretty big. Now I'm dead. We all could have been really dead, though, Henry said. That mother was out for blood. I wonder if this is her home. How do you know it was female? I asked. The fathers don't stick around, but the mothers are fiercely protective of their young in their land. I swallowed. Do you think the threat of a jabberwocky will keep her away, at least for the night? Hatter let out a soft hum. It probably will, but we should take turns keeping guard in case she comes back. After we get the griffins and Valia, I sighed, scanning the beach. I spotted the griffins first. They'd landed right by Valia, who gleamed white against the night. Each creature was careful to maintain a fair distance. She'd run away at the first hint of trouble and neither rock had chased her, so I was sure she was fine. We can try to coax the alicorn back for you? Dee suggested. That'd be great, I said. I was still breathing so hard. I'll approach the griffins, but what about the gold? Jax frowned. Don't you need it? I did. It was our best chance of bartering with the crystal court. Do you think we could find it all? I asked, though I was certain it had been scattered. I'd seen the coins flutter from the bag, likely ripped by the young rock's talons. Hatter, can you use your water magic to search for the treasure? I'll try, he said. As he'd offered, Jax went to try to bring the griffins back. I hoped they didn't take flight when he approached, because if they did, he was screwed. But I decided to let him deal with that while I stayed to watch Hatter. Henry walked to the ocean's edge and knelt, dipping his hand in the waves. Though I couldn't see his face, I imagined he closed his eyes to sense. I willed him to feel the money, hoping it hadn't been scattered to the corners of the sea. But Hatter's shoulders sagged as he rose. I deflated, sure that we were well and truly screwed. He turned back to me, shaking his head. I can't feel any metal or gemstones, just normal minerals in the soil and plants, some of the gold might wash up, though. I sighed. Even if a few coins or gems did wash ashore by morning, it wouldn't be enough leverage. So what now? Did we turn around, return to Wonderland for more treasure, then start the journey again? Was it possible to bargain with just my magic? No one knew exactly what powers were prominent in the Crystal Court. It had been so long since someone had been there— or maybe the promise of an alliance would do? We were, after all, the closest thing they had to neighbors. I tilted my chin to the sky, begging it for answers to questions that would probably keep me up the rest of the night. Chapter 9 After a terrible night's sleep and some deliberation, the next morning, my friends, Jax, and I searched the beach for any treasure that may have washed up in the hour since the excitement. I was surprised to find a few coins and one enormous diamond. We pocketed them, but they wouldn't be enough to barter with. Still, no one wanted to turn around, so we continued on. In this matter, time was of the essence. 
I needed to infiltrate the dark court before my aunt thought to move Elise elsewhere. So we flew. And as we flew, I thought about how to convince the royals of the Crystal Court to help us, about my kiss with Henry, about the battle to come after we secured a way through the rift. And I thought about how, perhaps most shockingly, Jax, Henry, and I had worked together the night before to get the rocks to leave the island. And this morning, the men in my life had barely been at one another's throats. Progress. Is that land? Flying at my left, Jack shielded his eyes from the brilliant sun and squinted into the distance. I leaned over Valia's neck. She'd been skittish all morning, and I was willing to bet the giant diamond in my saddlebag that she hadn't slept well either. For my mount's sake, I hoped we were getting close to our destination. She needed a plush stable and some rest. That has to be it, Hatter said from his place on the right. The large structure on the cliffside looks almost like a castle. That is a castle, I exclaimed, taking in the man-sized crystals glinting atop the spires and the gorgeous stained glass in the windows. The castle was every color of the rainbow, and though that design risked looking gaudy, it did not. It was fabulous, like a basket of gems gleaming in the sun. Doesn't look like any palace I've seen, Jax yelled into the wind. Which is how many? Two? Henry countered. We have castles in the human world, I snorted. But for reals, Jax, you haven't seen that many. You don't know what I've been doing these last few months, he retorted. The moment he said it, his face fell slightly, but I didn't comment. He was right. I had no idea, because he'd up and left me. I wasn't going to pry and make him think I cared. I had cared way too much after he left, but I'd had to move on, to save myself. Of course, that didn't mean I had to make him feel better about his actions. Let him stew. How should we approach? Henry asked. This was not a matter I'd considered. Having never traveled to another court, I had no personal experience of such protocol, except for Hallett and his mother visiting me. And they'd just flown up, seemingly with an idea about where to land, which I didn't have. Are landing pads generally kept in certain areas of a castle? Henry shrugged, and I was reminded that this was his first trip off Wonderland Island. We were all totally clueless. Maybe we can spot it when we get close? Jack suggested. Yeah, sounds good. Hell, it sounded like our only option. Let's veer right. The guys followed my lead, and soon we were close enough to the island to make out the features of individual fae. A few spotted us and pointed, but as far as I could tell... They were civilians, dressed in loose pants, tunics, or in the case of females, dresses. They were not soldiers. I wanted to land quickly before any armed fay could approach and potentially tell us to leave. Of course, I'd pull the royal card if I had to, but as I was a new princess, I didn't know how much weight that carried. Did people in this court know about the events in others? Would they take me at my word? Would they care about royalty that was not their own? In the human world, I was an American, and I never thought about monarchies, not unless I had to attend a high society event for a job, which was rare. I really wished we still had our gold. That would probably make things easier. There's a clear spot. Hatter pointed. Close to the palace, too. Perfect. Go there. We landed as one, with me in the middle of our small cluster. As soon as we touched down, the guys dismounted and surveyed the area. When no threat leapt out at us, Henry came to me, hand extended. If you want them to believe us, he began. It's time to start acting like a real princess. From now on, we're not only your friends, but your guards. I have to keep my hands off you? I teased softly. Preferably not, he rumbled. But in public places? Perhaps that's a good idea. An excellent one, Jax ground out. Shut up, Jax, I muttered. A chastising along the lines of, what I do with Henry is none of your business, was on the tip of my tongue, when a number of fae ran up to us, armed with staffs topped with brilliant amethyst gems. Staring down multiple threatening crystal-tipped weapons, I eyed Hatter sidelong. Uh, 
Are those for magic? I guess so. They're pretty, but weird, Dee added softly. I agreed. I also didn't want to take any risks regarding unknown weapons. So we didn't get blasted back to Wonderland Island, I held my hands up. We come in peace. I'm Princess Alice White of the Wonderland Court, here to speak with your leaders. Murmurs flitted through the ranks of the armed fae, and for a moment, no one moved. Then one, the smallest of the lot, lowered his staff and stepped forward. His face was mostly covered by a large, bushy beard, but his silver wings were delicate. Between the pointed ears and wings, I marked him as being of the fairy race. His eyes took me in with undisguised interest. A princess, you say? Firstborn? An heir? Or a bastard? Um, isn't there a lot in between? I joked. The man scowled, telling me that my attempt at humor did not land, so I cleared my throat. I'm the firstborn heir of Isabel White and Frederick Torna. As it stands, I'm the only princess of my court, though that should change soon. You're with child? The soldier asked, his nose wrinkling. What? No. I liked kids, but couldn't think of anything worse for me right now. My sister was taken long ago. She's alive, just not in my court. How old is she? I swallowed. I was getting the vague feeling that this was some sort of questionnaire. I wish to speak to your leaders, I repeated, not answering his question. It didn't feel right. Prince Cirrus is unavailable. Dum hissed softly. That someone would not make themselves available to me was apparently unfathomable to her. When will he be able to entertain visitors? I asked, not about to take no for an answer. We've traveled a long way. We're under no promises to receive you, Princess Alice, said the short silver-winged soldier. However, if you wish to meet the prince, you must first go through a decontamination process. Uh, what? Images of standing in a room butt naked and being sprayed with water came to mind. There was no way in hell I was subjecting myself or my friends to that. You cannot walk our sacred island as you came, and you certainly cannot be in the presence of our royal family. The soldier arched an eyebrow as if I was covered in mud. Damn, I couldn't look great. Who did after a day of flying and camping on the beach? But I couldn't look that bad. Do you consent to being cleansed? If not, you must leave Crystal Island. My lips pursed. What does the process entail? I cannot say, for I do not perform the cleansing. The bearded soldier tilted his chin skyward. I was born of this island and have never left to acquire the taint of the greater realm on my skin. I eyed Henry sidelong. He worked his jaw but inclined his head to me as if saying, We'll do what you think is best. Does it hurt? I asked our reluctant hosts. I won't consent if it's going to hurt us. Another of the soldiers, a tall female with half of her head shaved, cleared her throat. The one we'd been speaking to turned to her. Yes, Aza? Commander. She dipped her head to the silver-winged fay, marking him as a rank above her own. I have undergone a cleansing. It does not hurt. The commander turned back to us. There you have it. Now do you agree, or shall I be forced to evict you from our paradise? They really think highly of themselves, don't they? I wanted to push back, to insist on seeing the royals first, but I could tell from the looks in our welcoming party's eyes that we weren't going to get anywhere that way. We were in a new place, a new culture, and we had to submit. At least for the time being. They try any messed up stuff, and I'll tell them to go to hell. We agree, I said finally. Very good, come with me. I gripped Valia's reins and followed the soldiers, my friends just behind me. We'd landed close to the castle, but were now rounding the structure, which gleamed like the inside of a jewelry box. I wondered if the whole thing was made of gems, or just the outside. If it was totally composed of precious stones, that was a ton of crystals. Not only was the palace stunning, but the people on its grounds were too. By the way they carried items or gardened, I assumed we only saw normal fae going about their day. 
but each one wore a gem-toned robe that fluttered in the breeze coming in off the sea, and small stones glimmered in their hair, even the men's, catching the light. Perhaps they were nobles? I want to do that, Dum whispered in my ear from where she sat on my shoulder as we passed one fey female with green hair that grazed her buttocks and was dotted with violet gemstones running down her locks like a waterfall. She's beautiful. They all are, I said. The commander stopped us in front of a nondescript door. Hand over your mounts. They'll be taken to the stables. They don't need to be cleansed, too? I asked sweetly, annoyed. Beasts won't tolerate the fey methods. They have their own process. The commander scowled at me. Apparently, people didn't question him often. We relinquished the reins to our rides. When I did so, Valia looked at me, betrayal plain in her eyes. You'll be okay, girl. I'll get you later. Promise. Three of the soldiers led our animals down the path, and I turned to the commander. Where to now? Here. He slammed a fist against the door we'd stopped in front of before opening it. Inside, we were met with a stairwell descending into darkness. I frowned. Where does this go? And was that knock some kind of code? Should I trust this fay? To the purification chambers. Are those in the dungeons? The commander's eyes widened in pure astonishment, and then, to my shock, he let out a roar of laughter. We have no dungeons here, princess. We're not heathens. So no one misbehaves? Jax piped up incredulously. I never said that but we do not force troublemakers to live below ground. There is a small prison, but it is rarely used. We live in a land of peace and goodwill and plenty, not barbarism. The unlike you that he refrained from adding at the end hung in the air. Now, if you don't mind, he sniffed, I did not plan on shepherding uninvited Fay around all day. He gestured to the stairs. Henry stepped forward. Me first. It was my duty, being the royal and all, the one who should set an example, but this was how Hatter showed he cared. I allowed him to pass by. I'll take up the back guard, Jax announced, obviously trying to match Henry's chivalry. You're all going to the same place, and I'm coming with you to make sure you do, the commander muttered. So just get in. D. I patted my shoulder and Dee perched there, content to sit with her sister and be quiet for once. They were on guard, too. We descended the stairs, which were as dark as they'd looked at the onset. Though when we reached the bottom, we were greeted by a female fay with a short bob cut, waiting at a desk. Oh, outsiders! She leaned forward, like we were a freak show she couldn't get enough of. And look at those auras! My eyebrows drew together. Excuse me? I'm an aura reader. She waved her hand in the air. On it gleamed a ring with a ruby gem that glowed brightly, as if lit from within. It's easier to do in the dark, which is why I'm posted here and not outside. Oh, I paused. What color is mine? Blue, no, more of a teal. My house color. And mine? Dee squeaked, looking thrilled. Yours is a lovely warm red, like the rest of you. The fay answered the pixie. Dum opened her mouth, surely to ask about her aura, when the commander stepped in front of us. Enough niceties. As long as they're not malicious, we need a cleansing. Now. The aura reader swallowed, the first hint that this place wasn't a total utopia. Still, she nodded. They're not here for trouble, and the purifiers are in the back. Good, the commander grunted. Follow me. We walked past the desk, and Hatter shot a glance over his shoulder at me. Auras? I whispered so low only he could hear. He shrugged. I didn't know that was a fey talent. Nor did I. Fey were elemental, with Aether being the fifth and final element— Sometimes a mind fay appeared here and there, though usually they had some witching blood in them that created the new type of magic. But the girl hadn't been hesitant to tell us she read auras, like it was nothing unusual. The hallway the commander led us down was better lit, 
illuminated by lanterns I could easily imagine in a Moroccan tea house. The deeper we went, the more colorful the hallway became, until it opened into a space resembling a cavern, or a spa going for the all-natural look. The cavern was also lit with the lanterns in every color possible, and stalactites hung from the ceiling, each with multicolored gems crusting the structure. A pool, glimmering blue and beautiful, rested in the middle of the space below. The air was warm and humid, damp-smelling, but also faintly like mint, as if someone used essential oils in the space to keep it fresh. I exhaled. Do we take a dip in there? I love it, Dum cooed from where she and Dee perched on my shoulder. Was this purification as simple as taking a bath? If that was the case, I was down for it. I was filthy, and the pool looked delightful. The commander snorted. Hardly. That is for Fay, who wished to be closer to our island's essence. Go through here. He led the way to a side door that I had not noticed. When we walked through, we were met with another brilliantly lit room, where more Fay, two male and one female, were waiting for us. These are the outsiders? One of the males looked me over in a lecherous way. Obviously, the commander drawled. Do what you must. They wish to see the royals. I will go relay their presence now. Message me when you're finished. And with that, the gruff, bearded commander was gone, leaving us alone with these new people. One of the males stepped forward and reached out to me, but the female extended an arm, cutting them off. I'll take the girls. The pair of you will have one each as it is. Can you get through them all? Asked the male who had been about to touch me. I got the distinct sense he shouldn't have tried to claim me, had her shoulders were stiff, telling that he didn't like it either. The female glared at him. I'll be fine. Two of them are quite small. We'll take the center room. She gestured for me to follow, which I did, thankful to be away from her cohort. He's always trying to get his hands on pretty young things. The female huffed as she closed the door behind us. He's gross, Dee hissed, which actually drew a chuckle from the fae. I smirked, glad that the female had been present and completely agreeing with D. Well, if he tries anything with my friends, they're going to give it to him. Good, our island is mostly peaceful and serene, but that one could do with a purification session himself. What exactly are you going to do? I asked. She gestured to a five-tiered bookshelf on the side of the room. On each shelf, crystals of every color gleamed, they were cylindrical, emphasizing their resemblance to large crayons. We need to run each type of gem wand over your body. The crystals pull out any negative or unwanted energies. What does that mean? Melancholy, anger, fear? They're all unwelcome here. I stiffened. These regulate emotions? My teeth dug into my bottom lip. So you don't experience those? because that was creepy as hell. We do, though to a lesser extent than the other kingdoms of fairy. We get cleansed often, not as thoroughly as I'm about to do for you, of course. This is to banish any outside negativity. This whole concept was very weird, and I should have been more worried, but I was here to get things done. If I had to let this fae wave a gem wand over me, then so be it. Who wants to go first? She asked going over to the cabinet and grabbing a clear crystal. This will tell me which colors you need more of, but everyone will need at least a little of each one, particularly when they've never been purified before. I will, I volunteered. The woman nodded, then stared at the twins for a second and seemed to change her mind. Actually, the pixies are so small, I think I will try to do you all at once. If it doesn't work, I'll do three different cleansings, but I have a feeling that won't be necessary. She smiled at the twins. We haven't had pixies here in quite a while. No pixies? Dum asked, aghast. What kind of place is this? We are unusual in this court, the crystal wielder said. I don't know how much you know about our island. Basically nothing, I replied. Without asking, she began to run the crystal over me, kind of like a miniature metal detector, I didn't feel anything strange, or anything at all, coming from the stone, which allowed me to relax. 
We were curious about the magic, though, I added. Hmm, while no one here is aether-blessed, I hear you're a princess of another court, so I suspect you are? She pursed her lips. I am. And where do you come from? Wonderland Island. Our nearest neighbors, my grandfather used to tell me that we were allies with you. It had to be true since this woman was fey and they couldn't lie. Unless, of course, the fey here could. It wasn't out of the question. If people here could read auras and no one was aether-blessed, what other differences might there be? Are there elementals? I asked. A few, but mostly we have specialized magics, all born from the power of the crystals that you'll find around the island. We already know about your aura reading, Dee mused. What other kinds are there? Oracles are common. Some can speak with animals. She listed off a few other powers I had never heard of, like shadow walking, cartomancy, and bone magic. With each one, my awe of this place grew. Moving on to the ruby the female murmured. This may take more time. Apparently, she had decided she was just fine purifying all three of us at once, so we stood as still as we could as she ran the crystal over our bodies. From time to time it tickled, and my lips curled up. Dumb straight up burst into giggles. Do most of them feel this way? Dee asked, squirming. The crystals give different sensations, and as you can see, there are many of them. She gestured to the cabinet. You might as well get comfortable. It's going to be a long while until you're released. I frowned. There had to be at least twenty more colors to go through. We were on a timeline, and I hadn't anticipated this. Yet I suspected there was no way out but through, so I sat back and fully resigned myself to the Crystal Court's machinations. Chapter 10 Two hours later, I exited the purification room, feeling lighter, happier, like I didn't have a care in the world. Which was total BS, because my sister was a political hostage and the Red Queen was free. Not to mention the mess that was my personal life. I should have been on edge and alert, which only went to show how effective the purification process was. Henry and Jax were waiting for me in the main lobby, chatting amicably. My eyebrows arched, and I looked at Dee and Dumb, once more riding on my shoulders. If I wasn't already feeling the direct effects of the crystal work, seeing the guys talking like friends would have been enough to convince me that it had worked. Are you quite ready? Asked a voice I didn't recognize. I twisted to find an older fay, the first of his age that I'd seen on this island, watching me. He had a long silver mane wore robes of sparkling midnight blue, and his air of superiority hinted that he was in a position of importance. Who are you? I asked, my tone cheery, even though normally if someone spoke to me like that, I would have told him to shove it. Hi, Counselor Laurel. I'm to show you to your apartments. Annoyance trickled in, despite the fact I'd just been thoroughly cleansed. I was hoping to meet the royal family. I have business with them. Never mind that I had no way to repay or thank them for the information I needed, but I was sure we would figure out how to get what we needed and keep the royals of Crystal Island happy. Even if it took a few more trips back and forth between Wonderland, I'd pay them double, triple the amount of gold I'd originally packed. Suffice it to say, our royal family does not work on your time. Prince Cirrus is quite a busy man, but you will meet him and his sisters at the feast tonight. Counselor Laurel looked me up and down. You are about the size of one of his sisters, and a princess too, correct? Princess Alice White of Wonderland, I confirmed. Good. Then the attire I set aside will be appropriate. As for the rest of you, servants will be by shortly to assist. His eyes raked over Henry and Jax, both filthy from our journey. You'll surely need new clothing before you can be in the presence of our royal family. Now follow me. Without another word, the man twirled and left the room. The guys exchanged a look, the usually unfriendly pair still alarmingly loose toward one another. 
but none of us said a word as we followed the counselor back down the hallway and stairs. He offered no information either. We emerged into the bright sunlight, and once more the breeze coming off the ocean caressed my skin, soft and warm and salty. I breathed in deeply. After being down below ground for so long, nature and open skies were welcome. People stared at us as the high counselor showed us to the front of the castle and through the gates. We were now entering like actual guests. At least I thought we were, until Laurel veered away from the large door leading into the palace and headed instead to a narrow path running alongside it. Are we not staying inside the castle? I asked. Such hospitality was not a good way to make allies. We do not know you, Princess Alice. You arrived unannounced and uninvited. We have no reason to trust you, least of all because I've never heard your name in my life. As such, you will be staying in the apartments outside the palace, and you will remain there until someone comes to collect you for the feast. Is that understood? We didn't seem to have much choice in the matter, and I really needed information on how to get through the rift, so I held my tongue. Very good. Here we are. He gestured to the two-story building we'd been approaching. It was cute, actually. Very English cottage-like, but with crystals lining the window panes and the path up to the amethyst-colored door. What time should we be ready? I asked, trying not to sound frustrated. At nightfall. At that, Counselor Laurel was apparently done with us, because he turned around, leaving the five of us standing at the door. Shall we? Jax asked, opening the door. The apartments were plush and filled to the brim with crystals. Even the bookshelf was made of gleaming black stone. Onyx, perhaps? I sniffed the air, noting how clean it smelled, like lemon and pine. They must have recently spruced up the space for us. The separation aspect still wrangled, but the comfortable luxury of the space and the clear effort to make it livable was reassurance that the royals were not being mean. They simply didn't trust me yet. As much as that annoyed me, I understood. I didn't trust people quickly either, so it seemed that there was nothing to do but wait. In a few hours, when we got to the feast, I would broach the topic of my visit. Alice, which room do you want? Henry asked. The biggest! Dum hollered. She's sharing with us! Are there such things as pixie rooms? Jax asked. Not here. They don't even have pixies. Dee replied. Is that normal? No! She looked horrified. It's quite a shame. A whole region deprived of pixies? I can't imagine. Yes, this is a strange place. Henry rubbed the back of his neck. I didn't feel comfortable removing my clothes for the purification process, but the Fae insisted, and all the crystals are... unique. Hold up. I raised a palm. You had to get naked? I removed my shirt and pants, but kept on my undergarments. Me too, Jack said. That must have been why that woman was so keen on taking you he told me. Uh, I cleared my throat. We were clothed. The guy stiffened. The pixies eyed me, and I rubbed my hands on my thighs uncomfortably. I hate to say it, but I think they played you boys. Th that's wrong, Jax hollered. I feel so used. Agreed. It was uncalled for. Henry lifted his chin as if the offender was right in front of him and he was telling him off. Again, the guys were agreeing, but I wasn't sure this time was from the weightlessness the purification left behind. Rather unfortunately, it was over them both having been violated. But I couldn't change it, and for now, I take the development. I needed them to work together, to not fight, to be a team. Because in a few hours, we'd be meeting the royal family and I had a feeling they would be unlike any other fae I'd ever encountered. The hours passed slowly. Even with the plethora of new items and decor to wonder at in our surroundings, 
I couldn't help but glance out the windows every ten minutes, waiting for the sun to set. When it was finally descending, I began my preparations. I'd actually packed a gown, foreseeing that I'd have to participate in some regal event. Fairy was so steeped in tradition, it was pretty much unavoidable. But the one I'd brought was pretty wrinkled, and no one had thought to provide us with an iron. Fortunately, there were a dozen dresses for me to choose from, hanging in the wardrobe of the upstairs bedroom. All of them were stunning. In the end, I settled on the one that spoke to my status, an aquamarine gown with a plunging neckline and back. It had bell sleeves, and the wrists were embroidered with bronze diamonds. The colors weren't the teal and gold of my house, but they were close enough. They would do. D and Dum had also been given dresses. The question of why a region with no pixies had small dresses on hand popped into my mind, but I didn't voice it. Perhaps some of their kind had stayed here once, or perhaps they were doll dresses? If I ran out of things to talk about, maybe I'd bring it up at dinner. Dum wore a dress with a silver skirt and a blue top cut in a sweetheart neckline. Dee chose a ball gown in her favorite color, red, with gold stars on the skirt. We look amazing, I said, as I finished applying the cosmetics that had also been generously donated to our apartments. You two done? Yeah, Dum said, studying herself in the mirror. Do you think the prince will like my outfit? I bet he likes red better, Dee interjected, her tone superior. Oh, good grief. These two could not stop themselves when it came to pining over a prince. We'll see soon enough, I said noncommittally, but my friends didn't reply, having fallen into bickering. Ignoring them, I rose to go to the door. When I opened it, footsteps filtered up the stairwell. Someone was moving around in the living area. I left the pixies to their sisterly squabble and went downstairs to find the remaining two members of our party. When I did, my heart rate kicked up. Henry and Jax lounged in chairs, both looking stunning in black trousers and jackets worn over tunics. Henry's tunic was longer and an amethyst color that looked amazing with his green eyes. Jax's was sapphire blue. In a way, their attire reminded me almost of modern-day suits. Don't you two look dashing, I said, walking into the room. And you are beautiful, Henry breathed as he stood up. I got the impression that he might have been holding his breath a touch too long. There won't be a more gorgeous girl at the feast. Jax added, rising as well and offering his arm. I glanced at it, but sat in one of the empty armchairs. So, Jax said, his tone slightly irritated. He resumed his seat, while Henry remained standing. What's the plan for tonight? I don't know that there is one, I admitted. No one knows what to expect, so I guess I'm going to play it by ear but of course your number one prerogative is to get the information about the Fae who crossed the rift, Henry said. Yes, though I'm not sure they'll tell us. If they would, don't you think other courts would know how to do it by now? Yes, I do, Henry agreed. Many citizens from all over Fairy are trapped in the Dark Court in the Cove Court, since the rift extends past their eastern boundaries into the ocean. If people knew how to breach it, they would want to get their lost family out. That's what I thought, too. This information will cost me, of course. I just hope I can pay their asking price. If not... I allowed my fingers to graze my thigh, where a dagger was hidden beneath my skirts. I might be acting diplomatically tonight, but that didn't mean I'd go in without protection, and a dagger was one of my most trusted weapons. I might have to figure out other ways to persuade them. I finished. Jax frowned. I can do that for you. He knew I'd always hated forcibly extracting information from people. Slitting throats, particularly those of the scum we usually targeted, was easier than speaking with the people attached to them. Otherwise, I learned too much personal information, allowing even the worst monsters to become too human for my tastes. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, I said, as a knock came at the door. Already on his feet, Henry strode across the room to answer it. Are you our escort? 
I couldn't see our visitor beyond Hatter's broad-shouldered frame, but the wobble in the young, soft voice was undeniable. I am, sir, if you're ready. I am your escort for the length of your stay. May I show you to Ruby Hall? We're ready. Hatter turned to me. The pixies? D, dumb! I shouted in the direction of the stairs. Get down here! The fay at the door, a young male of about eight, dressed in plain but well-made clothing, glanced away at my shouting. Weird, I hadn't been that loud. Maybe he was extra sensitive to sounds? Fay here had very different powers to those of the rest of fairy, so it was a possibility. The next moment, the pixie shot downstairs and beamed at the young fay. Sorry, we were debating about eye makeup. As they looked exactly the same as they had when I left, I knew they'd likely been arguing all that time. But I appreciated the fact they were keeping their drama under wraps. The five of us needed to appear as one united front. Let's go. I stood from the armchair and swept out of the apartment first. Show us the way. The boy began leading us down a path toward the castle. As he went, his green wings splayed out, hinting that he might be proud to be escorting us. I took that as a favorable sign. Despite my boosted optimism, I was still somewhat surprised when we entered through the front door. Since our arrival, we'd been so hidden away, I wouldn't have blinked an eye if he'd shuffled us in through the kitchens. Once we were in the thick of things, walking crowded corridors that must lead to where the feast was taking place, we garnered notice. Fay donning magnificent gowns or tailored suits stared openly, waiting for the party to begin. Servants darted glances as they provided flutes of wine and aperitifs to guests. Apparently the royals were treating the whole of their palace as some sort of reception hall. Weird, but there wasn't much about this place that wasn't. One brave servant approached us, and the boy who was showing us to Ruby Hall paused. Would you like a drink? He asked our group, his tone barely a whisper. What is it? Henry wanted to know. Wine from the south of the island. Is it strong? I interjected. I'd heard some courts had wine that would knock you on your butt after a sip. Since I would soon be doing business, I wanted to avoid looking sloppy. I've never had it, the boy said, and looked at the server. The older face shrugged. It's all I've ever had, but I've never felt ill from it. Probably not that bad, then. I took a glass, which I found to be heavier than it appeared, and the men did the same. One sip told me I had been right about its contents. There was no burning in my throat. Rather, the drink reminded me of champagne, but with a faint berry flavor. Delicious. Thanks. The server bowed shallowly and went on his way, so the boy waved once again for us to follow. Within the castle, crystals were everywhere the eye could see, just like on the outside. Somehow, the fae of this island had figured out how to work precious stones into practically any shape. Emeralds framed paintings. Courts had been constructed into vases. After a brief examination, I learned that even the glass I held was made of stone— a light sapphire that had been altered to look like glass. This place is so interesting, Dee whispered in my ear. Neither she nor Dumb were riding on my shoulders now. We were trying to appear regal, after all. But they were flying close, almost the way I imagined other royals would expect their ladies-in-waiting to. And you're from Wonderland, so that's saying something, I teased. A pause followed before Dee said, I suppose our island is a touch odd compared to the rest of fairy. A touch? The girl's reference point was definitely skewed. The young fay leading us stopped abruptly before a door. Here's Ruby Hall. Prince Cirrus and his sisters are waiting inside to speak with you. You'll have plenty of time to yourselves before the other guests are ushered in. Oh, great. I'd been more than ready to battle for their attention, expected it even, after the day we'd had, so this was a nice surprise. Guys, flank me? Henry and Jax promptly took up positions on my right and left, and the pixies fluttered in the air between us. Once properly surrounded, I entered Ruby Hall. Immediately, all the breath whooshed out of me. If I'd thought the rest of the castle was elaborate, 
It had nothing on this room. Rubies adorned every available surface, including the floor, which was midnight black, so the red stones appeared to be crimson stars dotting a night sky. The red gems also hung from the chandeliers, and the scarlet walls had that strange reflective quality that told me they were made of crystals too. What had these fae done to create that? Did magic coalesce the gems together, crushed them and then painted the walls with their essence? However they had accomplished it, the effect was mesmerizing. And then there were the thrones on which five people clad in stunning attire sat. The chairs themselves demanded attention their backs twenty feet tall and made of gold crusted with crimson precious stones. But the people were even more captivating. The prince was the only male, and he sat in the middle. On his right, two female fae perched, their eyes wide as they took me in. On his left was another female fae, and High Counselor Laurel. Those must be the princesses, Dum sighed. They're beautiful, I snorted. Like, that's a shock. Every single person we'd seen here had been attractive. Well, maybe not the High Counselor, but the odds for great beauty really seemed to be in the Fae's favor on this island. Come forth. The prince's voice boomed over the hall. We did as he requested, and as we approached, I studied him carefully. The prince was probably around Hatter's age, he had long, white-blonde hair, violet eyes, and earrings that ran the length of each earlobe. Most appeared to be sapphire studs, the blue standing out against his silvery-white hair. Dressed in all black, including a cape that poured over one shoulder, he gave off a dangerous and sexy vibe. Two of his sisters looked much like the prince, their coloring exactly the same, while the other had red hair and vibrant green eyes. We stopped at the base of the thrones, Henry dropped into a low bow, and Jax belatedly followed suit. The pixies landed and curtsied. I merely dipped my chin. Royal to royal, we were technically the same rank. Unless the prince and princesses stood, I would not curtsy. The prince arched his eyebrows and rose, bowing shallowly. I matched him with a curtsy, and his sisters went deeper than me. It was all posturing, and while I'd never played the game exactly this way, I understood it in my bones. Greetings, princess, the prince said. Now that we were closer, I could see the detailing of his attire better. Sapphires lined his cape and adorned his hands. The stone of one ring was nearly the size of a quail's egg. I'm Prince Cirrus, second-born to King Jandar and Queen Valahal, and heir to the Crystal Court. We welcome you to Jewel of the Sea Castle. Second-born? I wondered what happened to the first-born. And I'm Alice White, first-born and heir to the Wonderland Court. So I hear. Cirrus took to his throne again, allowing his sisters to do the same, though they did not introduce themselves. What brings you this far south? We come to create an alliance, I said, which was true, if not the entire truth. And? I swallowed. This was the moment when I'd learn what the prince was really like. I need to infiltrate the dark court. My sister is being held captive there. Rumor has it someone from your island escaped through the rift. Is that so? It is. Cirrus smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. I take it you wish to know how, so that you might replicate his success? I do. And what did you bring, as payment? I exhaled a long breath through my nostrils. Here goes nothing. We had bags of gold and gems, but on our way here they were thrown into the sea by a rock. Pardon? The princess with red hair leaned forward with interest. How so? Its mother attacked us, and one of our griffins. She had a youngling with her. The baby likely thought the bags were a sleeping beast and wanted to have its own kill. It scooped up all of the bags. When it figured out that the bags were just objects, it released them into the sea. What a story! The red-haired princess exclaimed. She opened her mouth to speak again, but the prince held out a hand. It is, but...
but your tale is also quite unfortunate. You see, we do not give away information for nothing. I could have more delivered, I assured him. As much as you like, but I need the information soon. We're marching into the dark court within the week. The prince leaned back in his throne, a thoughtful expression crossing his face. Actually, I believe I have another idea of how you might pay me, Princess Alice. But first, my people are waiting. He clapped his hands and the guards outside the doors appeared. Get the guests, the prince ordered. It is time to feast and dance. At his word, two dozen other fae appeared out of nowhere, running in from the sides of the vast room. They held long crystals in their hands like fat wands and waved them in the air. Where the fae walked, circular tables appeared. What the hell? Jax whispered. Conjuring fae, the prince said smugly. You've never seen one? Uh, no, I replied although some can conjure with aether, just not in that manner. Yes, I've heard of that. Our conjuring fae are a little different. They will prepare the room with the last-minute details. It will be ready by the time my people arrive to meet you. I'm sure they'll be quite interested to hear about your methods. Although the magic was pretty cool, annoyance built within me. I didn't want to wait to discuss the rift but the prince smiled indulgently as if he were doing me a great favor. Clearly he wasn't going to budge. I'd have to roll with his whims to get what I wanted. Once we're fed, we will speak of business and how you might earn our secrets. Cirrus purred. Until then, join me at the head table, will you, Princess Alice? Chapter 11 Stuck at the head table, I shifted uncomfortably in my seat. It wasn't the seat itself, or my dress, or any other physical thing that was making me feel weird. It was the face staring at me every few seconds that made me want to crawl beneath the table and hide. Since the moment the subjects of the Crystal Court had flooded into Ruby Hall, it had been this way. Even the appearance of all the tables, topped with stunning faux floral centerpieces made of glittering crystals, and the welcome speech from Prince Cirrus didn't stop the curious stares. I supposed it didn't help that I was seated between Cirrus and Princess Roshia, the youngest of the Laval royal line. Only my friends, seated at the table closest to the head table, didn't stare at me like I had three heads. They actually seemed to be trying to ingratiate themselves with the fae at their table, only occasionally glancing up to check on me. I wished the prince hadn't separated them from me, but the only non-royal allowed up here was High Counselor Laurel. Asking to fit four more felt like pushing my luck. How is your soup? The prince asked, turning from his other sister, Alicia Laval, third-born, to face me. It's good, I said, jumping at the chance to have his ear. Alicia and Nambra, the fourth Laval sibling, had monopolized Cirrus's time since we sat down. They'd been discussing matters of the court, and since I was asking for a favor, I hadn't interrupted. Instead, I'd made small talk with Roshia. But at least twenty minutes had passed, and I was ready to be getting on with what I'd come to do. Might we talk about my objective now, Prince Cirrus? As much as I'd love to simply give you what you wish, he replied, his tone all charm and grace and poise. I feel like I must get to know you first, Alice White. Surely that's understandable. My jaw tightened. He could have been doing that instead of chatting up his sisters. Why was this guy playing with me? Did I look like someone who tolerated that? Ask what you want, I gritted out, fully aware that the potion Xavier had given me before I journeyed to Wonderland was still in effect. I'd been here less than two weeks, and it should last an entire moon cycle. Thanks to the potion that enabled my missions in the human world, if I didn't want to answer truthfully, I could lie. It might be morally wrong, but if I needed to do so, I'd fib or stretch the truth. And I did require something from the Laval family, but they did not need to know everything about me, specifically my past as an assassin. I owed them no such insight. You are a royal fae, the prince stated. Are you Aether-blessed? 
Yes, I said, and his lips curled up. I've heard that no one here is? Correct. There is not a single Aether-blessed fae on this island. Is there a reason for that? It's said that the old gods did not bless my father's line with the power of Aether because the crystals found only on our island already give us unique magic. Cirrus frowned. Apparently they thought we had enough power to play with. I've never agreed with that sentiment. I wasn't sure I agreed with Cirrus. The fae of this court seemed prosperous, and that often equaled powerful. But I wasn't about to say that. Speaking of your father, is he here? I asked. I expected the king and queen would be at the feast. I'd expected nothing of the sort, but I wanted more information on these fae. Roshia was lovely, but she'd sidestepped every topic of real significance pertaining to the island. Perhaps her brother would be more forthcoming. Our mother has passed, and our father is ill. He does not leave his chambers. Oh, I'm sorry. I had lost both of my parents, and though I didn't really remember them, the idea still pained me. He is quite old, so it does not come as a surprise, the prince replied indifferently. We've become used to the new state of the court. For all intents and purposes, I have been ruler of the island for years now. I only need to be properly crowned, which I hope will occur soon. But thank you, your concern is warming. Cirrus's violet eyes raked over my face. Your hair is lovely, did you know? Quite unusual, even for Fay. I have noticed its rarity. My white blonde hair had been enough to give me away as being a descendant of the royal white line when I arrived. Though you, Princess Nambra, and Princess Alicia are similarly fair-haired, just a little more silver, I added. Perhaps we share a distant relation? Maybe if he felt more bonded to me in the familial sense, he'd be more inclined to give me what I wanted. Doubtful, Cyrus replied dryly. I thought that in this kingdom, alliances were made by marriage? They are. The last marriage that involved another court was my parents, though I am looking for a bride, so that might soon change. He patted my hand. My eyes widened. Oh no, is he... The main course arrived then, and I was spared speaking further, when Counselor Laurel appeared at the prince's side and whispered in his ear. I think he fancies you. Roshia leaned closer to me, her lips pulled up in a small conspiratorial smile. He rarely gives females the time of day. I can see that now, I hedged. I had no interest in the prince. Hell, with Jax trying to wedge his way between Henry and me, I had enough boy trouble as it was. But would rocking the boat be wise when we still hadn't learned the secret to passing through the rift? His recent oracle reading probably doesn't hurt. Roshi amused. What do you mean by that? I turned to the princess, the one who, with her red hair and green eyes, didn't really fit in with the rest of her family. Her eyes lit up. You know of oracles? I do, I said. And then an idea struck. One actually made a prophecy at my birth. I hadn't considered it before, but they were probably from here? Roshia nodded, lilac-veined wings fluttering softly behind her. When other courts welcome new babies into the family, we send out our oracles. It is a way of maintaining ties. But none have been sent for many years. I wonder if you were the last. My sister is younger. Oh, right, that slipped my mind. Perhaps she was the last, then. I wasn't sure. No one had mentioned an oracle being present at Elise's birth. Would Hatter recall if there was? Probably not. At that time, he would have been, what, six, at the oldest? Cirrus and the High Counselor were still occupied, so I decided to dig deeper into this topic with the princess. Perhaps I could learn something about oracles that would appease my worry over the prophecy hanging over my head. How common is that power? Very, but the strongest seers are kept here at Jewel of the Sea. High Counselor Laurel is among those. Does he read for your brother? Yes, and he mentioned we'd have company that would be in our best interests to receive. The soldiers we'd met when we landed said we came unannounced and uninvited— that did not equate unforeseen. 
The group of guards sent to retrieve my friends and I when we arrived. I pondered. That troop was smaller than usual, wasn't it? Roshia grinned, showing off perfectly straight white teeth. We've been on watch. Normally the welcome party would have been much larger. That only made me more annoyed that the royals insisted we wait to speak with them, but I pushed that aside, for the moment. I took a casual bite of my meal, a delicious roasted bird with a side of a vegetable that looked like a hybrid carrot beet thing and tasted a lot like a radish. I never knew what I'd be served in fairy, so I didn't ask. I just ate. What did the oracle say to him? Roshia had been sipping her wine, but my question sent her into a coughing fit. Her sisters leaned forward, silently questioning if she was okay, and again I felt the hundreds of eyes in the crowd watching us. What I wouldn't give to be sitting down there with Henry, Jax, and the Pixies, not the center of attention with the royals of this weird court. Finally, the princess mastered herself and raised a hand as she assured our audience, I'm fine. Once most of the faces had turned away and she was sure no one was listening, she leaned closer. We do not discuss that. A pit formed in my belly. Did she mean that even if I somehow found the oracle who had spoken at my birth, the seer wouldn't talk about it? Or did she simply mean that it wasn't polite to discuss prophecies related to other people? Or perhaps the vision regarding Cirrus was just that horrible? She must have seen the consternation on my face, for she added, However, I can tell you that I believe my brother will want to get to know you quite well. The pit in my stomach deepened, growing into a chasm. Did he think I'd come here to be his wife? I'd need to set the record straight. Unfortunately, at that exact moment, Cyrus excused himself, leaving with Counselor Laurel. Stay, Princess Alice, enjoy the meal. I began to protest, but there was nothing to it. Cyrus left and didn't bother to turn back around. What was he up to? I was left wondering that for an excruciating amount of time. The Fae ate slowly, and the prince didn't return until the main course had been taken away. I was practically vibrating with annoyance when he finally swept back into the room. But Cyrus didn't seem to notice. He came to me, hand extended. What are you doing? I asked, but placed my palm on his because I felt put on the spot. I request a dance. Oh, okay. No one was dancing yet, and though I was taken aback by both his forwardness and the spectacle we'd make, I went along with his invitation. At least this way I'd be able to ask him about the rift somewhat privately. He led me to a cleared space between the tables that I thought was intended to allow the servants more room as they bustled in and out of the hall, or the people present to more easily approach the head table. But now it was a dance floor. I'm not very good, I warned as Cirrus twisted to face me and placed a hand on my waist. That was a lie. I just didn't know the moves to what I predicted was going to be a very fancy sequence, nor did I really want to dance. I wanted to get down to business, but the prince was not to be dissuaded. He smiled, though it did not reach his eyes. You do not need to be, Princess Alice. I shall lead you. Briefly letting go of my hand, he snapped his fingers, and, as if they'd been waiting for this moment, a string quartet began to play. The floor is open! A deep male voice called out and chairs all around the room pushed back as others rushed to join us. The prince didn't seem to notice the chaos, though. He flowed right into the dance with such grace and familiarity, I wondered how often the Crystal Court held feasts like this. He was an even better dancer than Henry, and that was saying a lot. But seeing as I hadn't come here to marvel at Prince Cirrus's footwork, I seized the moment of our relative privacy. Do you know if the fae who crossed the rift is present tonight? I asked, feigning nonchalance. The prince stared at me in amusement. You are quite the tenacious creature, aren't you? I am, I replied, tone even, as if waiting for hours for an answer wasn't killing me inside. But in this case, you must understand, my sister's life depends on my learning to cross that boundary. 
Family is the most important thing to me, he replied, though the words were oddly tight. Do you agree? Yes, I said. Before, I'd never had the chance to agree to such a statement. I hadn't known any blood family, just a couple of close friends I treated as such. Then I'd learned about Elise and determined I would do anything to rescue her. I'm pleased to hear it. A gleam of interest sparked in his violet eyes. Does your sister have the same aether magic as you? I tilted my head, unsure where he was going with this. In a way, I was glad we'd stayed on the topic of Elise. But why bring up her magic? Cirrus seemed too interested in aether-blessed powers. I'm not sure, I said honestly. I only discovered her existence recently, as we were separated when we were young. She might have been too young to even display her powers. A shame. I hear Aether magic runs strongly in some royal lines, and less so in others. Sure, wasn't that the case with most things? Brushing off his bizarre comment, I pressed on with my agenda. I suppose I could find out about Elise's magic and get back to you once I retrieve her. The prince chuckled. You could, yes. Anything keeping you on my island is welcome. My skin prickled at the comments of remaining here. It sounded possessive, but maybe I was reading too deeply into the prince. I knew so little about him. So far, Cirrus had kept his cards close to his chest. The current song ended, and the prince guided me to a stop. I wasn't sure what the protocol for separating was, so I waited for him to lead. He took a step back and bowed shallowly. I responded to his gesture with a curtsy. Then, thinking we were done for the moment, I made to leave the floor and regroup with Hatter and the others. If Faye were dancing, maybe my friends and I could speak freely, and they would have a better idea of how to get the prince to tell me what I needed to know. However, before I could take so much as a step, Prince Cirrus wrapped a hand around my wrist. A moment, Princess Alice. I turned to him, my head tilted in curiosity. All around us, people were watching. Prince Cirrus smiled widely at them, but when he lifted our joined hands into the air, I stiffened. What's his game? Fay of Crystal Island, I have a glorious announcement. Silence fell over the hall in a rapid wave. It was so quiet, I suspected the people closest to us might be holding their breath. It is with great pleasure that I inform you that I am now courting Princess Alice White of Wonderland. My mouth fell open. What the what? After the traditional courting period, we will be wed, right here in the palace. He shook our hands where he still held them aloft, still entwined. Faye cheered loudly, but I stood in place, absolutely dumbstruck. Had I given off the vibe that I was interested in him? I was sure I hadn't. I'd smiled and played nice, but marriage? How the hell had he gotten to that? Done with his announcement, Prince Cirrus turned to me. Your arrival is a true blessing. Once we wed, I will be able to fill you in on the secrets of our court. Oh no. No, no, no. I tore my hand out of his, and only then did I realize that I was shaking. I never agreed to marry you. You do wish to save your sister, correct? I clenched my jaw. Of course I wanted to save Elise, more than anything. But should I have to marry someone I barely knew? Someone I found slightly odd and off-putting for the slightest chance to accomplish that? Absolutely not. My defiance must have shown clearly on my face. This is the price for that information, Cirrus said, as if he were simply telling me how much a pack of gum cost. I have no need for gold and jewels. What I require is a bride of royal blood and an heir. Well, you're not getting that from me. I... My words died in my mouth as Henry and Jack barreled through the crowd. The pixies fluttered above, their eyes huge and questioning as they met mine. I didn't have time to assuage their worries, though, because Hatter rushed right up to the prince, coming so close that I feared he was going to shove him, or worse. Apparently, several palace guards thought so, too. They were there in a heartbeat, 
blades adorned with gems that glittered in the candlelight pointed at Hatter. Don't hurt them, I commanded. She won't marry you. Henry growled at the prince. She doesn't want to. That may be true. However, she does wish to save her sister, and no one in my court will give Princess Alice the knowledge she seeks. He turned to look down his nose at me. That is, unless you agree to join our houses. You do know how disgusting this is, right? I sneered. Trying to force someone to marry you is the foulest of foul moves. Perhaps. For me, it's that or I wed one of my sisters. Cirrus shrugged. It's been done before, but I'd prefer not to go that route. Why not invite other royals to your island? I threw up my hands. I don't know how many other princesses there are in this realm, but they'd flock here. People are curious about this court. Precisely why we don't want them coming. But you are already standing upon my soil. You know of our island, and though our hair is similar, I am sure we are not related. Though I am pleased that our progeny will likely bear the Laval coloring. Ew, this guy was next level gross. She's not marrying you. Henry ground out, green eyes burning with fury. No matter what you say. I second that, Jax added, and though he didn't sound as animalistic as Henry, I could tell he was holding back from blasting the prince with magic. Cirrus shrugged again, unfazed by our protests. Your options are to agree to this, or to leave my island. His tone of finality stunned me. There had to be another way. I needed the information he possessed, but I also wasn't about to marry the man. Actually, brother, there is one other option. A high-pitched voice called out from the head table. Have you forgotten? I glanced over to find Roshia standing from her seat, smiling. She seemed relaxed, her hand lazily holding a glass of wine, as though it might tip from her fingers at any second. By contrast, her brother had stiffened at my side. I didn't need to look at him to know he was glaring daggers at his sister. What other option? I asked loudly, wanting everyone to hear her answer. I had no idea what she was playing at, or why she'd go against a brother whom, by all earlier appearances, she adored. I also didn't care. A courting tournament, she replied. Should any male or female who wishes to marry another fay be challenged for their intended's hand during the courting process, they must accept if they wish to continue wooing the one they love. Roshia smiled sweetly as the crowd began to murmur. It's an old law, easily overlooked, which I'm sure is what happened. Right, brother? Cirrus cleared his throat, but before he could speak, Henry stepped forth. I challenge Prince Cirrus for Alice White's hand. I'll fight for her hand, too. Jax raised a fist. I groaned. Jax wouldn't let this opportunity slide. I gave them both a look that clearly said I wasn't marrying either one of them if they won. Henry inclined his chin, understanding. I mean, I liked the guy a lot, but marriage? I was only 18. Let's try going on a few normal dates first. Jax, on the other hand, did not give any indication that he'd noticed my ire. This was likely at least partially because Prince Cirrus had thrust his hand out in front of my ex. On the prince's hand, five rings glowed, each set with a different crystal. Jax took a step back, wary. What are you doing? You're no fay. Cirrus wiggled his fingers as if the rings had told him as much. As such, you cannot compete in our tradition. Why not? Does the law state that? The wizard demanded. No one spoke. No one knew. Counselor Laurel and I will learn if that is true or not, Princess Roshia stated suddenly. But clearly, the other contestant is Fay. so do you accept his challenge for the hand of the princess, brother? Or do you forfeit the female who might be your queen? It really sucked that, evidently, I had no say here. I was royal, and yet at the mercy of males. And Princess Roshia, who was definitely pulling some strings. Why that might be could wait until later. I accept your challenge, Cirrus told Hatter 
his tone low and dangerous. We begin the tournament in two days' time. Having set the terms, the prince whirled, his black cape splaying out behind him as he marched from Ruby Hall. Chapter 12 I stood on the dance floor, still in shock over what Prince Cirrus had pulled. All around, Faye whispered and stole glances at me. Some even pointed. These people lived for gossip, and we had served up a steaming vat of it. We need to leave, Henry stated. I can't just stand here. For once, we agree, Jax grunted. But I'm not sure I know how to get back to the cottage. I was in the same boat, a whole riddled canoe that felt like it was sinking. There had simply been too much to absorb on our way here for me to keep track of our path. From the looks on their faces, neither Hatter nor the Pixies had any idea where to find our temporary home either. I see the boy who brought us here hovering by the door, Dee proclaimed after soaring higher to look over the heads of those in the crowd. I'll get him. She zoomed out of sight, but returned in no time at all, yelling for people to get out of the way and let little Zeb through. When the fairy boy appeared in front of me seconds later, I clapped him on the shoulder. Your name is little Zeb? Just Zeb, Princess Alice. I don't know why she called me little. I'm much bigger than her. He eyed the pixie with annoyance, fluttered his green wings, and stood taller, almost making him four feet tall. They both think they're bigger than they are, I explained, hiding a smile. Don't take it personally. He looked at me expectantly, waiting for a command as he'd been trained to do. Can you take us back to our apartment? I asked, hating that I was running but seeing no other option. I need a quiet place. Come with me, Zeb said. No one in the crowd of Fay stopped him, nor us as we followed him. After we exited Ruby Hall, we speed-walked through the corridors. When we burst out a side door into the cool night air, I exhaled fully for the first time in what felt like hours. No words. Henry bit out when I turned to face him. Not yet. Right. It probably wouldn't do to start bad-mouthing a prince in the place where he owned everything the sun shone upon. Zeb led us straight to the cottage apartment, even opening the door and bowing like a gentleman. You don't have to do that, I said. You're courting my prince. I... Inside, Henry barked, and the others filed into the apartment. Thanks, Zeb. We'll see you tomorrow, I guess. You're supposed to escort us, right? Do we call you? He shook his head. That was for tonight, so you knew how to get to the feast. Tomorrow you can roam the palace grounds. He paused and looked nervously behind me. I didn't turn, but I felt Henry's glare. He wanted to speak to me, and the poor kid thought Hatter was mad at him for keeping me. I don't think you'll be able to get anywhere unless they want you to, so you'll know what's allowed. Yeah, you're probably right. I gave him a smile to ease his worries about Hatter. Well, good night. Thanks for the help. Good evening. He motioned for me to go inside and shut the door behind me. Kids chivalrous, I said, facing my friends. The guys stared back at me, stony. The pixies perched on the settee, eyes wide because they knew as well as I did that something was about to go down. Why didn't you warn us, Al? Jack said finally. That douchebag! I didn't know. I cut him off. How could you think I would have agreed to that? You sat with him for the whole dinner, Jax yelled back, and it looked like you had a nice conversation. By the old gods, I really wanted to slap him. For your information, we did talk. I mostly wanted to discuss the rift, which Cirrus was not open to. He kept saying weird things like asking, if you were Aether-blessed? Henry inserted. How do you know? I asked. Because everyone at our table made a big deal about it. There are no Aether Blessed on the island. I had a hunch then that Prince Cirrus might try to woo you. That way maybe his children would have the power. But I hadn't expected it so soon. 
Henry ran his hand through his long black hair. Maybe we should leave. We can't, I cried. You want to go through with this? To court him? To watch me fight in a tournament? And me, Jax added, even though no one had told him he could actually fight yet. No, I assured them. I don't want to do any of those things, but we haven't gotten what we came here for. I don't know how to get through the rift. Without that information, I have no chance at rescuing Elise. I don't think we'd be able to leave anyhow, Dum chimed in. They took our rides. Does anyone know where they're being held? No, Henry admitted. But we can find the stables. That has to be where they are. I doubt that will be happening tonight, I said. If they have the slightest hint that we're going to run, they won't let us near the stables. Cirrus wants a bride and an heir, and soon. I don't know why, since it doesn't seem like he has any competition, but there has to be a reason. Maybe Dum and I can look for our animals tomorrow, Dee suggested. You stand out here, though. There are no other pixies. We can make it work, Dee promised. We'll find the stables, so if we need to make an escape, we'll know where to go. Then we can... Princess Alice! A pounding came at the door, making all of us jump. Are you in there? The deep voice didn't sound like Cirrus, or even High Counselor Laurel, and it definitely didn't sound like Zeb. I moved to greet whoever it belonged to, wondering who else could possibly want something from me. Standing outside the door was a group of five soldiers, all armed. The one in front stepped forward. Princess, you cannot stay here any longer. Why not? Orders from Prince Cirrus. He cannot abide his intended staying in the same dwelling as two challengers. I scoffed. He's the one who put us here. For a second, the lead soldier looked almost sympathetic. I know. However, now I must move you. But my friends still have to stay out here? How do I know they'll be safe? Tournament laws govern the safety of challengers, the soldier said. No fighting or violence toward them is to take place until the tournament begins. Now we are here to gather your things and show you to your new quarters inside the palace. I huffed out of breath. This was absurd, but I didn't think I could get out of it no matter how loud I screamed. Not that I wanted to do that, either. It looked weak, and though I was new to this world and at a disadvantage there, I wanted to appear strong so I could wrangle what I wanted from the royals. I'd play nice. For now. My room is up the stairs. There's only one large bag, and it's mine. Get ours, too! Dum shouted. We're going with her. We're her ladies in waiting. I praised the old gods for Dum's quick thinking. Tough girl appearance aside, I didn't want to be alone in that castle tonight. That's okay, isn't it? I asked the soldiers. They're not challengers, and I would like them with me. They're females and your ladies, so, of course. Our bags are small trunks, Dee said in the tone of a highborn lady. They're on the vanity. Yes, miss. A soldier detached himself from the group and charged up the stairs, returning in less than a minute with all our bags. These them? Yes, I said, and turned to the guys. I guess we'll see you tomorrow. Try not to tear one another's heads off, will you? The men side-eyed one another, which wasn't promising, since the purification they'd been doing so well. But now that a prince had claimed I was to be married off, apparently they'd backslid. Maybe getting out of this room wasn't a terrible idea. No matter that my relationship with Henry was none of Jax's business, I would not rub it in and kiss Henry in front of everyone. We needed to look like a team. Plus, I didn't want that information getting back to Cirrus. I didn't trust the prince. So instead, I threw them both an awkward wave before walking outside. The pixies flew up next to me and settled on my shoulders. This is crazy, Dee said. The prince is being all possessive, which is kind of sexy, you have to admit, Alice. No, I don't. I didn't like Prince Cirrus much before he tried to force court me, and I didn't like him any better now. You're boy crazy. True, Dee sang and held out her fist for Dum to bump. Her sister obliged, earning us confused looks from the soldiers escorting us. 
unlike when we arrived at the feast, we didn't enter through the front door. I was glad for it. Undoubtedly, people were still leaving the castle, and I didn't want to be a freak show any longer. You'll be staying in the royal's guest wing, as befits your rank, the lead soldier said as he ushered me down an empty hallway. The prince won't be staying near me, though, will he? I didn't trust that sucker as far as I could throw him. I wasn't even sure I wanted to be in the same part of the castle as him. Then again, he has legs. He can walk to wherever I am. I'll lock the door with Aether tonight. I'd love to see him get through that. He will not. You are in the area reserved only for guests. We arrived at my new room shortly after, and a soldier opened the door. When I laid eyes on the inside of the chambers, I gasped. Crystals were everywhere, mounted on the walls, hanging from the light fixtures. Two even stood to the sides of the large window, as tall as my hip. The gems made the entire room glow. The dominant shades were blue-green and a light yellow. Calming colors, and my favorites. Had the prince picked up on that, or was it the luck of the draw? Are the bedposts covered in diamonds? Dee squealed soaring toward one of the poles and running her hands along it. Quartz, we find it more useful than diamonds, which are mostly used for jewelry. The lead soldier answered, as the one who'd been carrying our bags set them on the bench at the foot of the large bed. Will that be all, princess? Yes. If you need anything, two guards will be stationed outside your door at all times. The soldier gestured for the others to leave. Good evening and rest well. They filed out the door, and then we were alone. I guess I should have expected being moved, I sighed, circling the space. Dee and Dum didn't seem to hear me. They were too busy flying around the room and checking things out. I went to my bag. Now that I wasn't going to be up half the night, brainstorming with the guys about what this tournament might entail, it was probably best that I get some rest. Traveling here on a few short hours of sleep had begun to take its toll, and if the feast had proven anything, it was that I needed to be alert at all times. Which side of the bed do you two want? I asked as I laid my nightclothes out on the quilt. Right, Dee called at the same time Dum shouted, Left! I snorted. You know what, it's big enough for me to sleep in the middle, so you can both get your wish. That sound good? They fist-bumped one another, which I took to mean yes. I started to undress, groaning as I slipped off the boots I wore. Next, my fingers found the sleeves of my dress. I had begun to pull them down when Dum let out a shriek. What? I whirled, certain she'd taken her eye out with a crystal, but found the pixie looking at me, her face pale. The wall! Dum hissed, her tone tight with fear. It moved! Oh, by the aether! Her curse came as the wall next to my bed slid open. In a flash, I grabbed for the dagger strapped to my thigh. I had it out and ready by the time the person hiding in the wall appeared. Well, aren't you a surprising sort of princess? Roshia asked, ginger eyebrows raised. Her diaphanous lilac wings were out and tensed, ready to take flight if she needed. My heart was pounding hard. What are you doing here, and why did you come in that way? There are guards outside your door. I wish to speak to you, but they need not know. She held up her hands. I have no weapon, so if you'd like to talk, might I suggest you poke your head out and explain the commotion? Otherwise the soldiers will certainly check on you. A knock came at the door, and she smirked. They're quite fast. I was sure she wasn't there to harm us, and seeing as I wanted to find out why she had come, I slipped my blade back into its sheath, earning me an impressed look from Roshia, and went to respond to the guards. Yes? I peered around the door as if I were indecent. We heard a small scream. Is everything all right? Oh. I gave a dry chuckle. One of the pixies scared the other. They love playing pranks. The soldier studied me for a moment before shrugging. Very well. Thank you for assuring us. Prince Cirrus would be quite displeased if something happened to his intended. My lips tightened, but I refrained from retorting before softly shutting the door. I turned to find the princess perched on my bed, her hands folded in her lap. Sit with me. We have much to discuss. 
Yeah, we do, I said, going to her side and perching on the bed too. The pixies joined us, sitting between me and Roshia with their legs straight out in front of them. How about we start with why you reminded Cirrus about the tournament? I mean, I'm grateful, but isn't your brother furious with you? He certainly is, she said, as if she couldn't care less. I'm not worried about Cirrus at the moment, though. What about loyalty? I'm very loyal to my family. There are matters in the works here that you can't understand, nor will I share them. They're really none of your business, and I say that with the most respect possible. Roshia smoothed her dress, the same one she'd worn to the feast. Now, do you want to speak about the tournament? And then perhaps I can more freely talk to you about your goals on the island. My breath hitched. You know how that fay crossed the rift? I do not. Unfortunately, only my brother and his circle of advisors know that. However, I believe it was documented in the same place we keep all of our most important information, the Hall of Prophecy. You have a whole space devoted to that? We do. As I mentioned, we have many oracles here. Not all prophecies come true, though. I swallowed thickly as hope overcame me, and the princess nodded her understanding. Which I sense might be of interest to you. I assume the prophecy regarding you was unwelcome? It... Do not tell me! She held up her hand. I do not need to know, and it is bad luck to share them here. However, if you gained access to the Hall of Prophecy, you might learn the accuracy of the seer who foretold your potential future. Some are deadly accurate. Others, not so much. To be fair, most are on the less accurate end. But as your royal, I can be sure our court would have sent someone who's seen at least one of their predictions come to light. If the oracle who'd been present at my birth had a low success rate, that knowledge would help me breathe easier, and I'd be even less stressed if I could find out how to pass through the rift. Can you take me there? To the hall? Alas, no. You will require permission from my brother. Either that or a very, very good sneak to get you inside. I gestured to the hidden door. You seem pretty good. I am, she said smugly. But there are no secret passages that lead directly into that room, and it is always guarded by at least five lethal soldiers. Your entry would require a diversion at the very least, something huge. Perhaps a tournament? Roshia winked. It's a start. A good number of our palace guards will be diverted to the arena during the tournament. However, to be safe, a way for you to become invisible would be ideal as well. I chewed on my bottom lip, not sure Jax could do that. One thing at a time. Why are you telling me this, Princess Roshia? I could see that those males truly love you. It wasn't right what my brother did. That's all? I sensed that she was holding back. I have a vested interest in him not officially taking the throne. You want it yourself? I don't. That is all I will say on the matter. I studied the Fay. She was offering me the information I needed to succeed here, but she wasn't exactly forthcoming on other matters. Did I trust her? I wasn't sure. But right now, doing so seemed to be my best, my only option. Chapter 13 The next morning, I slid into pants I'd brought with me, since the closet was filled solely with dresses. I didn't hate the gowns, but I preferred pants, and I definitely didn't want Prince Cirrus to think that I was okay with him dressing me. Plus, sneaking around in dresses was way more difficult. Are you sure about this plan, D? I asked. After Princess Roshia had left through the hidden wall passage, and I'd promptly locked it behind her with Aether, the Pixies and I had stayed up for hours talking. It was clear that I needed to find my way into the Hall of Prophecies. How exactly I would do that was uncertain. But in the end, it was decided that I'd simply ask. Yep, I was just going to ask Prince Cirrus. Maybe because he was my intended, he'd allow it. Then again, maybe not. I was fully prepared to be denied, which was where Dee came in. I want to search for the stables, too she said. I'll do that after I look for the Hall of Prophecy. Fine, but don't get caught. 
The last time the Pixies had been sent spying, two witches captured them and sealed their wings together. Though I could probably unstick them now, thanks to Queen Aquatia's teachings, I didn't want that to happen again. I won't. I've learned a few new tricks, Alice. You guys play it up that I'm ill from the wine. It was really strong, Dum added. Hatter gave me a sip of his, and I nearly fell over. Maybe next time don't be such a lush, I teased, which earned me a slap on the shoulder at Dum's hand. I snorted. That was like a mosquito bite. She produced her fangs. I could have used these. Uh, no thanks. I'd seen those teeth rip food to shreds. They were tiny but sharp, and venomous. I'd like to remain poison-free today. One bite won't hurt you. It'd be more like a zing of energy. What? I blinked. You told me... A swarm would kill you. Probably ten bites would be debilitating for someone your size. Dee didn't look at all worried. But one to three is fine. It's all about the dose. I arched my eyebrows, unconvinced. It's true, Dum said. Some people sell our venom and put it in their tea for a jolt. Okay, that was weird. I think I'd rather not. Dee settled back into the bed as if she couldn't care less. You two should leave so I can get started spying. Make sure to tell people I want to be alone. Will do. I waved to her and nodded to Dum, who soared next to me. When I opened the door, two new guards were there, as we'd been told they'd be. I twisted. Feel better, Dee? Don't puke all over the bed, Dum added for good measure. Is there a problem? The younger of the two guards asked. One of my ladies-in-waiting overindulged at the feast. She's only this tall, I demonstrated with my hands. And someone allowed her fey wine. I shook my head. Now she's not feeling too hot. The guard peeked inside, and I could only assume that he caught sight of Dee hamming up being sick, because his expression softened. A shame, the guard said. The prince has requested you meet him for breakfast and was hoping to speak with those closest to you. I'm ready and willing to serve Princess Alice, Dum sang, playing her role of dutiful lady-in-waiting to perfection. Has he invited Hatter, too? And Jax? I added my ex's name to make it appear as if my entire group was a united front. He was no longer among those I considered close, but Cirrus didn't know that. The prince will be entertaining only you today. You will not see the contenders for your hand until later. That changed things. I'd been planning to tell the guys all about Princess Roshia's visit, but now... Suddenly, Dee started coughing up a storm from her place in the bed. My eyes widened, and I spun to find the pixie waving me over. Water! She rasped. What had she done? Choked on her own spit? When Dee made a weird jerking motion with her head, it clicked. She wanted to speak to me. The guard moved as if to help her, but I stopped him. I prefer that male fae whom I do not know not enter my chambers. I'll do it. They didn't fight me on that, so I rushed over to Dee. Are you okay? I picked up a small glass of water and held it for her. For appearance's sake, she sipped, but then whispered, I'll find our guys and tell them about our visitor last night. Thank you, I whispered back. I placed the cup back on the nightstand, and in my regular tone said, Call us if you need anything, but no one will disturb you otherwise. Thank the Aether, she wailed. I need rest. This time, we really did leave the room, and the guards led me through the palace. Last night, I'd considered that some of the artifacts might have been on display for the feast. As it turned out, I was wrong. The palace was simply decked out in crystal all the time. Here you are, Princess Alice. The guards stopped in front of a closed set of double doors. The breakfast room. Is there a lunch and dinner one, too? They stared back at me, but Dum laughed daintily. At least someone was on my level. After an awkward beat of silence, one of the guards opened the door and announced my presence. Prince Cirrus answered with a rather formal invitation for me to enter. And when I did, I gaped. 
He was seated alone at a table long enough to sit twenty and weighed down with food. The prince was at the head of the table, with only three servants at the edges of the chamber for company. Each servant wore a beautiful robe of sapphire, hemmed with twinkling blue stones. My attention dipped to Cirrus's plate, full of food and surrounded with gemstones the same shade of blue. I was beginning to understand that sapphire was a Laval house color, and suspected the crystals people kept closest to them might help charge their magic. Will your sisters join? I asked gesturing to the massive table. Just us today. I squashed a groan. I hadn't considered I'd be eating with him totally alone. But I didn't want to look weak or like a lost precious thing, so I strode toward the table. The prince's eyebrows pinched together when I stopped at the seat next to his, and he tilted his head. What are you doing? You invited me to breakfast. That, he pointed down the table is your seat, the opposite head. Was he freaking joking? We were going to eat with a million feet of space between us? Uh, are you serious? I don't know how you do things in the Wonderland court, Princess Alice, but here things are done properly. Now please, sit. Your lady will take the spot next to you, if you wish. It wasn't an invitation so much as it was a command. Slowly, I walked down the table, dumb fluttering at my side. When I got to the end, a servant who had been hovering in the corner rushed over and pulled out my chair. Thanks. I took a seat. Once I was situated, the servant asked, Would you prefer juice, tea, or something else for your beverage, Princess Alice? The royal family prefers to serve themselves food from a banquet spread at breakfast, but I will bring you whatever beverage you wish. Water is good, for my lady-in-waiting, too. Obviously, she only requires a very small cup. The servant rushed off, and I turned to the prince. I'm surprised your sisters aren't here. Indeed, as shocked as I am to see that your other lady is intending to you. She's not feeling well. The same can be said for Nambra. Alicia is resting with her. And Rochia? I asked when he left her name hanging between us. I have not seen or spoken with my youngest sister since the feast. Are you upset with her? For interfering? I shrugged. Seems to me like she was making sure the law was followed. Perhaps. But no, I'm not upset with her for that. Rochia has always been a stickler for the law. I'm more upset that she seems to have fled Jewel of the Sea. I recalled that the red-haired princess came to my room, still dressed in the gown she'd worn to the feast. Had she snuck out of the palace via the secret passages right after visiting me? Why? Something isn't right in this kingdom. Like Wonderland had been corrupt, like the Dark Court was rumored to be a nightmare, it seemed the Crystal Court had its demons too. I was beginning to think there might not be a single place in Fairy that was totally straightforward, or even close to perfect. Hopefully she turns up, I replied, because Cirrus was watching me closely. She will when she wants to, Roshia is talented at hiding. A pregnant pause filled the air. What did he want me to say? To do? It didn't matter. A moment later, Cirrus heaved a sigh, as if I'd epically failed to meet his expectations. It has been brought to my attention that today would be a good day to show you my kingdom. He stated. It will get you out of the castle and take our minds off this fussy tournament taking place tomorrow. Translation I wouldn't see my friends at all today. Thank goodness D had offered to fill them in. I crossed my arms. Why would I want to see your kingdom? To become familiar with the Fae of the Crystal Court. You seem very sure that you're going to win the tournament. I am. Your friends are an elemental Fae and a wizard. They are no match for me. Uncrossing my arms, I leaned forward. Wait, so Jax can compete? I didn't want him to fight. Why risk it? But no one had told me one way or another yet if a wizard was even allowed. It seems that our laws do not preclude other magical races from entering the tournament. He will likely regret it, though. Cirrus looked smug, like a man confident in his power and status. What kind of magic do you possess? I asked warily. You'll see tomorrow. His tone was ominous and that made me worry for the guys. 
as if he could sense my thoughts drifting away, Cirrus pressed. Is there something you would like to see while we're out, my beloved? My jaw tightened at the forced term of endearment. He was really laying it on thick. Do you enjoy gardens? He continued. Parks, historical monuments. This was my chance to suggest the Hall of Prophecy, but how to do it? I couldn't come out and say Roshia had told me about it, could I? Not now that she'd fled. Or perhaps you'd like to see the market, he suggested, when I made no indication of preference. Speak with the people, they'd... I like libraries, I blurted out. Especially ones with one-of-a-kind information. Like records, Dum added helpfully. Yes, something I can't see anywhere else. Cirrus set down his fork as a server approached with my glass of water. I grabbed it, thankful to have something to do with my hands, while the prince studied me. Did he suspect I'd already learned about the Hall of Prophecy? Or were there so many special libraries here that he was going through them in his mind? If the library has magical connotations, even better, I said, trying to narrow the options. Hmm, I shall think of places like that, he relented finally. Perhaps we'll begin with the market, and if I've come up with a library that fits your interests, we'll go there next. The bastard. There was no way someone could not recall an elite room filled with prophecies, and the exact information I needed to cross the rift. He was playing dumb. Cirrus wouldn't allow me into the Hall of Prophecy, even if I came right out and asked for it, which I wouldn't do because that would expose his sister's influence. I didn't want to do that. She tried to help me, so I'd protect her in return. As best I could, anyhow. That meant I'd have to go along with Cirrus's plan to show me around the kingdom today, and hope that Dee found something useful as she scouted the area. Hours later, I entered my room and shut the door behind me with a heavy sigh. Immediately, I turned to press my back to it, and give something else the weight smothering me. Where have you two been all day? Dee demanded, soaring over to hover in front of my face. On my shoulder, Dum yawned. The prince wanted to show Alice his kingdom. It was interesting, because this place is weird, but he was going overboard. Trying to keep me occupied, I grumbled, shuffling to the bed and flopping onto the mattress with a groan. And a few times, I think he was trying to force a feeling of intimacy. The memories of his hand on my back, or caressing my shoulder before I pulled away, still made me shudder. Clearly, my disinterest didn't matter to him at all. The prince wanted what he wanted, and that was me. Basically, one of the guys had to win the tournament, or we'd have to somehow escape this kingdom before Cirrus forced my I do. However, before that, I had to get the information I sought, or coming here would have been a complete waste of time, on top of everything else. How are Henry and Jax? I asked Dee as I propped up onto my elbows. Prince Cirrus deliberately kept me away today. They realized that was happening when they were told they couldn't leave their apartment. She replied. I had to sneak in through the window. But no one else saw you, right? Not a soul. I've really gotten better at spying. I don't know if that's a good thing. What did Hatter and Jack say about all this? I feel horrible that they're locked up. And what else did you find? They're fine. Dee assured me. Not hurt or neglected, just bored and pissed. She glanced at me thoughtfully. Hatter especially. He's really planning to go all out in the tournament. Of course he is, Dum scoffed. He loves Alice. I swallowed thickly. I don't know about love. He does. Dum's eyes sparkled. I see it in the way he looks at you. Okay, Dum was over the moon about the possibility. But for me, the idea was heavy. My only other relationship had ended in disaster, and at present, there were more important matters to worry about. So much that could go wrong. Whatever was happening between Henry and me was not what I needed to think about right now. What about the hall and the stables? I changed the subject. Did you find either? Both. Dee held out her fist for her sister to bump, and then offered it to me. 
I obliged, because if this wasn't a fist bump occasion, I didn't know what was. I even created a map to the Hall of Prophecy, she added, lifting a small bit of paper and giving it a wave. What? How? She rolled her eyes. You guys were gone all day, and there are lots of tapestries to hide behind in this castle. What else was I going to do? Plus, it's not that far, really. I was thinking... Her gaze slid to the opening of the tunnel that Roshia had popped out of yesterday. The secret passage might even lead us close to it, but I couldn't be sure since you locked it. Roshia said there was no passageway there. Yeah, but what if it's only a hallway or two away? I could sneak over. You might not be able to go invisible, but you could glamour yourself. It's worth a try. I gaped, sensing that I was starting to have a bad influence on the twins. I guess that's true. I paused. To be honest, even if it doesn't go anywhere near the Hall of Prophecy, I want to see where it goes. Ooh, let's do it! Dumb squealed. I put up a single finger. Hold up. I rose and went to the door. As ever, two guards stood on the other side, making sure I stayed put. I applied aether magic to the wood, locking it from the inside. Once that was done, I went to the hidden entrance in the wall and dissolved the spell I'd placed on the tunnel yesterday. Then I opened it. The guts of the castle were so unlike the rest. No bright colors, no crystals, no show of wealth. Here it was simple stone, dark and dank. Thank goodness fire is a specialty, I murmured, producing a ball of flame in my hands. You girls ready? The pixies joined me, and with my free hand, I closed the wall softly behind us. Once I was sure that no one would be able to tell from the other side that anything was amiss, who knew if the fae here could break through my aether lock, we proceeded. Though I'd never been in a secret passageway before, it was pretty much what I expected. There wasn't a lot to see. As such, I soon realized we'd have to move really slowly to determine what areas of the castle we were traversing through, and adjusted my pace accordingly. Thank the old gods I did, because at that very moment, I spotted a crack in the wall, an opening. D, dumb, look. I pointed to it. Where do you think we are, D? She studied the handmade map she'd brought with us. We haven't gone far from the room. I bet this is a study I passed earlier. Should we find out? Listen first. Dumb pressed her ear to the wall. I did the same, and after a full minute, had to admit I didn't hear a thing. Either no one was there, or they were being really quiet, which in a study would make sense. I say we risk popping in, I said. If it's the place you saw, then we can pinpoint ourselves on the map. And if someone is there, I'll knock them out or something. If you're sure... Dee didn't sound sure at all, but I was feeling reckless, more like my old self, and wanted some action. Slowly, I pulled the wall to the side, allowing a crack of light to seep into the dark passageway. Again, we listened, and still, I heard nothing, so I pulled the panel open the rest of the way. A slow smile spread across my face. Dee had been spot on. This was absolutely a study, and best of all, it was empty. Mark it down, I said triumphantly. Oh, this is helpful. Dee notated the study on her map. I wonder if there are turns in this passageway, though, because where we're going is not a straight shot from here. Let's find out, I replied, shutting us back into the tunnel. I ran my hand along the walls as we proceeded at our slower pace. When we came to a bend in the tunnel, I cheered in my head. Does this lead the right way? Dee looked at her map again. It seems like we've been following the same corridor, right? The one our room is in? I'd say yes. Dumb? That's what I think. Then the Hall of Prophecy would be to our right. So yes, I think this is correct. This part of the hallway was longer, so it took a bit more time to shuffle along. But eventually, my fingers snagged on a gap in the wall. Another opening. Guys, wait. Let's listen here. Pressing our ears to the wall, we again found silence. This time, I didn't even check with the pixies before prying the wall open. Once it was out of the way, it revealed that we were in a bedroom, 
an empty one. Princess Roshia's room, Dum whispered, landing on the vanity. How do you know? I asked. There's a letter here for her. My fingers itched to take the parchment, to read it, but surely whatever was inside wasn't any of my business. I was simply curious about the princess, who possessed a very different agenda than her brother. My room was directly connected to hers? I wonder if anyone else is aware of that. I mused, looking around. Do you know where her room is in relation to the Hall of Prophecy, D? I do, but you're not going to like it. My stomach sank. Why is that? The Hall of Prophecy is down the next hallway, but on the opposite side. Meaning we won't be able to travel through the walls any longer. I frowned as we ran up against the issue that Roshia had probably already considered. And there were guards outside the door, Dee added, as if I could forget. Maybe I really could glamour myself and trick the guards to get close, but I couldn't do much for the twins. Altering their appearance would be easy, but enlarging them so they wouldn't be identifiable as pixies? That was far more complex than changing hair color or adding freckles. Okay, so you two are going to hate this, but I'll just glamour myself and go alone. Not a chance, Alice! Dumb hissed. We'll find a different way. We... Voices sounded in the hallway, loud and getting closer with each passing second. I caught the words, my traitorous sister, and my heart stopped. For a moment, I was frozen in place. But when Dumb leapt into the air and grabbed her own sister by the wrist, I moved too. Wordlessly, we scurried back to the tunnel, closing ourselves in darkness as the door to Princess Roshia's room opened. You truly wish for us to upend it, my prince? A familiar male voice asked. Do what you must to find her. As it stands, she is my biggest threat, planting ideas in the Wonderland heir's head. He growled. Thankfully, my bride-to-be showed her cards, and I was able to extract any information she might find useful from the Hall of Prophecy. No! My fists balled up. Cirrus was already two steps ahead of me. You are brilliant, my prince. I prefer cunning, Commander. Now do as you will with this room. I must place these manuscripts in my chambers. Do you wish me to charm them with protections, Prince Cirrus? I will take care of it. If Princess Alice wants answers to her questions, she will have to wait until after we are wed. Chapter 14 The tournament was upon us, and I awoke feeling sick to my stomach. I couldn't shake the notion that someone would get hurt today. Alice? Dumb whispered as I smooshed my face deeper into the pillow. Are you awake? Unfortunately. Though I had a lot of faith in Hatters and Jax's magic, Prince Cirrus was proving to be a formidable foe, and confident. He didn't seem at all phased to be facing two challengers today. I was thinking... Dumb's continued whispering made me believe Dee was still sleeping. A second later, a loud snore ripped through the quiet morning, confirming my suspicion. That girl snored like a trucker after a 12-hour shift. Though annoying, I also found it sort of impressive that such a dainty creature could create such a huge sound. What if the prince was pretending? Dumb finally asked. What if he never took the information you need from the hall? Dumb was sweet, but she was reaching on this one. Why would he lie? They didn't know we were in the secret passage, so it's not like they were saying that to throw us off. Plus, he was pissed at his sister, and his proximity to her room meant he had recently left the Hall of Prophecy. Maybe he told the commander what he'd done because he wanted assurance that he was doing the right things. I guess that makes sense, Dum said, sounding defeated. It more than made sense. I was certain I was reading things correctly. Though the prince sounded confident in his plans, he couldn't be. Not completely. His sister had left and given privileged information to the woman he was trying to force to marry him. For some reason, Roshia didn't want Cirrus to occupy the throne. That had to make the prince question himself. So he sought reassurance, 
and the commander seemed like the type to tell the prince whatever he wanted to hear. I wondered what the other two Laval sisters thought. I hadn't spoken to them much at the feast, and hadn't even seen them since. I sat up so abruptly I jostled the bed and woke Dee. What's going on? She cried, blinking awake and looking around as though we were being attacked. Nothing, sorry. I had a thought. I peered down at the girls. You two are sisters. Would you say that you tell each other everything? Close to it, Dum replied. Like ninety percent. That's about right, Dee agreed on a yawn. But what has that got to do with anything? Dee, do you know where the prince's chambers are? I asked, already planning a break-in to get the manuscripts he'd taken. No, I didn't come across any fancy pants rooms when I was looking for the hall and the stables. Why? I didn't think so, which meant that Princess Nambra and Princess Alicia were even more valuable. I think we need to pay a visit to the other two princesses today. Maybe they can help me get into the prince's chambers. If I mentioned that Roshia was helping me, they might too. They're all sisters. Dum stiffened. That feels even more risky than sneaking into the Hall of Prophecy. Dee and I are close, but not all sisters are, Alice. And even if they are, Roshia might not have mentioned to them what she's up to. They're all related to the prince, you know. I exhaled. She was right, but it was worth a shot. I can feel them out first, I said. See if they're worried about Roshia's interference. Cirrus was, but if they aren't then maybe they don't want to see him take the throne either. And if they help me get the information I need, we can escape before this stupid tournament even starts. I leapt out of bed, determined to find the princesses immediately. It was still early enough that they might be breakfasting. I don't have to play spy today, right? Dee asked. It would look too suspicious if you were still ill from the wine. You're both with me. As I got ready for the day, I made sure to wear regular clothing beneath my gown. I had to be prepared for the chance that this went my way, and my group was able to avoid the tournament and leave Crystal Island. When I opened the door to my room, the two guards on the other side turned toward us. I see your other lady is well again, a handsome elven guard I hadn't met yet said. I am, thank you, Dee replied her tone filled with warmth as she batted her eyelashes at the fae. I pressed my lips together to keep from laughing. We were trying to leave this island as fast as possible, and yet here Dee was, flirting it up. No one would want you to miss the tournament today. The elf's neck grew red. It will be quite the affair. Speaking of the tournament, I cut in before Dee could seize the conversational reins and try to wow the male. I was wondering if the princesses are available to speak this morning. If there's a possibility I'm to become part of the family, I'd like to know them better. The pair exchanged worried glances, and I realized why in an instant. I know that Princess Roshia is not currently at the castle, I said airily, choosing to make it sound more like she was out for an errand rather than betraying Cirrus. I'm referring to Princess Alicia and Princess Nambra, I barely got to speak with them at the feast, but would love the chance to do so now. The men exhaled as one, and the fae D had taken a shine to nodded. The sisters usually take breakfast together, and are likely still enjoying their meal before they prepare for the tournament. I'll show you to them. We followed the armored guards through the castle. I wasn't sure, but I thought we were going the same way we had when we'd traveled within the walls. When D tugged at my hair and whispered, left in my ear. I knew I was probably right. Discreetly, I twisted left as we crossed hallways and saw five soldiers standing outside a door, guarding a room the way Roshia had mentioned the Hall of Prophecies would be. That has to be it. If only I'd somehow finagled my way in before Cirrus relocated the information I needed. No point lamenting that now. I had to work with where we were at. They like to take in the ocean air in the morning, the guard told me, bringing me back to my current objective. Or at least they do when it's not scorching. He opened a door and fresh salty air blasted me in the face. It was windy today. How refreshing, I said, 
trying to tame the hair that was already flying around my head, whipping the pixies in their faces. Sorry, girls, I muttered, wishing I had an elastic. The princesses had worn their hair up in simple, elegant braided styles. Not a single strand appeared out of place. By contrast, I was an utter disaster. The soldier escorted us down a path and then a narrow, rocky staircase to a small beach. On the sand, the princesses dined al fresco with six servants, all dressed in brilliant sapphire tunics dotted with lime green stones, at their beck and call. Why were the stones different colors from the ones Cirrus put on his plate during breakfast? Did they indicate different stations? The wind was so strong that the women didn't hear us coming. Though once we got close enough, I saw that one of the princesses, or perhaps a servant, had placed a shield around their dining area. The area shimmered faintly when the sun hit it just right. The moment we stepped inside their protective bubble, the wind stopped. No wonder their hair isn't blowing about. Up dues or no? Thank the Aether, Dee muttered. Your hair was about to strangle me. It has a mind of its own, I agreed. The princesses turned toward us when we were steps away, and two pairs of eyebrows raised. Good morning, Princess Alice, greeted Princess Alicia, the elder of the two sisters. To what do we owe the pleasure? I thought it might be nice to get to know one another before the tournament starts, you know, in case I marry into your family. It still rankled me that, as a woman, I had no say here if I wanted to marry the prince or not. The only way out for me was for another man to challenge the prince for my hand. Even though Hatter and Jax were doing so only as part of our ruse, I didn't like that I couldn't stand up for myself and still get what I came for. Well, I could. My ability to force the prince to give me what I wanted had crossed my mind. But using that particular skill set of mine wasn't smart. I still had no idea what his powers were, and challenging him in such a way might not put only me in trouble, but Wonderland, too. Just because the Crystal Court had been isolationists for years didn't mean they wouldn't attack my land if I provoked their prince. For now, doing things this way was better, even if the whole situation was absurd and wasting my time. My best hope was Hatter would kick Cirrus's ass. Jack succeeding would be fine, too, though he'd be much more vocal and annoying about the win. Would you like to take a seat? Nambra invited, her violet eyes twinkling as she gestured to the spread of fruits and cheeses on the table in front of them. Amongst the food, light green gems and brilliant yellow ones sat, as if they were a garnish. I would, I said, unable to help notice how the princesses dined very differently from Cirrus. He'd made a show of it, as he did practically everything. It made me think he was either trying to impress me or hide something. I thanked the soldier who'd showed me the way. He left as I relaxed onto a chair brought to me by another servant. Dee and Dum took the armrests, their legs dangling off the end. I assume you're wondering where Roshia is? Nambra asked after a moment. Actually, no. Prince Cirrus told me she is indisposed. I'm happy you're here, though. The sisters exchanged glances, and Nambra turned back to me. Roshia has always been the most fanciful. I suppose it comes with being the baby of the family. The princess took a sip of her drink, a juice of some sort. She has certain ideas on how our kingdom should be run, and while I love my sister, I find her to be... misguided. Well, that answered my question. They weren't in cahoots with their sister. As far as I could tell, Roshia was the only one on my side. I needed to be careful here. It would be so much easier if I knew what I was being careful to avoid. There was something happening in this kingdom that wasn't openly talked about. Sisters are precious, though, I said. Of course, you'd know that as well as us. Love for your sister is why you're here, after all. Nambra replied, her face softening. I nodded. You wouldn't happen to know how the fae from your court got through the rift, would you? A heavy silence followed my question, and I even sensed the servants behind us tense, though I couldn't see them. I was walking a line, but rescuing Elise was my priority. Everyone here was well aware of that, so it wouldn't do me a bit of good to pretend I was actually interested in their prince. 
For something to do, I leaned forward and plucked a grape from the bunch. When I popped it into my mouth, the juices exploded on my tongue. My eyes flew open wide. That had to be the sweetest grape I'd ever eaten. Tangy, too. It was almost unnatural, like so much about this island. We do not know how the individual who crossed the rift did so, Alicia finally answered. Only our brother is privy to that information. It... Do not speak it, Nambra hissed, and the older Faye's lip zipped. He will kill us all. I gaped. I'm sorry, but what? Who will? Yet another of those loaded looks passed between the sisters, but I could not let this slide. Do you mean the prince? Nambra swallowed loudly and turned to face the servants. Privacy, please. They each backed up ten more paces, and when the younger sister met my eyes again, tears shimmered in her violet eyes. He's not well, our brother. She drew in a long breath. I'm sorry that you're caught up in this, but all I can say is keep your guard up. Cirrus is tricky, and neither of us will act against him. Because he's blood or because you're scared? A bit of both, Alicia admitted. I didn't reply right away. If they wouldn't act against Cirrus, they weren't going to give me any information that might let me escape. I supposed I could understand their position. I'd spent most of my life under a vampire's thumb, after all. But I wondered if their good breeding meant they would still act like gracious hosts. Cirrus had shown me his kingdom. He'd wanted to show me off like a prized pony. But I knew little of his home, which made me think that, at least in the palace, he wanted me to feel out of sorts. I stood. You know what? I'd love a tour of the Jewel of the Sea. Would you do me the honors of showing me the castle? Relief swept across the women's faces, and though they clearly weren't done with their meal, they stood as well. We'd be delighted, Nambra replied. Follow me, Princess Alice. They led the way back up the steps and into the palace. Shall we start with the solarium? Alicia suggested. If I was going to do this, it was best to get it over with. Actually, as I might be married to him soon, over my dead body, I'd love to see where Cirrus stays, get the feel for his style. I can't imagine that all this is to his taste. I waved at the crystal work that filled every nook and cranny of the palace. Nambra nodded. Astute, his chambers are this way. We hadn't gone far when we turned into the section of the royal wing that Cirrus called his own. A line of guards met us, but not a single one stopped us, which I took to mean that Cirrus had not informed them that I was interested in certain manuscripts. Here's his chamber. Alicia waved at a door that featured a single sapphire the size of my head set into the wood. I believe he's inside preparing for the tournament, so we best not bother him. But as you can see, the hallway is plain. His quarters are too. Filled with crystals, but only those that correlate to his powers. Few are decorative. His workstation is in there, too. But that's it. She smirked. Our dear brother is not big on decorating. If you'd like to see something fabulous, I can show you my quarters. I was getting the sense she actually would enjoy showing me around, which worked to my favor. It was better they thought I cared about the castle, when really, I'd gotten the information I needed. I nodded to the princesses, and when they turned and continued down the corridor, I looked to the pixies. Remember this area, girls. We'll be back really soon. Chapter 15 My dress swished and sighed around my legs, and beneath the skirts, I sweated. Unfortunately, I couldn't complain. The dress itself was light enough, suitable to the climate, which was tropical, but I also wore pants and a top underneath. All the better to allow freedom of movement when I snuck away from the tournament to break into Cirrus's chambers. Okay, is the whole kingdom going to watch this? I asked in disbelief, and eyed the pixies sidelong. Still acting as my ladies, they never left my side. I was accompanied by a few soldiers and the silver-winged commander who had taken me to be cleansed upon arrival. The same one, I was sure whom Prince Cirrus had told to search Princess Roshia's room last night. Already we were closing in on the arena, 
which from the outside sort of reminded me of the Colosseum in Rome. But this one was made of a shining opalescent stone, rather than plain rock, and around it tropical plants rioted, vines climbing the smooth walls. The arena had not been on my tour of the kingdom, and was far larger than I'd imagined. Judging by the noise coming from within, it was also filled to bursting with fay. Everyone on the island is invited, the commander answered, in a tone that said I should have realized that would be the case. Prince Cyrus wishes for his people to witness his prowess. I pursed my lips. From everything I'd learned about the prince, it seemed like he was strong in magic. What his power was, I still was not sure. I had not seen him use it once, and no one spoke about his abilities, only cowered from him just enough for me to know they were terrified of him. This way, the commander said. As we neared the stadium, Faye from the city began to notice us. They even pointed and gawked, so I was glad when our escort led us through a side door rather than the busy main entrance. You're in the royal box with the princesses. My jaw tightened, but I didn't argue. The commander probably trusted me as much as I trusted him, which wasn't at all. It would be best if I went along with this. Then, once I got the lay of the land, I'd devise a way to sneak out. We wound through a hallway, passing only one other fay, a servant carrying a tray laden with empty goblets. Someone is already partying hard, I muttered to the girls. Hopefully in your box, Dee whispered back. That was an idea. If I got those around me drunk, I could do as I wished. Intoxication also had the added benefit of loosening lips. I'd take that into consideration. We climbed a set of stairs, and the volume of shouting, cheering, and singing increased, telling us we'd soon find ourselves in the arena. I was proven right only seconds later when the commander stopped on a landing to stand before a door. This is the servant's entrance to the royal box, he explained, his hand on the knob. Normally you'd arrive in a more regal fashion, but too many fay are interested in you. We thought this would be better. It was, for the reason he gave. Though now, I wouldn't know my way through the main arena when I snuck out. I hoped it was well marked. The commander opened the door, and the smell of dirt came at me hard and fast, likely billowing up from the pit of the arena. We had to be at least two stories up. That I smelled it indicated that below, something was already happening. I stepped inside, studying the space quickly. The space was larger than I expected, able to seat twenty arranged in four shallow tiers, though only the two princesses were seated there currently. They were dressed in lavish gowns of sapphire blue, adorned with the same green and yellow stones I'd seen earlier. Nambra's gown was more modest, while Alicia's neckline plunged to her navel. Each dress was absolutely gorgeous, albeit out of place, considering most others in the stadium were dressed in tunics and loose-fitting pants. Though I too wore a gown, teal as befit my house, I was plain next to the sisters. A half-dozen soldiers stood at the edges of the royal box, swords at their hips and eyes watchful. Two servants were present as well, each with a jug of liquid in hand. I suspected they contained wine or some other alcoholic drink. Banners featuring the crest of the Laval family hung behind the royal seats. Unlike those of most royal families, theirs did not feature an animal, but a ring of multicolored crystals. Considering the island and the strange fay living here, the design fit, but it was still an odd choice. Princess Alice? Namber didn't bother to stand from the middle seat she occupied in the front row. I approached the seats. Has Princess Rashia returned? Namber's lips tightened. No, this is for you. She gestured to the empty seat next to her, which I took. The pixies floated down to perch on the armrests. Nambra arched her eyebrows at that, but said nothing. It might not be usual here for ladies-in-waiting to sit with the royals, but I didn't see any tiny chairs provided for the twins. Where else were they going to sit? I take it Prince Cirrus is below? I craned to see. Preparing for the tournament, Alicia replied, her eyes alight with excitement. What are they going to do exactly? I asked. Fight. With weapons? That or magic, they can choose. 
they must also defeat beasts, Namber said. That is how the first round is decided. What do you mean? I pressed. In this type of situation, there is usually only one challenger. However, there are guidelines in place if two or more wish to impede on a royal's right to his betrothed. I bristled at the word right, but said nothing. The males you arrived with will have to fight off monsters. The first to defeat his monster by drawing blood wins. My mouth went dry. What kind of monsters are we talking about here? Only the High Counselor and those who brought the creature here knows. Nambra leaned forward over the railing, as if hoping to glimpse the beast. I peered around the arena, too. The open-air seating allowed me to view everything. Thousands of fays stood in the stands. I thought of the rocks we'd encountered on our way here. What if the creature the High Counselor chose could fly? What about your subjects? If the beast has wings, won't they be hurt? Protections are in place. Nambra reached out and flicked an invisible barrier that crackled with electricity. All around the arena? Of course, no harm will come to anyone, except perhaps to my brother's challengers. I gulped. You said whoever draws blood or kills the creature first wins. What if the creature draws their blood? And what are they winning? Clearly not me, since Prince Cirrus isn't even involved yet. They fight until they draw blood, no matter how badly they're injured in the meantime, and if they win, they get to go second in fighting our brother. Alicia answered. Once the true fight is over, the one against my brother, for both males challenged him, Cirrus will then fight the remaining contestant. Whether he wins or loses, he has two fights today. What if he loses one? Then whomever beat him wins. Alicia did not look at all worried that would happen. Hatter and Jax were both strong. I had to hope one would win so we could not only get what we came for, but avoid creating drama between courts. In fairy, drama could lead to utter disaster. Even though his court had been isolationists for years, I wouldn't put it past Cirrus to start a war if he felt slighted. And as I had not officially refuted my possession of the throne, the Fae of Wonderland still relied on me to keep them safe. I do my best to see to it that their trust wasn't misguided. On a more personal level, I already had so much to make up for in my life, I wasn't looking to add caused a war to that list. A horn blared, grabbing my attention, and from one corner of the arena, a tall, muscular fay appeared. Though he was far away, he looked dirty, and his skin red like he'd been wrestling with something. A second later, another giant of a fay appeared, and then another— Ropes of steel trailed all three males, and I gasped as a creature of myth appeared last, following his handlers. Is that what they're fighting? I demanded, as the crowd around me went wild, leaping from their seats and shouting unintelligibly at the monsters below. Looks like it, Alicia squealed as a second beast appeared. It usually takes five full-grown male fae to make a minotaur submit. This will be so exciting. I squinted at the pair of half-man, half-bull hybrids. The creatures were at least twice Hatter's height and stacked with muscle. But being big didn't make them unbeatable. My Cheshire cat had taken down a queen kraken. Every creature had a weakness. It was simply a matter of finding it. Are they fast? I asked, taking in the minotaur's cloven hooves. Very, and their skin is resistant to magic, Alicia said. Not that magic can be used in this round, Nambra reminded us. That would be unfair. I sputtered. Uh, unfair? Those things are enormous. I barely stopped myself from adding that if they really wanted to make things fair, Prince Cirrus would be down there, taking on a third beast. True, it will be quite the show. Alicia smiled at me, violet eyes flashing with glee, as if she thought I was enjoying this. She might look beautiful and sweet, but she wasn't fooling me anymore. The girl was a psycho. Attention, attention, please. A magically amplified voice called. I directed my focus to the pit of the arena, where High Counselor Laurel had appeared and was waiting for the crowd to fall silent. The roars, cheers, and jeers of the Fae diminished, and for the first time since I'd arrived at the stadium, the air seemed to still. Welcome, good fay of the Crystal Court. Laurel waved at the stands. 
Today we witness a tournament of strength, magic, and will between our brave Prince Cirrus and two outsiders who dare to challenge him for the hand of his intended, Princess Alice White of the Wonderland Court. Boo! Drown the invaders! Hurl those dirty scoundrels off a cliff! A hundred other threats toward Hatter and Jax filled the air, making my fists clench. The din quieted only when Laurel called for silence once more. Justice will be seen today, he assured us. It's in the Lapeel's hands. Prepare for battle. Again, roars of joy came from those wanting to see their prince emerge victorious. What's Lapeel? I hissed when the onlookers, princesses included, bowed their heads. The sacred crystals, Alicia replied. Where we draw magic from. This place was so unlike the rest of fairy. A part of me wished I could stay and learn about these lapils. I wanted to see how the magic here worked and see all the different variations. But the larger part, the part connected to the men being ushered side by side into the arena at that very moment, just wanted to get the hell out of here. Good luck, Henry. And Jax. I thought as the pair marched toward the minotaurs. The beasts were already posturing, pawing at the dirt with their hooves, kicking it up in the faces of the fae who held them. Determination that hadn't been there seconds ago lined the monsters' faces. Did the minotaurs get something for this fight? Were they subjects of this court? Fae could look odd sometimes, though I'd never seen any that looked like those two. What if the minotaurs win? I asked, knowing that would mean the worst, but needing the rest of the answer. If they kill the challengers, you mean? Nambra asked, not sounding at all saddened by the prospect. Yes, I gritted out. They are freed. They're prisoners? Slaves. They work in fighting pits. I ceased asking questions, instead choosing to watch as the Minotaur's handlers ushered them fifty paces from Henry and Jax. The handlers stood behind the beasts, and the fae holding spare swords for my friends, their only lifelines in this screwed-up tournament, tossed them ten feet in front of the guys, so the metal hit the dirt with a clang. High Counselor Laurel had made his way to the edge of the pit, and now stood, holding his arms up. On my mark, he yelled. Dropping his arms, he bellowed, Let the match begin! The fae holding on to each minotaur's chains released them, and one held up a crystal. The chains vanished, making me blink. How? Crystal Spellsmith. Namber answered before I could even get the words out. You'll learn all about our gemstones and what they can do for us when you join our family. Who knows, maybe you'll be inclined in the way of the crystals yourself. Alicia added, not bothering to look at me, her attention so fixed on the unfolding scene. Below, Henry and Jax had separated, and one minotaur charged each. I wasn't sure if there were rules, like each minotaur was set to fight only one of the guys, or if they could work together. But I figured I didn't want to know. If there were rules, they wouldn't have been made to benefit my side. Instead, I watched the men battle the monsters, my attention ping-ponging between them so fast that at times my vision blurred. I'd only just switched back to Henry when my heart stopped. The beast he fought had managed to get too close, slashing his claws at my man. Everything around me seemed to slow as the claws cut through Henry's shoulder. Blood spurted. Fay roared with pleasure, and my own cry of horror mixed with their gleeful ones. Hatter! I shouted as Henry spun and ran, putting a safe distance between him and the monster. The sleeve of his shirt had torn open, and even from here I could see the livid gash on his skin. Run! The Minotaur chased Hatter, and inside me my Aether magic begged to be released to save him. Though it took everything I had, I fought it back down. Fighting for the guys would not be acceptable. It might even put them in more danger. I had to trust that they could survive this. I had to. Alice, are you unwell? A hand landed on mine. I turned to find Alicia watching me with concern. You're shaking. I looked down at my arm. So I was. I, I... Perhaps you should pull yourself together in private, Nambra suggested, her tone cooler than before. 
My brother has eyes everywhere, Princess Alice. You do not want anyone to suggest that you were pining for the opposition. How deluded was she? I'd arrived here with Hatter and Jax. She expected me not to care about them? Or was this all for show? Were these guards only loyal to Cirrus and would report the sisters' actions? That had to be it. The princesses were scared of their brother. Why, I wasn't entirely sure, but I understood he was off kilter. For them to be putting on a show was the only thing that made sense. If you will, Princess Alice. Another voice came from behind, and I twisted to find a female guard standing there. I can escort you to the privy. You might contain your emotions there. A part of me wanted to stay, to make sure my friends survived, but another part recognized this as a golden opportunity. I needed to sneak out of this box, then out of the arena. At least one of those would be easy. Yes, please. I stood, and on either side of me, the pixies lifted into the air, ready to act as my ladies in waiting. I'll return when I feel more composed. Alicia resumed watching Henry and Jax run from the beasts chasing them. Nambra hadn't even bothered to look away at all. When another roar of pleasure came from the crowd, I swallowed and gestured for the soldier to lead. She did, but to my frustration, another soldier, also female, slipped out of the box with us. Dee shot me a look, and I knew exactly what she was thinking. Two guards would make things doubly difficult. Of course, if I had to fight and incapacitate two, I could. It would be messier, perhaps even draw attention. But I was Alice the Dagger back home. I'd faced difficult opponents before. They escorted me down a hallway that presumably led to the areas where the public could mingle. However, before we even got close to where the masses would mingle, one of the soldiers inched closer. Alice, it's Roshia, she whispered. The pixies let out surprised cries, but I kept it together, narrowing my eyes. The woman looked nothing like Roshia. She had dark brown hair and eyes, and darker skin, more olive than fair. I studied her. Prove it. How did you get into my rooms? A secret passage in the walls. Get on you for checking. I believed her. There was no way those passages were common knowledge. If they were, I would not have been given that room. How did you... I gestured to her face. There are no Aether-blessed Fey on this island. We have other means of disguise, Roshia said. Her voice had changed from when we were in the royal box. It sounded familiar now. This is my... accomplice. I got the distinct sense the other woman was more than an accomplice, but didn't push. I also didn't ask her name, partially because I was sure she wouldn't tell me, but also because, if we got caught, it would be better for the guard if I didn't know who she was. Why are you here? To help you get into Cirrus's quarters, of course. Roshia arched an eyebrow. That is your plan, isn't it? How do you know? Did you see me spying? Dee interjected, her tone worried. I could tell she really didn't want to be the one to have screwed it up. No one told me of a pixie running wild, Roshia assured her. But I have eyes and ears in the castle who are loyal to me, servants who want what I want. They mentioned that my sisters took you on a tour and you wanted to see where Cirrus's rooms were. I assume it's not because you're already so in love with my brother. The princess's blonde companion snorted and rolled her brilliant blue eyes. I liked her already. No, I spat. He moved the tomes I need from the Hall of Prophecy into his chambers. I paused. Ransacked your room, too. He's such a swine. Roshia's lips curled up in disgust. What do you say we pay him in kind? Chapter 16 We stopped at the privy so that I could glamour my face, and, most importantly, my telltale hair, darkening it to an unassuming brown shade. I also shed the gown I wore, and to be safe, threw on Roshia's companion's cloak. There are pockets on the inside for your small friends. They'd give us away if they flew with you. She gestured to the pixies, and I opened the cloak. The girls soared into the bucket pockets. All set! Dum grinned up at us, always the spot of levity in a tense situation. Thanks. I said to the soldier I'd internally named Barbie, 
That was kind of who she looked like. No problem, she replied and opened the door. We must hurry. I didn't need telling twice. I fell in line, content to follow since I had no idea where I was going. Swiftly, Princess Roshia and Barbie led me out of the arena and along the streets of the city. I took in the area I found myself in. I hadn't gone this way before, and things seemed... rough. Buildings were dilapidated. The roads bore potholes. The animals tied up outside of homes looked too skinny to be healthy. It reminded me of the Hartstown neighborhood where Rebel Headquarters was located. The route proved a good one, though, because no one was around, and in minutes, Jewel of the Sea Palace came into our sights. How long do you think it will take us to get to the castle and into Cirrus's rooms? I asked. We'll be done before anyone comes looking for you. My sisters will be enthralled with the tournament for a while yet. And they probably really think she's crying. Barbie snorted. They're so ridiculous. Anyone with eyes could see this one isn't a crier. I glanced at her. Barbie was older than me by a few years, probably the same age as Hatter, around 25 or so. That was, if what I was seeing was real. Was she disguised like Roshia? And who was she that she thought she could speak about the princesses that way? Or me? Not that she was wrong. I wasn't a crier. But still, I got an odd vibe from this fay. Keeping my impression to myself, I remained quiet as we raced toward the palace. Once we were close enough to see a cluster of guards standing at the entrance gate, Roshia swore and took a hard left. This way. Is there a problem? I asked, thankful I was quick on my feet and able to accommodate her sudden change of course. She shrugged. I thought there'd be fewer guards, but don't worry, I can get us in. As if I doubt her, the young woman knew about a tunnel in the walls, and she'd managed to slip out of the palace so others were none the wiser. I trusted that she could take me where I needed to go. We reached a wall of bushes, and the disguised princess stopped our mad dash and plunged her arm into the shrubbery. Where is that? Ah, there you are. A squeal of hinges announced she'd found a door, and Roshia gestured for the other woman to go in. Check the other side. Barbie did as she was told, and I glanced around. Minutes ticked by, and with them, images of Henry and Jax fighting the Minotaurs were starting to torture me. Not that I could do anything about their current predicament, but I did want to make sure they were safe, or at least that things hadn't gotten worse. Could that even happen? The dueling desire to find the information I needed and watch over the guys was frustrating. Apparently the worry was showing on my face because Roshia arched a brow at me. How long do you think we've been gone? I asked impatiently. Five minutes, no more. Really, you'll be fine, she assured me. We're fast, and I took the quickest route. The commander took you the long way because he didn't want you to see the poor parts of the city. I noticed that. I'm not surprised you did. All clear, Barbie shouted, her voice muffled by the thick barrier of bushes. I filed through, the leaves brushing my skin as I went. Once on the other side, the palace loomed beyond a garden. His room is in this part of the castle, Roshia said, once we were on the other side of the hedges. Stick close, we'll travel by passageway. Is there one that goes into his room? I asked. It leads to right outside it, Roshia said. There's a possibility that we'll have to deal with a couple of his personal guards, but Cirrus might have taken them to the tournament. In that case, he'd simply lock his room. Too bad for him, I've known how to pick locks for ages. This princess was my kind of woman. I'd been eight when I learned how to pick locks. Now I could use Aether, unless Cirrus had magic on the locks that prohibited it. Still, I liked the old-fashioned way, too. My heart pounded as Roshia led us to the castle's outer wall. We were nearly there when a soldier rounded the corner. Who goes there? He barked. By the lapel, Barbie grumbled. Can't he mind his own business? Who are you? Identify yourself, the guard yelled. Roshia smirked, and Barbie shook her head as if the male was the most annoying fay on the planet. Allow me. She pulled an amber crystal from her pocket, muttered a word I didn't understand, and the man fell to the ground. Is he dead? I asked, 
somewhat shocked by how fast it had happened. Asleep. He'll be out for about 12 hours. What if Cirrus hears of this when the man wakes? Here's what, that there were three females standing by the palace? Not much else the guard can say. You're in guard attire, I pointed out. Maybe he won't remember, Roshia shrugged. In any case, we have to move. If I hear him talking about three women later, I'll deal with him then. I hoped that didn't mean she'd kill the guy. He'd only been trying to do his job. Roshia approached the wall and placed her hand on it. There was a faint click, and the wall opened, revealing a tunnel. We entered, and she shut the door behind us before assuming the lead once again. How many secret passages are there? I asked curiously, as we strode deeper into the castle. A ton, she replied, and Cirrus doesn't know about a single one of them. How is that possible? He was a suck-up growing up, always wanting to outdo the rest of us, always wanting to prove to father that he should rule. He was such a know-it-all that when I found the passages, which I think were used by servants back in the day, I didn't share their existence with him. I guess I wanted something to hold over him. My eyebrows pinched together. I was surprised that he'd have to prove that, being the heir and all, but maybe things were slightly different here. Roshia twisted and turned through the passages, and Barbie and I followed close behind. When she slowed and held up a hand, my breath tightened. We had to be close. It's on the opposite side of this hallway, Roshia whispered. Let me go first, I'll see if there are guards. Before anyone could say another word, the princess slipped out. I tensed, waiting. But no hiss of a sword filled the air, nor questions from a guard. When the princess reappeared, I exhaled loudly. We're in luck, no guards. The door is locked, but... She pulled two pins from her hair and handed them to me. You want to do the honors? That would probably piss Cirrus off the most. Not that I tell him it was you, but I like to know that what I'm doing is what he'd like least. I got you. I swept into the hallway and stuck the pins into the lock. Tuning into my sense of touch, I felt around within the mechanism a bit and then followed my gut. Swift clicks followed, and I tried the knob. It turned. Wow! Dum breathed from where she nestled in my cloak. Teach me! When we get home. I swung the door inward to reveal a room filled to bursting with crystals, mostly in shades of blue. One such gem was half my height and set in the direct line of the sun coming in through the window. Someone's got a favorite color, I murmured. He draws most of his power from sapphires, Barbie explained. That big one is charging. How do you know? I make it my business to know about the prince. Shouldn't you be looking for something? Over here. Roshia swiftly directed us across the room, toward a desk partially hidden behind a privacy screen. Piled on the desk were at least fifty books, but off to the side was a stack of three that appeared more weathered than the others. Smelled it, too. Those have to be them, I said, nose wrinkling at the musty scent. How could he bear to have these in his chambers? Agreed. Roshia grabbed the pile and handed one to me and one to the other guard. Look for anything on the Rift or Oracles who were in Wonderland in... What year were you born, Alice? I told her my birthday, almost 18 years to the day, and we got to work. The book I held detailed the historical feats of Fae from the Crystal Court. The record was not long, and I was looking for only one word. Rift. I found it quickly, almost exactly in the middle. Here. I pinned my finger on the passage and read the words around it backtracking to make sense of the information. D and Dumb read along with me. Dumb got to the end first, flitting to the opposite page and pointing. He used an illumination crystal to get through the rift. What's that? It's... Roshia started. Do you hear something? A deep voice in the hallway asked, and footsteps sounded, coming closer. My chest tightened. We'd gotten lucky on the way in. It wouldn't go the same way on our exit. I have information on the oracle who visited the Wonderland court, Barbie hissed. They were male, but he's not named. She turned the page and her face fell. And there's nothing here on what he said. I groaned. Are you sure? 
Positive. The passage goes on to describe his other travels in the Riverlands. It even gives the prophecies he made there before returning home. But there's nothing on your birth. It seems like... What are you doing in there? A male voice boomed, and Dee squealed from her hiding place in my pocket. Time to run, ladies. Roshia set her book down. I followed suit. The tome couldn't come with me, as my possession of it would only implicate me in the crime we were committing. And whatever was still to come. Alice, want to give me an Aether demonstration? The princess asked. With pleasure. We rushed the door, and I tapped into my Aether magic. It whipped out of me, soaring toward the male fae and wrapping around their necks. They hadn't attacked us yet. I suspected they were too taken aback at actually finding people in the prince's chambers, and now they wouldn't get the chance. I tightened my hold on the guards, and slowly their faces turned blue. Seconds later, one fell, then the other. I'd like to add the finishing touch. Barbie flung magic at the men. When nothing seemed to change, I furrowed my brows in confusion, but she only winked. I can affect bodies and minds. Now they'll be passed out for hours. Can you make them forget we were here? I asked, following Roshia through the door. No, if I could, I would have done it to the other guard, Barbie pointed out. That's what the disguises are for. True, but I still didn't feel totally protected. Would Prince Cirrus still suspect me? Should I have killed the guards? The instant the last question formed in my mind, I cringed. No, I was the new Alice, no longer an assassin. I wouldn't kill unless it was absolutely necessary, like in instances of self-defense or to save Elise. Plus, if the prince was inclined to suspect me, that would be the case regardless of the condition of the guards. Come on! Roshia opened the secret passageway outside the prince's quarters. We slipped into the darkness and ran, slowing only when we arrived at the door leading to the outside. Again, Roshia checked that the coast was clear, and then we walked more naturally across the palace grounds, trying not to draw attention— we saw only servants, and none of them questioned us, but I couldn't help but worry. How long have we been gone now? Twenty minutes, maybe thirty. Barbie looked me over. You need to look worse. What do you mean? Suddenly, my face began to tingle, like a swarm of bees was stinging me all at once. What are you doing? Making you swell up like you've been crying your little princess eyes out. How about a warning next time? She chuckled. As if there will be a next time. I must say, though, you're blowing up nicely. How mortifying. I groaned inwardly, slipping through the bushes and the hidden door that led off the palace grounds and into the city. Once on the other side, we broke into a dead sprint for the arena. Chapter 17 Princess Alice, we were starting to worry about you. Alicia tossed a glance over her shoulder as I entered the royal box, my breathing barely under control. Between sprinting back to the arena, having to change rapidly, and undoing my glamour, I was experiencing a new level of exertion. The pressure in my chest was so tight, I might burst at any second, but I forced myself to act sad, like I'd just finished my epic sob fest. Barbie slipped into place at the back of the royal box once again wearing the cloak I'd borrowed, but Roshia remained at my side, corroborating the effect that I was barely keeping it together. You missed the rest of the first challenge, Alicia added when I didn't reply. My heart plummeted. Are they in the second round? Who's fighting? Alicia didn't answer, only turned back to face the pit, her smile wide at the promise of spilt blood. Nambra wasn't as flighty as her sister, and stared at me openly, though she did not appear to have heard my question. Her nose wrinkled in disgust. You look horrible. Thanks to the stinging effect of Barbie's magic, and the tears I'd forced myself to shed, I was sure I looked like hell warmed over. But at least the Lavals didn't seem to suspect I'd been dishonest with them. The princess was in quite a state, Roshia murmured as she guided me to my seat, I marveled at how her tone dipped into a voice so unrecognizable even her sisters didn't know it was her. Alas, she returned because she was desperate to see Prince Cirrus battle and insisted she leave the privy. 
Just in time, too, it seems. Yes, he's doing quite well, Nambro replied, riveted on the arena. But then, wizards aren't nearly as strong as Fay, are they? So Henry had beaten his Minotaur before Jax. Had my ex been injured? Or had Henry simply drawn blood first? I peered over the balcony, and my mouth went dry. A dozen large, dark splotches marred the dirt below. Is that blood? Was anyone injured? I asked, against the Minotaurs? Not really. Alicia appeared disappointed by that fact, but I couldn't help but exchange furious glances with the Pixies. Both Dee and Dumb had done well staying quiet, as ladies-in-waiting would, though currently they looked like they wanted to rip Her Royal Highness's face off. The Fae competitor got a scrape after the wizard already lost, but that was about it. She added. Then why does the ground look like that? I asked, as below us, Cirrus and Jax danced around one another. The latter was lithe, but the prince was something else. He moved like the wind made flesh, like nothing at all worried him or would touch him. The wizard fired off a spell, which the fey prince avoided with a graceful twirl that sent his blue cape billowing. Sapphires ran the length of it, as if the prince thought this was a ball, not a tournament. The crowd roared at his escape, and once he was no longer spinning, the prince sent a smile as cruel as a blade up at the stands. Females screeched, and my blood boiled. Seriously, though, a cape in a fight? That smarmy expression? How pretentious and unnecessary. I could really get on a roll with hating Cirrus's fashion choices, but at that moment, a bolt of light zinged out of the sky, stunning me so much that my inner monologue ceased. Jax hurled himself out of the way in time for the lightning to hit the ground, and the dirt where it struck turned black. Wait a minute. The mark matched the other splotches. All those places where I thought blood had been spilled, they'd really been hit by lightning? My shoulders tensed. Cirrus wielded lightning. He's avoided being struck that many times? I breathed. There had to be at least a dozen marks on the ground. Alicia grimaced. Far more than most. Our brother is generally much better at aiming, but the wizard appears to have a sixth sense for this sort of thing. I suppose it's a way to make up for his lack of magical talent. Again, she looked put out. Lack of magical talent? Jax was a very strong wizard, but I didn't bother correcting her. From that point forward, I could only worry about Jax. I might not love him anymore, but if he got fried because he'd come here with me, I'd feel awful. Thankfully, what the princess said was true. Jax did seem to have a certain sense for Prince Cirrus's power, and with each miss, the prince lost his composure a touch more. His confident smirk dropped, and his face deepened to a livid crimson. No longer caring how regal I appeared, I leaned forward and placed my palms on the hot stone railing of the balcony. Beside me, the pixies stood on the balcony's edge, their mouths open wide, as Jack sent green magic at the prince, only to dodge a bolt of lightning the next second. My fingers itched to work my own magic, to help, but that would be pointless. And after breaking into the prince's chambers, it really was best to not draw attention to myself. I shouldn't fight, shouldn't cry out. I needed the guys to do their bit to lay out this pompous prick so we could leave Crystal Island without starting a courtly incident. My reserve lasted precisely one second longer until Jax was struck by lightning. No! I screamed as he fell to the ground, clouds of dirt flying up to obscure him. The crowd went wild, and Prince Cirrus raised his arms. I took his gesture as a victorious one, but suddenly, the air in the royal box felt electric. I looked up in time to spot a nebula of crackling, deadly light coalescing over Jax. Cirrus was going to strike again. Over my dead body. I thrust out my aether so hard that a hole formed in the shield protecting the onlookers. My power streaked toward Jax in my desperation to get to him before Cirrus could land another blow. Princess Alice, what are you doing? Nambra shrieked. But she was nothing to me easy to ignore as my magic tunneled through the electrified air. It slammed to a stop over Jax, forming a shield as another bolt of lightning lanced toward him with so much power that my aether shield shuddered. No doubt that assault would have killed Jax. Cirrus spun, locking eyes with me. You won! 
I shouted. He doesn't have to die. Pure silence rang. It was almost like no one in the arena dared to breathe. Thousands of eyes were on me, but I only took notice of one person, the prince who'd tried to play dirty. Finally, his lips curled up in a grin. As you wish, my love. His voice boomed, filling the stadium with his presence and false charm. I will spare him. His intent hung in the air. The other may not be so lucky. Remove the wizard and bring in the other challenger, Prince Cirrus demanded. The doors to the arena pit flung open, and out ran two armored fey. As if they'd done so a million times before, they picked Jax up by his feet and hands. Dread drenched me as his body swayed between them, limp. Was he okay? If he needed medical attention, would he get it? I wasn't hopeful, and as the fade darted back into the innards of the stadium, I felt the urge to follow them. But then Henry was pushed into the pit, and my feet rooted me in place. I couldn't leave. I had to hope the other fay had more humanity than their prince. Sit, Nambra said, her tone more commanding than usual. Again, I ignored her, which was more than could be said for Dee, who straight up spun and scowled at the princess. I wanted to fist bump her, but refrained. I needed to be alert for the next fight. If the prince did the same to Henry as he had done to Jax, I'd be the one who went feral. I studied Hatter as he strode towards Cirrus. His gait was slightly off, giving away that he was tired, which, considering he'd taken on a minotaur not long ago, wasn't a surprise. But when he stumbled over nothing, a more malicious thought seeded in my mind. I'd been assured the guys were being taken care of, fed, given water, basically treated well. Was that true? D. I said her name, careful to keep my voice low. When you saw Henry and Jax, did they look okay? Yeah, she whispered back. But that was the night after the feast. True. It wasn't like the guys would starve over the course of a night, or even the two days that we'd been here. But being deprived of food for that long would be enough to weaken a person. Henry stopped a few dozen paces away from the prince, one hand on his loner sword. I prayed to the old gods I was wrong about his condition and that he'd kick Cirrus's ass. As the fight began, my confidence rose. Henry might be tired, but now that the competition was underway, he wasn't letting it show. He rushed the prince, aggressively striking with his blade, drawing blood. I gasped. Is that it? What? Alicia snapped, annoyance in her eyes. She'd seemed so scared of her brother the other day. Why did she care if he won? Maybe if he doesn't, he'll make his sister's lives more difficult? If that were the case, that sucked, but I wasn't willing to risk Henry or even Jax for the princess's comfort. Henry drew blood, I pressed. Is it over? It didn't seem like it. Cirrus had drawn his sword and was retaliating, but I wouldn't put it past the prince to continue fighting even if it was over. He was insane and clearly desperate for a bride. Plus, he'd already tried to zap Jax in the most cowardly manner. Of course it isn't over. Nambra replied. The drawing of blood was only for the Minotaurs. In these rounds, contestants fight until one surrenders, loses consciousness, or dies. Ugh, I huffed. Henry was doing reasonably well. He had gotten close to the prince with his blade, alternating blows with earth magic to shake the ground beneath Cirrus, throwing the prince off balance many times. But even without being unsteady on his feet, Cirrus was hesitant to use his lightning in close proximity. Perhaps his aim wasn't entirely accurate? Come on, Hatter, I urged as he slashed with his sword again. The blade whistled by the prince, nearly cutting into his arm, but Cirrus had a trick up his sleeve. As he twirled, he dipped, and when he rose again, he hurled a fistful of dirt into Henry's eyes. My guy staggered back and called upon air, retaliating in kind. Vicious clouds of dust blew at Cirrus, but he used his cape to block it. And once the gust ceased, Cirrus glared at Henry, who still hadn't recovered. In that instant, I knew the prince was seeing red. Again, the air in the arena electrified. But before I could locate the lightning, it exploded from the sky, slamming into Henry. He collapsed to the ground, twitching. 
The princesses leapt up and cheered exuberantly, but I remained frozen in place. Watching him, my fingers dug into the stone of the balcony. Get up, get up, get up! But no matter how desperately I urged him to move, Hatter didn't stand. In fact, his jerky motion slowed and he soon stilled. My pulse began to pound in my throat. He couldn't be dead. Could he? Suddenly, everything else disappeared and my breathing thinned dangerously. I gasped, desperate for air, for something to right me, to make this reality cease to exist. Before I could hyperventilate to the point of passing out, however, someone came up behind me, their soft hands landing on my shoulders. Alice, Barbie whispered in my ear. He's not dead. Pull yourself together. Not dead. Not dead. Not dead. But how did she know? I read bodies, she reminded me when I very clearly did not calm down. I gasped, recalling that from earlier, and air flooded my lungs. Henry wasn't dead. Barbie had no reason to lie about that. Henry was alive. Passed out, but alive. My shoulders softened, and I nodded so Barbie knew I'd return to myself. I felt when she distanced herself and resumed watching the arena below, just in time to see the prince lift his arms in victory. All around the rest of the arena, Faye were cheering, screaming Cirrus's name, celebrating his triumph, some literally crying with happiness. Dum couldn't take it any longer and burst into silent tears. Well, it looks like you're part of the family now, Princess Alice, Alicia chirped. We'll have to go dress shopping before the wedding ceremony. I was saved from making what would surely be a waspish reply by Prince Cirrus calling for silence. He'd been regaling the stadium, but now he turned to face me. He bowed. My love, the challengers have been defeated. Now, by the law of my land, we may wed. I stood frozen, unable to speak, unable to even think. She's so grateful she has no words. Prince Cirrus simpered, a hand on his heart. Save them for tomorrow, my love, for that is the day our two hearts become one. Whispers rushed through the crowd, but none of them faster than the racing of my heart. He'd set the wedding for tomorrow? What happened to an appropriate courting period? Now. Prince Cirrus looked to the edges of the stadium, where soldiers likely waited for his command. If someone could get this fay out of here, take him to prison with the other one. I have an engagement ball and a wedding to prepare for.